Section 1 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Mascots. Most people seem to be born with an interest in animals, if not with an instinctive love for them. If you walk down the street with a forefoot of any kind, almost everyone turns to look, and some of the children will even follow you. Of course, the element of curiosity is present, but there is also something finer and warmer than that. If the animal happens to be a particularly lovable one, a beautiful dog, for example, it at once changes your relationship toward almost everyone you meet. There is a bond of sympathy between you and people who a moment before were strangers. You and they have a mutual friend, and often there is a disposition to cultivate your acquaintance. So they speak to your dog, pat him if he'll let them, smile and nod to you perhaps, and next time you meet it is on a new and friendlier footing. No doubt this universal interest in animals was partly responsible for their adoption as mascots by so many regiments in the armies of the Allies. These mascots came from everywhere, were of all kinds, and often bore some relation to the place from which the regiment came. For example, a certain Australian regiment brought a kangaroo. An English battalion which had been serving in India had an Indian antelope. One South African regiment brought a parrot, another a gazelle, and other regiments brought monkeys. Among the American mascots were eagles, raccoons, and coyotes. Here we see another element creeping in. These mascots were reminders of home. They helped to tide the men over that difficult period during which they had broken away from their old lives, but had not yet become accustomed to the new. Several of the Canadian regiments brought black bears with them. The Welsh regiments usually had a goat, and of course his name was usually Taffy. We all remember the old nursery rhyme. Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief. Taffy came to my house and stole a piece of beef. And the goat answered the full description, for, as we all know, a goat will steal almost anything. Of course, it was not possible to take all these mascots to France, but they did their bit for days or weeks or months, as the case might be, while the soldiers were waiting in English camps before going across the channel. And many of the more practical animals, such as dogs and cats and goats, went to the continent, and in many cases even to the trenches with their soldier friends. The dog was the most popular of all, and it was fitting that he should be, in view of his position as the oldest, the most loyal, and most unselfish friend of man. There are some remarkable stories of dogs which long after their masters had left home, followed them to France and joined them in the trenches. Needless to say, most of these stories are pure fiction, but I have found one which appears to be authentic. In August 1914, Private Brown of the 1st North Staffordshires left his home in Hammersmith and went to the continent with his regiment. In late September, Mrs. Brown missed their Irish terrier, Prince, and heard nothing of him until some weeks later she received a letter from her husband, stating that the dog was with him in France. He continued, It is a very strange thing that I should have got him. A man brought him to me from the front trenches. I could not believe my eyes until I got off my horse and he made a great fuss over me. I believe he came over with some other troops. In front of American Red Cross headquarters at 4 Rue de Chevreuse, Paris, sat a large, dignified Alsatian sheepdog. That is to say, he had been born a sheepdog, but now no one could possibly mistake him for anything but a French soldier. He had been through the war, and he showed it, partly by his soldierly bearing, partly by a scar on his shoulder and one blind eye, and last and most convincing of all, by the croix de guerre which blazed on his broad chest. This was Tommy, 
who perhaps had seen more actual fighting than any other mascot in the Allied armies. He had begun his war career with the Central Powers, but early in 1915, a regiment of Canadian Scots made a fierce attack on the German lines near Amiens, and Tommy was among the prisoners they took. The dog seemed well satisfied with the change he had made, and from that time until the end of the war, he served with the Scottish regiment. He had his own gas mask and wore it whenever the enemy put down a gas barrage. Once it was not put on in time and the dog was rather badly gassed. One gets some idea of the severity of the fighting in which that regiment was engaged when it is known that from the first to last in something less than four years, Tommy was owned by no less than 15 officers, all of whom were killed or severely wounded. The dog himself seemed to bear a charmed life. In spite of the fact that he always went over the top with the men and that he very often led them in the attack, he finished the campaign in good health. To be sure, he was wounded three times, but his honorable scars simply served to endear him the more to his fellow soldiers. And when his regiment was awarded the Croix de Guerre for gallantry, by unanimous consent the decoration was attached to Tommy's collar. One of the most famous of the officer's pets was a fox terrier named Spot, belonging to General Townsend, because he was with his master when the latter was holding Kut el Amara, he became known as Spot o Kut. As we all know, Kut el Amara finally fell, and General Townsend was captured by the Turks. But the latter had such admiration for their brave and distinguished prisoner that they showed him every courtesy. When he was taken to Constantinople, they wanted to send his little dog with him, but that was against the Turkish law. So they took Spot and sent him down the Tigris with a special escort, and under a flag of truce, delivered him to the British forces which had been sent to relieve Kut. The little terrier was eventually taken back to England, and a friend of General Townsend who met him at the dock gave me this brief account of his adventures. From Lady Edward Spencer Churchill comes the story of a beautiful English setter, which belonged to an Algerian soldier. This dog managed to get on board his master's ship and landed with him at Marseille. Thence he crossed France into Belgium, accompanied by his soldier owner in the great retreat and in the victory of the Marne, and shared with him the life in the trenches. One night a great shell burst in a trench wounding the Algerian and burying him alive under a mass of fallen earth and debris. The dog was unhurt and began to hunt for his master. He quickly scented him out and began to dig for him. He dug until his paws were raw and bloody, but at last he uncovered his master's head. By that time he was exhausted. He could dig no more. But he howled and barked until he attracted the notice of some soldiers who came and dug the sergeant out, limp and almost dead. He was placed on a stretcher and taken away in an ambulance, and behind the ambulance there limped a very weary and very bloody dog. When they reached the hospital, he followed the stretcher bearers into the ward, and there was some talk of putting him out. But when the head nurse heard the story, she exclaimed, he has as good a right here as any of us have. So he stayed, and when the sergeant recovered consciousness, he found his old friend standing with his paws on the bed. The dog helped to nurse his grateful master back to health, and they finally left the hospital together. No less interesting is the story of another setter that joined an American regiment in France and attached himself to a young Marine who loved dogs and who made her understand that he did. First he shared his supper with her, for she was starving. Then he gave her a bath and discovered under a coat of mud a silky-haired white dog with chocolate patches. He named her Belle, and because the regiment was occupying a sector near Verdun, she was known to the soldiers as Verdun Belle. She slept at her master's feet, 
and accompanied him silently when he went on duty at a listening post. No one knew where she came from, but she was evidently familiar with the ways of war, for she never showed the least nervousness nor even surprise at the sights and sounds which characterized life at the front. After she had had a distressing experience with gas, her master cut down and twisted a French gas mask so that it fitted her fairly well, and she soon learned to run and bring it when the enemy put down a gas barrage. The following spring, Verdun Bell presented the regiment with seven fat, squirming, black-and-white puppies, and their eyes were hardly open before orders came for the regiment to strike camp and hurry across France to help check the German advance north of the Marne. Those orders would have been a good excuse for almost anyone to leave the mother dog and her little ones behind. But the young Marine was no fair-weather friend. He dumped the puppies into an old wicker shell basket and trudged away with the wistful bell at his heels. Anyone who knows the amount of hardware that a Marine is required to stand up under on the march will realize the devotion needed voluntarily to add to it seven fat pups and a basket. For forty kilometers he stuck it out, and when a long advance by motor lorry followed the march, the Marine gave up his seat to the dogs and draped himself over the tailboard as best he could. But more hiking followed, and he found his burden heavier than he could bear. So he solemnly, almost reverently, killed four of the puppies, slipped the other three into his shirt, threw away the basket, and marched along with the trusting mother dog still at his heels. One of the puppies died, but he carried on with the two survivors. One night, the regiment was passing through a town whose streets were crowded with refugees and with soldiers and transport moving to and from the front. Somewhere in the confusion, Verdun Bell was lost, and next morning the young soldier found himself with two hungry, wailing, motherless pups. He begged a cup of milk from an old French woman, and with the eyedropper from his kit did his best to feed the orphans. The meal was not a success, and now on a veering wind came the sound of cannon. Soon he would be in the thick of the fighting, no place for motherless puppy dogs. In the endless procession of wheeled vehicles an ambulance was passing, and the lieutenant and the sergeant who sat in front had kindly faces. The Marine ran up to them, blurted out his pathetic little story, dropped his treasures on the seat between them, and was gone. That night, after a field hospital had pitched its tents and set up its kitchens on an old French farm, a sergeant and a farm-bred private might have been seen chasing four very distressful cows around a large pasture in a vain endeavor to get enough milk to feed two hungry black-and-white puppies. The following day, the doglets muddled through, but in the evening their problem was solved. For that evening, a fresh contingent of Marines swung past the farm, and behind it, a dusty, tired, and anxious dog. It was Verdun Bell. Nearly ten miles back, she had lost her master, and apparently she had decided that, until she could find him, any Marine was better than none. The troops passed on, but the dog did not. At the farm gate, she stopped, drew in her slavering tongue, and questioningly sniffed the air. The next instant she was racing up the drive and across the grass to a shady tree, under which lay a small pile of discarded dressing from the hospital. Curled up on those bandages, fast asleep, lay two black and white pups. The rest is private. But at the front, the fight was on, and a steady stream of ambulances passed in through the gate of the old farm, to be unloaded at the door of the receiving room. One evening, they lifted out a young Marine, a shell-shot case, unconscious, and then a dog went crazy. The first conscious feeling of the wounded man was of a soft tongue licking the dust from his face, and then Belle was relieved of her work to make way for those whose efforts, if less eager, were more hygienic. 
and on the following Sunday when visitors were admitted, they found two cots pushed close together in the shade of a tree. On one lay a mother dog nursing two contented puppies. On the other, fast asleep, was stretched the young marine, one arm thrown out so that his kindly hand could clasp a silken ear. Naturally, the Navy did not have quite so many mascots as the Army, but it is safe to say that there were few large war vessels which did not boast at least a cat, a dog, or a goat. Very often the mascots were not taken from home but were captured from the enemy, sometimes under remarkable circumstances. For example, on one occasion, HMS Falmouth sank five German trawlers in the North Sea. One of them being made of wood and empty was very difficult to sink. First they blew a hole in her bottom, then they put two lydite shells into her, but although she was now full of water, she refused to go down. Then the British ship deliberately rammed her and cut her clean in two, and on one of the still-floating halves, they saw a fox terrier smiling and wagging his tail. He had been blown up, shelled, and rammed, but he seemed to think that the whole show had been performed for his benefit. He was rescued and adopted by the men of the Falmouth as their mascot. But on his collar was a tag bearing the name Fritz, and it is said that the men of the Falmouth refused to go into action until that name was changed. At any rate, the dog was renamed, and Elizabeth Banks has perpetuated the memory of the event in her little poem entitled Fred, of which the following is one stanza. On the day that we first went into the fight, they whistled me onto the deck, saying, Fritz, your name is a regular blight. It'll bring about a wreck. To start with a mascot christened Fritz would mean we're as good as dead. Oh, what shall we do? By Donner and Blitz, we'll just rename you Fred. Perhaps no more touching incident is recorded in the annals of the naval mascots than one connected with the death of Captain Loxley of the ill-fated battleship Formidable. True to the finest traditions of the British Navy, this gallant officer stood calmly on the bridge of the doomed ship a cigarette between his lips and a thoughtful smile lighting his face, awaiting her final plunge. And close beside him, just as calm and ready to share with his master his inevitable fate, stood a staunch little Scottish terrier, Bruce. The two were old friends and shipmates of long standing, and it seemed fitting that they should start on the long last voyage together. Now, as everyone knows, some of the crew of the Formidable were saved, and among those brought ashore in an unconscious condition was an able-bodied seaman named John Cowan. He was carried into the pilot boat hotel, Lyme Regis, and as all efforts to revive him failed, his body was laid out on the kitchen floor. Then a curious and interesting thing happened. A rough-coated, cross-bred collie dog named Lassie, belonging to the house, came into the room. Little attention was paid to her at first, as all hands were busy working over the man who still showed signs of life. But Lassie walked over to Cowan's body and began to show uneasiness. She lay down close against him and began to lick his face. She kept it up, and at the end of half an hour, there was a faint moan from the supposedly dead man and a slight movement of the limbs. Willing hands quickly took up the work which Lassie had begun, and Cowan is alive today. Most extraordinary risks sometimes were taken to rescue these animal pets of the Army and Navy when they got into trouble. On one occasion, a goat belonging to an East Indian regiment strayed into the firing line and became panic-stricken when the shells began to burst around it. It ran here and there, bleeding piteously, and seemed quite unable to remember its way back. Suddenly, the dark figure of a Sikh shot up over the top of a trench and hurled itself, a living lance, into the deadly shower which swept the field. He reached the goat and started back with it, but a shell exploded just beside them, and they were both killed by the flying fragments. 
On a cold March day, the bulldog mascot of a British warship ran to the side to bark at a passing fishing vessel. The deck was covered with ice and the dog slipped and went into the sea. There was a gale blowing and the water was very rough, but one of the midshipmen, Mr. Sidney T. Warbuckler, at once went overboard. With great difficulty, owing to the cold, the heavy sea, and the fact that he was fully dressed, he managed to swim back with the dog to a rope that was thrown from the ship. The RSPCA awarded Mr. Warbuckler a silver medal for the deed. Of the many splendid things done during the war by the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, few were finer than the establishing of great quarantine kennels for the dogs of soldiers and sailors who had served in the World War. The officers of the society realized that the Tommies had grown desperately fond of the dogs which had been in the trenches with them and which had shared their hardships for months, sometimes for years, but they knew that most of these men could not afford to comply with the strict English law which requires every dog entering England to remain in quarantine for six months. The cost of the animal's board was more than the average soldier could pay. So the RSPCA raised a large sum of money and established at Hackbridge near London a dog home with an up-to-date hospital attached where soldiers' dogs would be kept and cared for during the full period of quarantine and where the owners could then go and take them by paying a nominal fee. A soldier did not even have to bring his dog to England. The society took charge of it while he was still in France. On receiving his license, he delivered his dog at a veterinary hospital set apart for the purpose near Boulogne. There it was kept for at least five days, during which time it was examined daily by a veterinary surgeon. Then, as soon as there were enough dogs to make it worthwhile, they were muzzled and chained and put aboard the first horse transport leaving for England, in charge of a sergeant of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, who took with him a number of men to assist in loading them at Southampton. They were taken to Hackbridge to begin their long period of quarantine. I visited the dog home at Hackbridge and found there at that time 140 dogs of all breeds, sizes, and colors, each with a clean, dry, brick-built enclosure to himself with an ample bench and plenty of fresh straw. In some of the buildings were large breeds, and there I saw sheep dogs, setters, greyhounds, and retrievers. Other buildings were devoted to the smaller breeds, and bulldogs and terriers of all kinds leaped up to greet me. Most of them were not thoroughbreds, but they were an awfully honest-looking lot, and their joy at meeting me seemed very frankly tempered with disappointment that after all it was not their master who had come. The most distinguished guest of the home, whom I met on that occasion, was a little Italian greyhound named Prinny, doubtless diminutive of that very popular dog named Prince. Prinny was an officer's dog, and on his collar he bore a metal badge with the inscription, Gaza, Beersheba, Jaffa, Jerusalem, Jericho, Torpedoed, 27-5-18, HMT, Lee's Toe Castle. The home was in charge of an alert young veterinary surgeon who had just left the army and who was very keen on his new work. He was fond of dogs and it was evident that the dogs were fond of him. Closely allied to the mascots were the dogs, ponies, and other forefoots used to collect money for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the American Red Star Animal Relief, the Blue Cross, the Purple Cross, and other war charities. Most of these animals were on the other side of the Atlantic. There was Bob at Liverpool, Prince at Crewe, Simro at Ryle, and many others. But the champion collecting dog of the world was said to be Brum, a brown spaniel retriever mongrel who had the monopoly at Euston Station, London. Brum had a way with him. With a little tin box on his back, he trotted up and down the station, barked to attract the attention of his victims, and then shook hands to thank them if they dropped a coin. He was presented to King George and Princess Mary, and when he called to pay his compliments to Queen Alexandra, she slipped a sovereign into his box. 
One day at a party, he gathered up $70 for the Ambulance Society. And within a year after the beginning of the war, he had collected $8,000 for different charities. One of the most notable dogs that helped to raise money for war purposes was Jack, who belonged to Miss Edith Cavell, the English nurse, who, as we all know, was killed by the Germans in Belgium. Nurse Cavell had owned Jack for 10 years, and after her death there was difficulty in finding a home for him, because people were afraid of incurring the resentment of the invaders. There was one willing to take the risk, however, and that was that widely known lover of animals, the Dowager Duchess de Croix. She took him, ill from neglect and worry over the loss of his beloved mistress, and nursed him back to health. She sometimes loaned Jack for exhibition purposes, and at a great dog show held at Lille, he proved one of the most attractive exhibits. Many soldiers and the wives and sisters of soldiers who had been nursed by Miss Clavel gathered about him, with tears in their eyes, and more than a thousand photographs of the famous dog were sold for the benefit of the French Red Cross. A letter from the Dowager Duchess, written in June 1920, informed me that Jack, though very old and stiff, was alive and happy. On the 7th of March, 1923, Jack's mistress wrote to me again, telling of his death. After the armistice, she said, You were kind enough to take great interest in Nurse Clavel's poor old dog Jack, which I had rescued after her murder, and you will, I am certain, be sorry that he died on February 16th of this year. He was ill only a few hours. He was very old. Nurse Cavell, I am told, had him for eight or ten years, and he was with me for eight years. I am sure you will quite understand how I feel the loss of this good and faithful animal. When we think of the joy given by these thousands of mascots and of the services performed by the horses, mules, camels, oxen, donkeys, dogs, and pigeons, Is there any wonder that at the request of the Secretary of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the bishops of Durham, London, Bath and Wells, Bristol, Chester, Liverpool, Manchester, Norwich, Rochester, Salisbury, and Truro recommended the following prayer for use by the clergy in their respective dioceses? And for those also, O Lord, the humble beasts, who with us bear the burden and heat of the day, and offer their guileless lives for the well-being of their countries. We supplicate thy great tenderness of heart, for thou hast promised to save both man and beast, and great is thy loving kindness, O Master, Savior of the world. Lord, have mercy. End of section 1《ヘッドホンアニマルヒーローズ by Ernest Baines》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian.《Animal Heroes》by Ernest Baines。Horses A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. It was before Columbus discovered America that Richard III paid this high tribute to the horse in war. Since then there have been many inventions which have threatened the prestige of this most valuable servant of man. There are many who believe that the bulk of the work in the war against Germany was done by motor vehicles. But the fact remains that, after all these centuries, the horse still holds his own in war, that nothing has supplanted him or is likely to supplant him. Motor lorries are more powerful. On good roads, unobstructed, they can move greater weights at higher speed. But when real trouble begins, when there is deep mud, when there are shell holes and ditches and treacherous river beds to be crossed, when there are high, steep banks, when there are no roads at all, perhaps, then we learn the difference between the terrific, automatic, but unadaptable power of a motor car and the more moderate, intelligent, and highly adaptable strength of a horse. The power of an army as a striking weapon, says General Sir Douglas Haig, depends upon its mobility, 
Mobility is largely dependent on the suitability and fitness of animals for army work. General Haig fought in France, and when he spoke of animals, he referred to the animals used in France, chiefly horses and mules. They were not only valuable, they were indispensable. Sixteen million of them were used on all fronts, and had the Allies been deprived of them, the victory would not have been ours. Long before we entered the war, the United States was aiding Great Britain and France by selling them war horses. Fully two-thirds of all the horses, and practically all the mules, used in the British Army were purchased here and shipped to England, chiefly from Newport News. A rough lot they were for the most part, unkempt, unshod, and untrained for their new work. But a few weeks at the English remount depots, in the hands of the greatest horse masters on earth, and they were fit to be sent to France to take part in perhaps the most vitally important work which horses have ever been called upon to do. With arrows branded on their quarters and numbers on the hoofs, long strings of these splendid animals filed up the gangways and down the ramps to the various decks of the transports which were to bear them to France. And at night these transports would slip noiselessly away from their berths at Southampton and other ports, and accompanied by grim destroyers and perhaps with an airplane policing the sky, they headed for the coast of France. What it would not have meant to the Germans to destroy those transports. But thanks to the vigilance of the British Navy, not a single horse was lost in transit through the activities of the enemy. In the transportation of the British and of every other army, horses were used in vast numbers. And naturally they were of most importance when conditions were such that motors could not be used. On precipitous hills, in deep mud, on shell-blasted roads. What the animals suffered from overwork, exposure, and disease has never been told, must never be told in detail. But in fairness to our four-footed allies, we should all know something of the work we sent them to, of the work they did so well, so uncomplainingly, and which directly or indirectly saved so many human lives. Let me draw some truthful pictures that will enable you to see them in the only way in which they can be seen now, through the imagination. It was a pitch-dark night during the last phase of the Argonne Drive, and the supply company of the 307th Infantry, 77th Division, of New York, had been ordered to move up to a point beyond Champignol. Between saint Juvin and this point, there was a long steep hill broken by shell holes covered with deep and sticky mud. The head of the mile-long transport halted in a cold and driving rain, that the tired horses and mules might rest for a minute before the uphill struggle began. It could be but a minute, for the road was under enemy fire, and crowded with guns, tanks, and marching troops struggling toward the front. Get up! A team of Missouri mules threw themselves into their harness, and a rolling kitchen at the head of the column began slowly to climb the hill. The animals, thin and half-starved as they were, pulled bravely on until they were halfway up. Then the wheels slammed into a shell hole, and the mules, after one good try, gave up and stood with hanging heads. Down came the driver's lash, but they simply reared and shook their ears. Mules are quicker than horses to realize when a task is beyond their strength. The whole column was halted, and not all the vigorous and well-intentioned profanity of the Teamsters could start it again. Among the transport animals was a pair of little bay horses with thoroughbred blood, whose driver almost worshipped them. Thanks chiefly to his unremitting care, they had more than held their own. In spite of their light weight, they had stood the hardships of the campaign, their fine spirit was unbroken, and in that long column they alone danced in their muddy tracks and tossed their heads, impatient at delay. Their driver was ordered to go forward with his team to help the mules out of the shell hole. He hitched on in front, the little bays leaped to their task, and, the heartened mules falling in behind them, 
the load was lifted slowly up and forward. Then, under terrific driving, it crawled through the sticky mud to the top of the hill. The mules went on to their hard-earned rest, but now the lathering bays were sent down the hill again. Another team stuck, and the game little horses were brought to its relief. Again and again, and still again, that gallant pair repeated their heartbreaking performances, never balking, never sparing an ounce of their waning strength. Now, when they were hitched, they trembled and staggered. Each time it seemed as if they had reached the limit of their endurance. An officer rode alongside the driver, who was little more than a boy, and asked how they were standing it. Came the sobbing answer, We're killing them! We're killing them! And killed they were, that night in their muddy harness. The proud blood of Godolphin would not let them refuse to fight, but kept them to their never-ending task until they fell, to die by the side of the road. They had given their best, their all, and it was very good, but they gave no more than millions of other horses to make victory possible. Fate may bring them duel and woe, better steeds than they, sleep beside the English guns a hundred leagues away. Not better, perhaps, but just as good and brave, Ay, and beside the French guns, the Belgian guns, and the Italian guns, beside the guns of all the chief combatants in the Great War. Splendid as were the horses in the transport, those serving with the artillery are just as worthy of our admiration. Let me draw you another picture to show them at their work. It was the day before a great attack at Vimy Ridge, and 80,000 British horses and mules had already been drawn into the region about Arras for the big show. Thousands more were pouring in along the principal roads, which were filled with every kind of horse-drawn engine and vehicle used in the game of war. There were field batteries with their limbers and transport, general service wagons, infantry transport including traveling kitchens and water carts, Red Cross supply wagons and ambulances, nearly all drawn by light draft horses, many of them from the states. Now and then there came a string of pack mules from Missouri or Illinois, laden with ammunition, engineers' outfits, or sections of buckboard, a detachment of cavalry, or a big gun drawn by ten or more powerful heavy draft horses that shook the roads as they came. All were moving forward, in timed and orderly procession, to take their definite parts in the great push. For miles in every direction, the country was dotted with camouflaged horse shelters, or groups of horses and mules without shelter. Like those on the road, the animals were of all classes, from light cavalry to heavy shires, but by far the greater number were light draft with Percheron blood, the kind generally used in the transport or, perhaps most important of all, to carry ammunition to the guns at the front. Ah, the guns! There were so many and so hungry. Out there, they lay hidden in their muddy gun pits in a seemingly endless line, which stretched into the horizon to the right and the left, and so close together that a man could barely pass between. And day and night they poured a cataract of roaring, bursting steel, which carried death and ruin to the crumbling German trenches. And they had to be fed those guns, and it was not enough to supply them with shells as fast as the grim-faced sweating gunners could fire them. Each gun must have a thousand rounds of ammunition in reserve. And to carry up those shells over the frightful roads and the almost impassable ground beyond the roads was the work of the only inventions of God or man which could perform it, the horses and the mules. Of course they had been working all the night before and for many nights. They were worn and weary and they should have been resting, but under the existing conditions real rest was impossible for most of them. It had been raining or snowing for days, and the ground was soaked with water. The teamsters of a fortunate few had found hard standing for their animals. A bit of sheltered road, the cellar of a ruined house, boards or tiles torn from a broken building, perhaps. 
and it is surprising what hardships horses can live through if only they have something solid to stand on when they are off duty. But most of them were quartered on soggy earth, which under their own trampling soon became a quagmire into which their legs sank deep. In vain a horse would draw up one hind leg from the sucking mud, the other would sink in just as far, to be pulled out in its turn a moment later. What rest could he get in a treadmill like that? But the plans for the big attack went steadily on, and the gathering dusk found thousands of horses, rested or unrested, going out to their work. Cavalry patrols, with muffled bits and stirrups, moved silently away to gather information at dangerous points beyond the line, and bring it swiftly back. Gun teams left their shelters to pick up their guns and drag them forward to the positions already prepared for them. Transport wagons rumbled in every direction on a thousand errands, and ammunition carts, each drawn by from four to six horses, began to move toward the distant thunder. In imagination we see the teams, hundreds of them, standing patiently at the ammunition dumps and, as the last long shell which completes a load is lifted into position, the willing horses throw their weight into their breastplates, and the long haul has begun. There is no teamster, but each of the nigh horses is ridden by a steel helmeted soldier, technically known as a driver, who guides with the left hand, leaving his right free to manage the off horse and to handle a whip. The mud is everywhere, and deep and clinging, but the horses are comparatively fresh and pull bravely out, now and then swinging round the edge of a big shell crater filled with water, and on until they reach the road. Each wagon takes its place in a long procession moving to the front, while a similar procession on the other side of the road is passing to the rear, composed of empty ammunition wagons going for fresh loads of shells, ambulances carrying wounded to an advance hospital field guns moving to new positions, men from the front line going back to rest. Of course, the road is well known to the enemy, and the German gunners have not neglected it. In spite of all the engineers have been able to do, it is in shocking condition. The horses splash and stumble and bump each other. The heavily laden wagons grind and lurch and slam their wheels into the ruts and shell holes, spouting mud over everything including themselves and the shells they carry. Now and then there is a momentary halt as a wheel gives way or a horse sprains or breaks a leg in a shell hole. But the other teams pull out and around the obstacle. The unserviceable horse is removed, the load of the broken wagon quickly distributed among other teams, and the procession is moving on again as if nothing happened. Two miles or so of this slam banging along the dark and shell blasted road, and then the leaders of some of the wagons swing around to the right through a gap in a hedge scarcely visible against the rain clouded sky. Here the men pull up to breathe their horses. The drivers themselves dismount, their caps and coats covered with wet mud, and here and there one of them with a blanketed lantern or a flashlight looks things over. Large clots of ooze are dropping from hubs and spokes. The shells are thickly coated with brown, and the dripping horses heave and pant from their strenuous work. The roar of the guns is much nearer now, and enemy shells scream overhead, or burst with the splitting crack of thunder close at hand. The worst of the trip is yet before them, so the drivers swing into the saddles and press forward through the night. But the ground has been pulverized by the German barrage, and the rains have made it a swamp. The wheels sink to the hubs and the horses to their knees, and frequent stops have to be made for rest. A field battery just ahead is slowly plowing its way through. When there comes a blinding flash, the earth is rocked by a bursting shell, and above the murderous hiss of the flying fragments the scream of a horse. There is a call for a light, the kicks and groans of a frantic beast, snorts of alarm and plunging hooves, followed by curses and blows. The voices of horse-wise men soothe their trembling teams. There is a sharp order for spare horses, a click of hook and ring, 
and a British field battery moved slowly towards its new position, leaving stretched in the mire two faithful comrades who have done their bit and given all they had to give. But more dangerous even than the shells themselves are the craters now filled with water. They are so numerous that it is almost impossible to avoid them all in the dark. And one misstep by a floundering gun horse or an overladen mule sends him down to his death. Thousands of animals, and many men as well, died in the flooded shell holes at Vimy Ridge alone. These holes are so deep, the sides are so steep, and the mud so soft and yielding, that once an animal gets in, he is usually doomed. Of course, his driver always makes desperate and pathetic efforts to save him, but usually his last kind act is to put a bullet into his old friend's head to end his misery. It is at such times that rough men show their softer natures, prove their very genuine grief at the loss of dumb companions who have shared their hardships. Often they are choked with emotion, and the tears run down their grimy cheeks, tears which their own physical suffering, no matter how terrible, could never have wrung from them. But on through the mud and around the craters, as best they may, the ammunition horses haul and lunge and flounder toward their goal. Perhaps before they can reach the gun positions which mark the end of their journey, they get into a quagmire which defies their waning strength and courage. The mud holds the wagon fast in its sticky jaws. Pull as they will, they cannot move it. It seems that flesh and blood can stand no more. Oh, yes, it can, though. In war, it can. For now the drivers call on the trembling brutes again, and drawing long whips, they flog them through make them give up those last few ounces of strength which are needed to win. For just beyond are the guns, the guns which must be fed, because the fate of the world depends upon the feeding of them. And as the shells are unloaded, the horses stand, legs wide apart, heads bowed, sides heaving, and with lathered coats streaked with red and brown, and presently they will pull themselves together, struggle back with the empty wagon, and, after a brief rest, be started to the front again with another load of shells. And Vimy Ridge was taken, and it was those shells, and millions more, carried up by the sweat and blood of horses and mules, that loosed the clutch of German hands, and made way for the waves of cold steel that would not be denied. And it was the cavalry which, Hell for leather, swept forward after the retreating foes, and cleaned up the towns and villages they tried in vain to hold. It has been said that the days of cavalry have passed, but you can't tell that to the men who saw it at Vimy, and you can't tell it to the men who saw the immortal Scott Greys go through at Mons, as they went through at Waterloo. And they would laugh in your face who saw Allenby loose his whirlwinds over the plains of Palestine like the scourge of God, and plow the soil of it beneath the hoofs of his galloping horses in such fashion that the seed of the Turk will never sprout there again. There were many factors which contributed to the winning of Vimy, but perhaps none was more important than the horses. Certain it is that without the horses this great stronghold could never have been taken. And since it was our war, not their war, it is only fair to ask what compensation they got. Half of them died. The other half that lived through it lived through the storms of shells and bullets, through the heartbreaking work performed under the terrible conditions of war through the diseases which attacked them when those conditions had reduced their vitality, have received few honors. By some, it has even been denied that they played a great part. What they did get, if they were lucky, was a bare living. But they earned more than that, and the balance is still due to them. We use those horses and millions more to the very limit, and it was fitting that we should. When men are dying by thousands, and civilization itself is at stake, there is no time for sentimentality. There was no reason for sparing horses if by their use we could shorten the war, 
and save the lives of men and all that real men stand for. But by using them in this way, we incurred a deep and lasting debt of gratitude. We can never pay it to them. More than half of them are dead. The rest we shall never see. But we can pay it in part, and lasting shame to us if we don't. By greater kindness, greater decency, more thought and consideration for other horses all over the world, no matter in what capacities they may be working. Let us pay our debt. Let us pay our debt. End of section two. Section three of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bruce McCready. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Section three, The Fighting Horse. Cavalry lost much in popular esteem during the war. Attention was centered upon the European front, where the major portions of opposing forces were long locked in trench fighting, and the combat was stabilized. There was no field for cavalry's salient characteristics. However, it is axiomatic that wars are decided not by armies in position, but armies in motion. The war was lost for Germany in the opening weeks of movement. It was won for the Allies beyond all question when the whirlwind campaigns in Palestine and Syria turned an enemy flank and forced Turkey to capitulate. In both these comparatively brief periods, cavalry played a highly significant part. Both German and American leaders felt the pinch of insufficient cavalry at critical moments. General von Kluck, describing the pursuit of the British Army after Mons and its skillful and successful retreat on August 24th and 25th, 1914, declared that it escaped his net chiefly because he lacked the effective means of making it stand and fight, namely the three cavalry divisions of Marwitz's corps. General Hunter Liggett, commanding the American First Army, believed that if he had been able to throw two small cavalry divisions into the conflict on November 2, 1918, very few organized units of the enemy could have escaped. In each case, the retreating force was favored by scanty cavalry in pursuit. British cavalry proved its worth during the initial fighting near Mons and the subsequent retirement. In the advance and the preliminary fighting it covered, the British front until contact with the enemy became close, when it moved to protect the left flank. German pressure soon became so heavy that withdrawal was ordered, but the British were so closely held and so hotly engaged that they could not break away until the 2nd Cavalry Brigade attacked the German flank by both mounted and dismounted attack. Vigorously delivered, this held up the German advance for about three hours, and this small moment of respite enabled the British Army to organize an orderly retreat. Field Marshal Lord French has stated that, had it not been for skillful handling of the small cavalry units, the British Second Corps would undoubtedly have been surrounded and three of its five divisions captured that then the Germans would have cut off the British First Corps, and then, pressing on the flank of the Allies, would have pushed them off their line of retreat. A second Sedan of vast proportions would have resulted, and Field Marshal Lord Haig's official report was, Throughout the Great Retirement in 1914, our cavalry covered the retirement and protected the flanks of our columns against the onrush of the enemy, and on frequent occasions prevented our infantry from being overrun by the enemy cavalry. A few weeks later, in October 1914, there took place a race to the sea, of which Field Marshal Lord French wrote, The greatest threat of danger with which we were faced was staved off by the devoted bravery and endurance displayed by the cavalry corps under a commander, General Allenby, who handled them throughout with consummate skill. It is no disparagement to other troops engaged if I lay stress upon the fact that it was cavalry alone who for more than a fortnight previously had been disputing foot by foot every yard of ground to the River Lees. They fought day and night with the greatest tenacity. 
taking into account the losses they suffered, they can hardly have opposed more than 2,000 rifles to the onslaught of more than two German army corps. The conclusion is unavoidable that, throughout the early movements, cavalry forces were essential in the highest degree, and that this continued until the stabilizing of the front. This necessarily imposed a minor role upon an arm whose chief asset is mobility, but events were occurring elsewhere that were to require the use of cavalry, not in defense, but in offense, not in small units, but in large masses, in operations conceived broadly and pushed to complete success with a dash and a spirit typical of the finest cavalry traditions. This was the answer flung at the detractors of the mounted army in June 1917, when General Allenby, whose skillful use of cavalry in the early movements won highest praise, was ordered to the command in Egypt. British prestige in the east was at low ebb. The disasters at Gallipoli and at Kut al Amara were still poignant, and two heavy attacks made upon the defenses of Gaza had been thrown back with the loss of 11,000 men. Germany, holding the Allies immobile on the Western Front, looked hopefully to her Turkish ally to compass the British overthrow in the East. Throughout Muslim countries, the spirit of revolt was raising its ugly head. Pan-Islamic emissaries stirred the faithful against their white rulers, and the Turkish arms became invested with a sort of legend of invincibility. One more success, and the holy war might run like wildfire. The effect of... Such a culmination upon the outcome of the Great War was hardly problematical. In that crisis, it was necessary that the British supremacy be reestablished without mishap and without delay. This was the task committed to Allenby, a lifelong cavalryman. His tactical problem was, first, to drive the Turks from their entrenched position on the gaza Beersheba line, and secondly, to accomplish their complete ruin. How this was done, how his squadron swirled like a flooding vengeance against the ancient plain of Philistia to the utter destruction of their empire's foes, is now history. Making a feint at Gaza, the real attack was sprung as a surprise at Beersheba on October 31st, after a night march by cavalry over unknown country to gain the enemy flank and rear. The region was waterless. It could be no more than a one-day operation success or failure ere nightfall, and Allenby was no Joshua to cause the sun to stand still. Turkish morale was high and the defense was stubborn. It was not until within a half hour of sundown that it appeared the objective might be gained, and victory then was accomplished by two regiments of Australian cavalry who, supported by gunfire, galloped across the open straight into the trenches. The sight was inspiring. Night was falling and the enemy trenches were outlined in flashes of fire from their own rifles, while above them burst the British shells. Against the position, the long lines of cavalry swept forward at racing speed, half hidden in dust. Amid the deafening noise, they appeared to move silently. On and over they went, leaped two lines of deep trenches, dismounted on the far side, and with the bayonet flung themselves into a hand-to-hand -hand settlement. All was ended in ten minutes. Two thousand prisoners, five hundred enemy dead, all at the cost of sixty-four dead and wounded. This action initiated the spirit of Dash, which dominated the entire campaign. It opened the way for the capture of Jerusalem. With the Turkish left rolled up, Gaza at the seaward end of the line fell, and Allenby broke through the center at Sharia and Herrera. He gave the Turks no breathing spell. Cavalry streamed through the gap, and the enemy in two groups retreated northward under vigorous pursuit. Led by German generals, the Turks stubbornly fought delaying actions and resorted to all devices to keep the pursuers from water. It became a war for water. The supply was scanty, and when the Turks could no longer defend wells, they blew them up. Water once in the thirty hours was a luxury to Allenby's command, and it happened many times that his horses marched and fought more than seventy hours without quenching their thirst. They suffered more from a lack of water than from all other hardships. At nightfall, horses were often so exhausted that they refused food, and it was not uncommon to see weary troopers, 
themselves athirst, knead the horse's dry grain into little balls moistened with a few drops of water, and feed their mounts by hand. The half-dead animals responded to sympathetic human care. The Turks delayed the advance sufficiently to enable them to entrench on strong natural positions, thus compelling a series of actions of high significance. At Hoj, they fortified an exceptionally strong height and were dealing a devastating fire when a few scattered troops of the Yeomanry Division, hardly a squadron in all, charged. It was a deadly clash. The Turkish gunners fired point-blank into the charging horsemen, and their infantry, leaping upon the limbers, blazed away with their rifles until cut down. It was all over in a very few minutes, fierce while it lasted, and no surrender. Few of the Turks lived to fight again, while of the 175 British yeomanry who delivered the blow, but 95 came through unscathed. This was an outstanding instance of great accomplishment by a small cavalry force well led. The charge was on the spur of the moment without reconnaissance or fire support and was actually a tryout of a new weapon, being the first time the troops got properly home with the modern cavalry thrusting sword, which proved its worth. The fruit of the charge included four machine guns, eleven guns, a key point of defense, the Turks' principal ammunition depot, and even the Turkish staff's wireless codebook. This latter proved of great advantage, for it enabled the British to decode all messages and to be in possession of enemy orders as soon as issued. All this was the result of the impetuous charge of an unsupported handful of cavalry against a strong artillery position. That th sort of thing is commonly held to be impossible by those who would hold cavalry to be a back number. Nevertheless, it is the sort of thing Allenby's men did time and again in those memorable days. Indeed, this was a campaign in which the word impossible found no place. The impossible was accomplished, and detractions of the cavalry were trampled into everlasting silence by the unstayed power of horse-borne fighting men, carried to the supreme heights of accomplishment by their cavalry characteristics of mobility and firepower. Their deeds would seem fabulous in spite of the results, were it not for the authentic accounts of eyewitnesses. Dry area and rearguard resistance had enabled the Gaza garrison to escape, leaving most of his infantry to follow, Allenby threw his cavalry northward in pursuit. The chase was racking. The whole corps suffered the tortures of thirst. On one occasion, horses went three days and four nights without water. Consummate horsemanship alone saved them, brought them to final victory. One method of conserving the horse's strength was to carry a biscuit or petrol tin of water on the dashboard of every gun and wagon, and at hourly halts to wipe their mouths, nostrils, and eyes with wet cloths. This refreshed them and relieved the symptoms of distress. Push on was the only order. Obstacles of man and nature, separate and combined, were tenaciously tackled and steadily reduced. On November 13th, the enemy, who had been fleeing northward, was found posted on a new line, facing west and covering the roads to Jerusalem. The key point was El Mughal, a high rocky ridge. The brigade of infantry advancing to assault was definitely stopped by rifle and machine gun fire. A call for aid reached the cavalry. Bucks and Dorset Yeomanry responded. The position could be reached only by mounted charge over ground bare of cover, and Yeomanry had two miles to go under direct fire, but were supported by artillery and machine guns. Their work forms a cavalry classic. They scrambled up the steep sides of a watercourse, gained the plain, and trotted forward in extended order. At a half mile from the enemy, they shook into a fast canter. At a hundred yards from the crest, the order to charge was given, and in they went with the sword. There was little momentum left in the charge by the time they reached the enemy, but the long swords did not need much pace behind them to do their work properly, and the issue was never in doubt. The Turks were completely routed, their right broken, their army again split. They lost 1,500 in prisoners, and 600 dead were counted in the position. The British loss was 129 officers and men, 265 horses killed or wounded, a small price to pay for the results gained. The next morning, Junction Station on the Jaffa-Jerusalem Railroad was entered. 
The two weeks smashing campaign had brought Allenby to his tactical objective. The Anzac Mounted Division and the New Zealand Mounted Brigade now drove the enemy north along the coastal plain and entered Jaffa. The Yeomanry Division herded the Turks along the hills, driving them from successive positions. Out of respect to religious sentiment, General Allenby endeavored so to dispose his troops as to isolate Jerusalem completely and thus avoid fighting near the holy places. But the enemy was not restrained by any such sentiment. Some of the fiercest engagements of the campaign were fought during these movements. They were carried forward in a barren, rocky, ravine-riven land, very difficult for cavalry and with greatly reduced forces. Ultimate success was the reward, and on December 11th, General Allenby entered Jerusalem through the Jaffa Gate, which, in accordance with ancient tradition, is open only to a conqueror of the holy city. Since the beginning of operations on October 31st, the force had fought nine general engagements, taken 9,500 prisoners and 80 guns, and advanced some 80 miles into enemy territory. The actual distances covered by some of the cavalry divisions were well above 200 miles. There followed the occupation of the Jordan Valley and raids across the Jordan against the Hedges Railway, designed to divide the Turkish forces still further by compelling them to maintain a considerable army to the east of the river. The strategy was successful. The Turkish Fourth Army was held there, and when the general advance on the west was resumed in September 1918, it was directed against the Turkish Seventh and Eighth Armies only. The eyes of the Turks and their German leaders were filled with the dust of deception, in the use of which Allenby was a master, and they were completely misled, both as to the disposition of his troops and his ultimate purpose. A bold, simple plan, which might serve as a model for the modern use of cavalry, had been worked out, and it was now put in operation. It involved the use of infantry divisions to throw back the right flank of the enemy near Jaffa, opening a seacoast door some 15 miles wide through which the cavalry was to move and gain control of the Turkish lines of retreat. Both Turkish armies would inevitably become enmeshed in the net drawn around them. The movement was carried through with the utmost speed. Infantry threw wide the door, cavalry poured through, gained the Turkish rear almost unperceived, threaded the narrow passes of the Carmel Range by night, and emerged upon the historic plain of Estraelin. They traveled in the print of olden war. But there was no time for research or to muse upon past conflicts. They dashed into Nazareth, raided the Turkish general headquarters there, cut the railway, and then, returning to the outlets of the Carmel Range, disposed themselves in folds and hollows of the ground to net the Turks, driven from their positions and always retiring. All night long, defeated Turkish battalions marched down the mountain road and out upon the plain. It was an eerie experience to lie in wait and watch the Turks trudge wearily along in the bright moonlight, all unconscious of the keen eyes of their enemies on every side. As each detachment got well out into the plain, the waiting squadrons were signaled. They sprang from their hiding places and charged down upon it. The terror of the Turks was not assumed when their senses were assailed by the thunder of encompassing hooves, and when wild horsemen, their size exaggerated in the moonlight, drove relentlessly in upon them. Of resistance, there was little. Each detachment was quickly hustled out of sight, and the squadrons returned to their lairs to await the coming of the next. By daylight, the plain presented an extraordinary sight. It seemed to be covered with prisoners, motor cars, lorries, wagons, animals, and stores in confusion, among which the sorely tried Australian troopers pushed their way, sweating and swearing, now rounding up a parcel of straying prisoners, and now riding savagely at the horde of natives hovering on the outskirts and looting the stores of conquerors and of conquered with impartiality. In a few days, the debacle was complete. No force capable of resistance remained west of the Jordan. Attention was immediately turned to the 4th Army on the east, which was retreating on Damascus. Push on, was the order. To read of such campaigns is easy, but it should be borne in mind what push on actually meant. 
The campaign had been pushed with ever-increasing boldness for more than a year on end over a terrain of untold difficulty in a climate which, so far as the Jordan Valley was concerned, was shunned by civilized man. That it was in every essential a cavalry campaign, and that in all that time no remounts had been received. The last horses had been received in Egypt in June 1917, and most of them had been issued to units before the commencement of the Gaza Beersheba operations. 8,000 remounts had been secured in Australia, but they could not be moved on account of the shipping shortage. Every available ship was carrying men from America to Europe. Until the end of the war, no more horses reached Egypt. When the stock of remounts in Palestine was exhausted, casualties were replaced by horses that had seen service and had been sent, sick or wounded, to veterinary hospitals and were reissued as soon as they were reasonably fit for work. The stamina of the horses had been gradually worn down. At the commencement of the Great Turning Movement in September 1918, the remount depots were emptied and there were scarcely a fit horse left behind the fighting troops. Push on! On account of the reduced strength and numbers of both men and mounts, increased mobility was required in the pursuit of the Turkish Fourth Army. To this end, all transport, even to regimental water carts, was left behind. Nothing on wheels but guns, ammunition wagons, and a few light ambulances participated. Men and horses carried only two days' rations, and when those were gone, there were to live on the country. Practically, that is what they did until the administration of the conquered country was handed over to the French, more than a year later. Military operations ended October 2, 1918, with a remarkable charge by the 3rd Australian Light Horse Brigade. They galloped six miles over an open plain, through hot fire, and charged the Turks with the sword, going completely through the opposing force. In point of distance, this may be a record cavalry charge, and it was not a little peculiar that it should have been delivered so near the close of a war which was popularly supposed to have sounded the death knell of cavalry. The campaign restored the tottering fortunes of England in the east, but more immediately it resulted in the complete destruction of three Turkish armies and the capture of 90,000 prisoners, of whom more than 83,000 were credited to the cavalry arm, which never exceeded a strength of 25,000. The Berlin to Baghdad dream had proved chimerical. Turkey was eliminated as a combatant, and the end of the great struggle was brought within sight. In all this success, the horse, the trained cavalry mount, under the direction of an unexcelled cavalry leader, played a conspicuous part. And this was true on all fronts at various times. The operation of cavalry was not only conspicuous and efficient, but often decisive. Nothing mechanical on earth or above it has yet been devised that excels or even equals the horse in war. The tank is more expensive, much slower, and hampered to a greater extent by terrain. The airplane should properly be regarded, not as a supplementing, but as a coordinate arm. Allenby employed it thus and gave his cavalry a broader horizon, enabling it to deliver such bold strokes as were seen in Syria and Mesopotamia, strokes such as no other arm is capable of. But the airplane on reconnaissance is worthless in fog or darkness, and it cannot detect forces sheltered by woods. British planes operating in constant dust above the Jordan Valley found it hard to spot enemy guns even when firing. German planes were unable to locate entire divisions of Allenby's cavalry concealed in olive and orange groves. An able, energetic enemy is most apt to be unpleasantly active just when atmospheric conditions would conceal his movements from airplane or reconnaissance. So it becomes necessary to rely upon a mobile ground force that can work under any and all conditions. For such a force, the horse has always been and still is essential. Field Marshal Lord Haig says, Infantry and artillery can win wars. Only cavalry can make them worth winning. Wars are still won by troops in motion, and no arm can compare in mobility with cavalry. The fruit of victory can be secured only by its presence. A multitude of authorities, European and American, carry the same message. 
This is something for America to consider. In open warfare, there was more use for cavalry now than ever before in modern war. And it is open warfare for which the American army is being organized and trained. General Pershing declares, The American theory for the employment of cavalry is correct. In any future war on the American continent, the use of cavalry will be as important as in the past. Bred for hardiness and activity, the best animals for army purposes are also the most valuable for agriculture, commerce, and sport, is the testimony of Field Marshal Haig. Major George S. Patton, Jr., 3rd United States Cavalry, an authority on tanks but a believer in horses, says, The horse exists in large numbers. His pattern is sealed by the Creator and is not subject to constant and expensive alterations. He is not produced by the sinful rich nor bred by corporations. He is the God-given property of the common people. By maintaining cavalry and horsed artillery, we shall continue to benefit the largest and most worthy class of our constituents, the farmers of America. Behind the lines, where transport was all important, the war gave the relative merits of animal and motor a thorough practical test. The animal has not been ousted. Rather, he and the motor supplement each other. Rivalry disappears in cooperation. Which will surpass the other in service in any future war is likely to depend largely on the nature of the country in which operations are conducted and the relative availability of gasoline and forage. The war in France favored motorized equipment. In our own mountain land or our southwest, an extensive use of animals would probably develop. The human factors, lack of horsemanship in the general run of American young men, and the carelessness and thriftlessness of men in charge of motors must be taken into consideration. The advantage of motors lies in the vast tonnage moved by them and the relatively small amount of gas and oil required to keep up motor transportation as compared with the enormous supplies of forage and equipment for animals. This suggests the question of sources of supply. In both forage and oil, the United States is practically independent. All the more reason, then, why the nature of the country over which the operations are conducted will, with us, decide the preponderance of transport means. Practice may be depended upon to work out a reasonable balance. The War Department retains a large amount of animal strength in our war tables of organization. At the present day, the proportion of animals to men, four to one, remains about the same as it was at the time of the Civil War, in spite of the present use of motors. This may be partly due to the fact that animals of the required type are always hard to get, and invariably in war the numbers requisitioned are only partly supplied. By keeping the ratio high, a serious shortage may be avoided. Nevertheless, the fact is significant, and it is clear that war has not lowered the value of the horse in open operations, nor has the motor eliminated him as a burden-bearer behind the lines. End of Section 3、section、4 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Italy's Remounts. Italy drew heavily upon America for horses. Of the 30,000 heavy draft animals used, 20,000 were American Percherons, coming principally from Nebraska, Michigan, Oklahoma, and Missouri. The values ran from $215 for very heavy animals down to $175 for cavalry and light artillery weights. The Percherons were used to haul the big 149 mm guns, six to the gun. The Azono knew their worth. The lighter draft horses, when they were not native Italian stock, were also American and the product of breeders in the eastern states. Their values ranged from $190 down to $175. They were of a special use on the 75 mm e guns, ammunition wagons, and general transport. 
Cavalry horses, almost without exception, were Italian, some being bred from imported English stallions. Italian cavalry is preeminently a horse product, the school of instruction being a development by the Italian staff to meet the requirements of Italian terrain, with its low and swampy land, its many rivers to be swum, and its many precipitous heights to be negotiated. Its unique training had justification in the brilliant cavalry work during the Great Retreat of 1917, along the Tagliamento and through the surrounding district. A year later came the smashing victory of Italian cavalry over the Austrians at Vittorio Veneto, which undoubtedly helped Italian experts in arriving at their conclusion that the resolute man on horseback will remain in future, as he has been in the past, one of the decisive factors in war. This is the conclusion also of military experts in other countries, France, England, Germany, America. The response of horses to intelligent training is one of the finest, most endearing features of the animal's nature. They recognize bugle calls and will often execute the required movement without direction from the rider. The intelligence and courage of the horse combine again and again to surprise and delight his human master. During the operations of Italian cavalry on the Corrada, near Plazo, a shell struck just behind a horse. The animal immediately bolted from the spot as if in fear. But fear it was not. It was no more than intelligent self-preservation. The shell failed to explode, and the horse, Missing the accustomed shock after the requisite time had elapsed, showed he was not panic-struck. Of his own accord he returned to his station, smelled of the shell, and then stood at attention. As high a development of calm, reason courage would not always be found in his human rider. The veterinary service was organized in each army with a chief, ranking as colonel and the necessary subordinates, the routine of animal care required that if an animal at the front needed but slight attention, it should be treated on the spot. If out of commission two weeks, it was sent back to an advance hospital. If for thirty days or more, still farther back to the second line hospital. And if for two or three months, to a base hospital. This paper theory was seldom adhered to, however. In actual practice, unless animals could be cured quickly, they were killed. It was not considered practical to continue a patient in hospital longer than three months. Each army had also its biological laboratory and its school of farriery. A special pathological cabinet was maintained for the production of serum for inoculation against strangles. An apparatus was in use for the disinfection of harness from diseased horses, and another for the economical salvaging of dead animals. The depot for beef cattle also came under the care of the veterinary service. All meat was inspected by veterinarians before issue to troops. In addition to cattle, some 20,000 horses, useless for army work, passed through this veterinary department and were issued as food for soldiers and civilians. Some played-out beasts with a little work left in them were presented to poor farmers, while others that would bring a price were disposed of at public sale. Italian service was severe on horses. The total evacuations rose to 300,000. Two-thirds of these were cases of general disease. Mange, the great curse for army horses, attacked 70,000. It was fought with the calcium sulfide bath, the sulfurous acid gas chamber, and tobacco extract. The wounded numbered 30,000, of which 10,000 died. The total war losses were 80,000. The famed Italian remount station of Lazio, near Rome, covers 2,500 acres and lies in a luxuriant country rimmed by the wonderfully blue Sabine Hills. There the army has established a unique depot where many hundreds of horses are maintained under practically natural conditions. They roam the hills and vales of this wide area in the bright sunlight, to all intents and purposes, wild horses. In company with two Italian officers, I rode out to inspect them, and they were not particularly afraid. 
Rather, they were filled with an exuberance of spirits which caused them, first of all, to stare at us in a defiant sort of way, and then dash off before us a great rippling stream, perhaps to the top of one of the grassy hills. There we saw their splendid figures against the sky in the strong breeze, with manes, tails, ears erect. In our imaginations their alarm was only affected, for well they knew their advantage over us in the open. The next moment, with tails and manes streaming in the wind, they plunged through the tall grass down the side of the hill. At its foot they encountered a broad stream of water, through which they galloped straight on, sending the sparkling, far-flung water straight up, where it broke and fell, forming myriad rainbows. A moment later they were gone, but this and a score of similar pictures of these superb young animals, destined some day to be broken for the Italian cavalry, gave me an idea of the joyful life that horses may lead under natural conditions. Of course, it is not always possible to give horses freedom such as this, but the joy I witnessed confirmed my lifelong opinion that horses, even as men, should have vacations regularly. And by vacations, I do not mean the sort of holiday that is grudgingly given an old and decrepit horse when he is no longer capable of doing his work. Legal provisions should be made that young, able-bodied horses, working year in and year out for the benefit of men, should have their vacations as regularly as their masters. In other words, they should have their vacations when they are due, and while they are still in splendid condition and able to enjoy the free interval. It might be fair to put it another way that no man shall receive the best services of a four-footed workman nine-tenths of the year, services for which he pays only board and lodging. If he cannot afford to present his workman with the odd tenth, to be his very own and enjoyed in his own way. A man who deprives his equine worker of a vacation when due should not be allowed to own a horse or to have any control whatever over a single individual of that noble race. Incidentally, such a vacation, given regularly once a year, would secure greater longevity and a longer working life, which in the end would make the animal a much more valuable workman. End of section 4《セクション5》of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kylan Weber from BridgeRecording.com.《Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines》Algerian Spahis。The pomp and circumstance of war were, as usual, furnished by cavalry. No combination of military trappings has yet been found to equal the thrilling effect of the mounted fighter when men and steed are in the pink. It may be as claimed that the infantry is the backbone of the army and the artillery the brain. It still remains that cavalry typifies speed and power. The appeal of the horse is irresistible. Those who beat the drum will agree that recruiting for cavalry is far easier than for any other service. When it comes to the picturesque effect, the palm must be awarded to the Spahis. This native cavalry, recruited from the dark-skinned Muhammadan sons of Algiers and officered by Frenchmen, holds a unique position. Its ancient name comes from the Persian Sipari warriors, and in the Turkish service of the days, when the Turk was in his glory, the Spahis formed the flower of his army. From the time of the Sultan Amrath I in 1326 down to about 1800, they were something to be reckoned with in dread. They may be accurately described as light, irregular cavalry, and their numbers ran as high as 130,000. When the French wrested Algiers from Turkish control, Spahis formed portions of several Algerian garrisons. They accepted French service, and their organization was perpetuated. With their oriental traditions of color and costume grafted on to French military efficiency, they equally gratify the lover of display and the Simon Pure soldier. 
the sense of their resistless mobility is heightened by their flowing robes. Even the stoutest troops are no strangers to that feeling of goneness in the pit of the stomach when the Spahis deliver a charge, dashing down with all the deadly certainty of a white avalanche. The effect on the enemy's morale is equaled only by that of their enormous curved sabers on his physique. This detail of efficiency was put to good use soon after the Allied powers decided upon the occupation of Thessaly in May 1917. After such delay, telegraphic orders had reached General Sarrail, commanding to proceed with the occupation. He had concentrated his troops on the frontier of Old Greece. Included were four regiments of cavalry, Chasseurs Afrique and Spahis, and they were quartered at Serbia, a quaint little village owing its name to the fact that some Serbs had been held there in the time of the Emperor Heraclius. From there, they moved to Larissa with infantry, artillery, and some six-inch guns. Colonel de Fortin, charged with taking the surrender of the Greek officers of the garrison, went to the barracks accompanied by an interpreter, through whom he invited the officers to enter the principal mess building and lay their swords on the table. The colonel preceded them to the mess hall and waited. No one came. From the corridor came an excited chatter of Greek voices, but that was all. Finally, the interpreter entered and said, Mon colonel, they say they won't give up their swords. I am not here to discuss it with them, Colonel de Fortin replied. I have orders to take their surrender. If they will not give up their swords, I shall go away, and it is war. Chemin en va, c'est la guerre. He then calmly allowed them ten minutes to decide. When the time was up, he walked to his car, intending to order an advance in force against the barracks. But at that moment, his staff captain, Captain Bellinger, hastened up, saying, Mon Colonel, there's a whole battalion of Esvons escaping through the cornfields at the back of the garracks. Bring up the Spahis, de Fortun ordered. And Captain Bellinger saluted, wheeled and dashed away across the half-mile grassy parade ground in front of the barracks. The Spahis appeared, three regiments of brown-faced sphinxes, a billowing white cloud on eager horses. The Esvons escape! Colonel de Fortun shouted to Colonel Duperthuis, commanding, Où sont ils? De Fortun pointed down one of the avenues between the scattered barrack buildings. The Spahis poured themselves in pursuit. Like a white flood, they closed in, around and over the terrified Evzonis. And that time, the war was over before it started. When General Allenby, in August 1918, was preparing for the great operation in Palestine and Syria, which annihilated three Turkish armies and forced Turkey out of the war. His 5th Australian Light Horse Brigade was completed by the inclusion of the French Regiment Mix de Cavalerie. This was a four-squadron unit consisting of two squadrons of regular French cavalry and two of Algerian Spahis. The Spahis, with their picturesque, Half-Arab uniform costume added a distinct note of color to the division and were a revelation to the dun-clad Australians with whom they were brigaded. They were mounted on excellent barbs, possessing great stamina, and which could march indefinitely if allowed to take their own gait. But the larger horses of the Australians often set a pace that proved hot for them. They were valuable troops wherever they could be thrown upon the enemy, for the Turks had as little relish for a cavalry charge as for anything that ever comes to troops, and charging was a thing in which the Spahis specialized. The Spahis were too few in number to take the leading part in any of the great troop movements, yet they never failed to give a good account of themselves or to justify the pride they take in an origin that is now vague in the dim past of many centuries. One of my thrilling recollections of closing events of the war is of a review of Spahis by General Pershing. Most of these swarthy troops were clothed in flowing white, but some wore blue or red robes, and the headgear of all was conspicuously dignified, and every one of them was mounted on a little white dancing Arab. None but real horsemen could have handled those small fiery creatures, which were stamping and rearing out of pure exuberance of spirits. 
wonderfully garbed Arab trumpeters sounded the signals on clear-toned bugles. We saw them, in effortless movement, mount the bluffs at one side of the great maneuvering field covered with grass, which stretched away for half or three-quarters of a mile. There, crowning the knoll, they danced hundreds and hundreds of white Arab steeds, each bearing an Arab rider. Then the bugles sounded, and like a snowstorm before a high wind, they wheeled and swept down the hillside and over the full length of the reviewing field. First, handling their horses with the left hand, they unswung their carbines from their backs and put them to their shoulders and fired point blank. Then, tossed the carbines into the air and caught them as they came down, moving while at top speed. After that, all shouted strange, wild cries with the full force of their voices. They drew their great sabers from beneath the saddle flaps and began a mimic warfare, which most men would have regarded as a sentence of death. The entire spectacle constituted one of the most picturesque sights connected with Allied cavalry. End of section 5. Chapter 6 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doty. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Work and Play. Neither remount men nor veterinarians could be everywhere and serve all animals at all times. Much animal welfare depended on the attitude of the soldier toward his horse, and this, to the everlasting credit of American manhood, was universally fine. It was not always intelligent, but lapses could generally be charged to ignorance of animals due to the changed conditions of living. In years now gone, every boy who could had his pony. He rode it and cared for it, and familiarity with horses was general. Association with his four-legged friend bred a love of animals in the heart of the youth. Today, the boy's wish is for a car, not a pony. His love of speed turns him from his old-time friend, and in after years an affection for animals is hard to kindle into a steady flame. Many soldiers simply did not know how to care for their horses. Their picket lines were muddy, their animals unkempt, their harness stiff. They had not learned the art of putting weight on the brush when grooming animals, nor elbow grease into their work when oiling harness. They meant well and tried hard, but netted a poor result. After a time, men with horse knowledge were assigned to each army corps and division to teach young American men the care of animals, and schools were established to inculcate in willing minds the proper methods. While troops were actually engaged, these men did missionary work, and as soon as possible started instruction again. Thus, green troops were taught the art of taking advantage of cover, how to construct picket lines, how to groom animals, how to oil harness. Many an affecting incident occurred to show that the soldier's heart was in the right place. One terrible night, the officer of the day was making his rounds and heard strange sounds in the darkness beneath a tree. Turning his flashlight on the spot, he disclosed a soldier rubbing the belly of his mount. "'What's this for?' the officer demanded. "'Bill's sick, sir,' replied the soldier. "'He's got a fierce bellyache, and he thrashes all around when I ain't rubbing him. There's no vet in the outfit, and the stable sergeant's sick.' The night was cold and rainy, but the soldier had given up his blankets for his mount, having spread them over the animal's back. He was wet to the skin and numb with cold." but his love for his horse carried him through the discomfort. His first and only thought was for the noble steed that carried him. A little later, he wondered why it was that a sleepy veterinarian arrived from another outfit and gave Bill the dose of medicine needed to end his colic. The officer of the day had been given another opportunity to understand why American soldiers would not be denied when they went into action, and he added one humane act to another by turning out a veterinarian to care for the suffering animal. Behind the lines in the Otgun, there was an engineer regiment, the men of which undertook to handle all the stallions which had been returned to duty from the veterinary hospital. Those French horses presented a peculiar problem to American soldiers. They needed nursing along when first inducted into service, but if brought to hand properly, they were serviceable enough and lasted a long time. These particular stallions had not had the time to go through the usual training period. 
but the engineers used them intelligently, and inside of three weeks were giving them the hardest kind of work and the animals were getting fat on it. The secret lay in giving them light work at first and gradually getting them used to greater efforts. In the artillery, it was different. When a gun had to be moved, there was a certain destination for it, and it had to be there at a certain hour to open up on the enemy's lines. The animals sent in at the start could not be given sufficient rest on the way. Human lives precluded such a step, and the horse, his praises unsung, went forward until he dropped. At Chateau Thury, at St. Mihel, and again in the Otgun, many horses remained in the traces from forty-eight to seventy-two hours in order that guns should be got into position. As time wore on, conditions improved for all animals, and in the final days of the drive, the only ones really to suffer were the gun horses. They yanked guns into position only to pull them out again a little later and again take up the chase of the flying enemy. A chase that seemed like that for the rainbow's end. Organization commanders who were horsemen showed their horsemanship in these moves. Animals under them received splendid care, and the men seemed to imbibe horse sense and knowledge. Drivers who had been schooled in their work were careful to dismount when halted on a hillside. They chalked the wheels to ease the strain on the tired horse's shoulders, and while resting, looked over the harness. Steel helmets played a part also. They were used to dip water from nearby streams, and thirsty horses got a few swallows while waiting for the command forward. Other drivers would be filling their tin derbies from a grain sack on the caisson, and holding them up to give the horses a quick lunch. If time allowed, a little hay would be added to the short ration. These little attentions helped the efficiency and comfort of the animals, and they came from the hearts of the men. They would rather serve their beasts than be idle. Battery commanders were instructed to carry a bale of hay and a sack of grain on each caisson. With this forage on hand when the guns pulled into position, it was possible for all animals to be fed properly until the arrival of trains with food, forage, and ammunition. After the armistice was signed, plans were carried into effect whereby the men gained further knowledge of horse and mule. Horsemanship schools were started in the first, second, and third armies under Colonel Henry R. Richmond, who had gained an enviable reputation throughout the army while on duty as senior instructor at Fort Riley, Kansas. He took as assistants the best horsemen in the regular service, as well as the best of those who came in to offer their all to their country during the emergency. In the Third Army, where Major General Joseph E. Dickman held sway, interest was aroused among all officers and men by doing everything possible to make better horsemen. These classes in equitation had the desired effect. In several divisions other than those of the Third Army, horse shows were held and deep interest was shown in all of them. Events ran from water carts drawn by one horse to six-line teams and jumping contests. The condition of the animals and their appearance, as well as the appearance of equipage and driver, were taken into consideration. There was one great drawback to the success of the saddle events, and that was the paucity of good cavalry horses. There were but few in the American Expeditionary Force. When animals were rushed over from the United States, recommendations were made that a certain percentage of them should be cavalry horses. But it was believed at the time that there would be no real call for cavalry mounts in France. While there was no urgent call for these lighter animals during the months of the heaviest fighting, yet as soon as the armies went into more or less permanent quarters, the commanding generals turned their attention to the drill and education of troops along lines laid down in peace times. The first cry raised by the officers was for horses. Horses were needed for equitation, for polo, for demonstration purposes, and above all, for something that would be of deep and unflagging interest to the two million men of the American Expeditionary Force whose eyes were turning westward where the home fires burned bright for their return. All could not go at once, and something had to be done to keep the spirits of the men at a high level. There was but one answer. Horses. Horses were secured from all sections of the American forces, and the best of them were placed where they would do the most good. The plan worked to success, and Uncle Sam's nephews will be all the better horsemen for having had to wait a few months for the boat with just one destination, home. But it is easy to lay too much stress on the play that follows work and not enough upon the rudiments. Home. A dusky member of the Stevedore Regiment, 
assigned along with his company to clean up the corrals in the Remont Depot at the baseport, expressed the desire of most of the men in France. He was found one morning using his pitchfork with one hand. Better get a move on, nigger, a co-laborer cautioned him. I sees the cap'n coming, and he ain't walking slow, neither. I allus use a pitchfork in one hand, explained the other. How come? I learnt real early. Pitchfork in one hand and nothing bottle in the other. About that time, the captain arrived, post-haste, having been tipped off that the commanding general was on his way to inspect the post. Step lively, men, he said. Let's get this place looking like something. The one-handed worker spoke as he hurried by. Cap'n, sir, I ain't well this morning. What's the matter? The officer snapped. I'm kinder droopy. Sick? No, sir, not sick, just droopy. I ain't had no letter from my fiancé for some time, and I don't know if some D.D. draft dodger has tucked my gal away from me or if the fishing to see him reading my mail. In other words, you want to go back to the States? Yes, Cap'n, sir. A ticket one way, boss, kindly. Events, grave at the time, often take on an element of humor when viewed in retrospect. One cannot but smile, for instance, when one reads that at the Battle of Tanga in German East Africa, the enemy cunningly hid wires and canes among the grasses and bushes through which the British were advancing. These, when trodden upon, lifted the lid from hives of wild bees, which poured out and caused terrible distress to the British troops. The great importance of animals was fully recognized by our enemies, and every available animal from the largest to the smallest was used. An elephant from Hagenbeck's zoological gardens in Hamburg was employed in military construction work in Breslau. Even that irresponsible quacker, the duck, was pressed into German service, his cousin, the goose, having long since served as model for Fritzi on the march. It appears that the Americans were ordered to take part of their transport along a certain road. All went well until they reached a certain pond. Then the ducks, which had presumably been sleeping, remonstrated, and the Germans promptly opened fire on the spot from which the quacks proceeded. One teamster, who had been sent up with a load of shells, beat a retreat when the disturbance began. On his return, his officer inquired, Couldn't get through? No. Well, how far did you get? And the soldier replied with more feeling than respect, I got as far as those damn ducks. End of section 6. Section 7 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by April 6090. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Alan Lee's Transport Camels. Goom! 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 This order runs from mouth to mouth down the long camel lines, like the sound of distant guns. And two thousand brown camels stop chewing the cud and heave themselves onto their long but sturdy legs. On the back of each is a pack saddle with wooden crossbars, on which are lashed, one on either side, small metal tanks filled with drinking water. A minute later, and they are striding away across the desert sand, two abreast, each pair led by an Egyptian camel driver in flowing blue. As they pass with the bowing necks and measured step, one can hear the creaking of the saddles and the swift swish of the water inside the tanks. But as long as the long line stretches out over the tawny plain, the sounds slowly die away, and the hot, dry air is silent. Presently the camels may be seen again, strung out in single file along the rim of a wadi, against a sunset sky, and looking like some old Egyptian frieze in motion. Then as they dip down, one by one, into the ancient stony riverbed, they are lost to view, and the night closes in behind them. We have had a glimpse of a fraction of the best organized camel transport the world has ever seen, without which General Allenby himself admits that he could not have hoped either to take Beersheba or to press on through Palestine after its capture. It requires imagination to realize the scale on which that transport was organized. 
one must try to form a picture of it. Let us imagine a dark-skinned man in a long blue robe halting the leaders of a column of loaded pack camels in the center of Boston Common. Behind the leaders, there is another pair, and beyond them still others, stretching along Commonwealth Avenue, as far as we can see. Now let us mount our horses and ride back along the line. We find that it stretches through miles of city streets, out into the suburbs, through Newton, Wellesley, Framingham, and Westboro. And when at night we pull up our tired mounts in front of the city hall in Worcestershire, we see at last the end of the column. We have ridden past forty miles of pack animals, two abreast. Had they been traveling in single file, as they often did, we should have had to ride another forty miles to review the last of the thirty thousand animals in that long procession. The working force which Allenby used in his great attack against the Turks in October 1917. And this was only part of his entire camel transport, for he had fully ten thousand more in reserve, and there were probably another ten thousand in the camel veterinary hospitals and camel remounted depots. It is probably quite safe to say that this was the largest force of camels ever gathered together since the world began, and we may pause a moment here to look into the question of why and how it came into being. In 1914, the Turks threw in their lot with Germany, and as part of their plan they invaded Egypt from the east and captured the frontier town of Il Arish, thereby threatening the Suez Canal. The British decided that their best plan was to accept the challenge and carry the war straight to the enemy by meeting him in the desert of the Sinai Peninsula. It may not be quite true to say that there is no water in that region, but there is very little, and the scanty wells are so far apart and so brackish that no large body of infantry or cavalry could hope to advance through this hot and thirsty land without carrying large quantities of water with them. In looking over the small list of available domestic animals, it will be seen at a glance that the camel is the only one adapted to the work. So 6,000 camels were ordered from India to Egypt, offered by Indian reserve officers. Most of the camel drivers, being Indian peasants, called up their animals at the outbreak of the war. In the meantime, an emergency camel corps was organized in Egypt, officered by Anglo-Egyptian residents and manned by Egyptian fellahin, or peasants, who were hired, each with his own animals, for periods of two or three months. The chief defects in this plan of hiring camels were due to the difficulty in maintaining discipline and the reluctance of the peasants to accompany their animals into the danger zone. These drawbacks were not of vital consequence until early in the following year, when the enemy concentrated a large army in Syria. Then the situation became serious and it was seen that it would be necessary to organize in Egypt a regular camel transport corps with government-owned animals and enlisted men to care for them. From this time on, this Egyptian corps was increased until it numbered between 40 and 50,000 camels. The Indian camels never did well. Soon after their arrival, they began to die in large numbers, the chief cause of death being sand, which they licked up from the desert and which produced sand colic ulceration of the stomach, and possibly other troubles. The animals were muzzled, and for a time this checked the death rate. But the Indian camel drivers who owned the animals were not doing their best. They were anxious to return to their farms in India, and moreover, they were well compensated for the camels they lost. So the Indian corpse was disbanded and their animals turned over to the Egyptian camel corpse. Then, in the process of formation, even then they did not thrive and few, if any, of them survived the war. An English officer with the Egyptian camel corpse in explaining why they were not a success says, The Indian camel from the plains is not suitable for use in a sandy country, nor in a campaign where much rain or cold weather are to be met with. The mobilization of the Egyptian camel corpse was in itself a very big problem. It soon became evident that Egypt could not supply all that were needed. A few western desert Tripoli, camels were purchased, but the hostile attitude of the local tribes made it impossible to get more. British officers also went into the Delta, Algiers, and Somaliland and drained these countries of suitable animals. The buyers sent out did their work in a very systematic way. 
In the case of the Sudan, for instance, the army would inform the high commissioner that a certain number of camels were needed. The order would be passed on to the governor-general of the Sudan, who in turn would notify the governors of the provinces. Each governor would then set his inspectors to work. The sheiks would be notified, and through them every tribe and clan and sub-clan would be told the number of camels it was expected to deliver at a certain rendezvous by a certain date. Here the animals were examined by a veterinary surgeon, and those accepted were paid for at an advance of about 25% above the average price. Food for the animals and for the men who took charge of them was commandeered in the same way. These Sudanese camels brought the highest price of any breed, from 12 to 14 pounds apiece. There were many exciting and sometimes amusing incidents connected with the purchase and collection of these animals. When Colonel Goodchild was buying camels and Tanta, one huge beast which had just been delivered, and which proved to be in must, ran amuck in the marketplace, and cleared it of hundreds of people. He was finally caught by an old Sudanese who put a nail through his nose, and attached a string to the nail. At Santa, a few miles from Tanta, another mad camel ran through the bivouac of a choleric brigadier general, whose only previous experience with camels had been in the zoological gardens. Calling a staff officer, he sent him off with a firing party to shoot the disrespectful unt. They got him next morning, but he required so much killing that the Egyptian camel men named him Aburasis, the father of Lead. Camels bought in Algiers and Somaliland were sent to Egypt by boat, usually tethered in rows along the sides of the upper deck, with heads toward the center of the vessel and with tails to the rail. To protect their bodies from the hard deck when they lay down, they were provided with a bed of sand. When purchased in Egypt, they traveled on foot, or in open cars, or the railroad. According to circumstances, they were mobilized at En El Shims, where the companies were formed. Coming in on the trains, there would be a man to every four or five camels. Each of these men would have his hands full, even if he was used to camels and if the animals behaved themselves. But often the drivers were new at the work, and the man does not live who can tell what a camel will do next when he finds himself in a strange surroundings. One night, 200 camels arrived in Cairo, and becoming panic-stricken at some unusual sight, sound, or smell, stampeded and dashed right into a British camp. Some of them blundered into the standing tents, arousing the sleeping soldiers who thought that the enemy had fallen upon them. Others tripped over ropes and equipment and came tumbling to the ground, growling and grumbling as though blaming it on someone else. Of course, both officers and men resented this intrusion, and with more energy than diplomacy started to throw out their unwelcome visitors. But the camels saw fit to protest this inhospitality, and for a time made themselves very unpleasant. Three officers who had been forced to retreat into a tent were attacked by two camels who stuck their heads inside and made every effort to seize and drag forth the occupants. Finally, the tent was knocked down, and the officers escaped while their assailants were struggling in the folds of the canvas. Major Blake, formerly superintendent of the Cairo Fire Brigade, spent some time in a signal box besieged by angry camels, and many others had to deal with emergencies not provided for in the regulations. As one Egyptian medical man expressed it on meeting a friend next morning, it was white night. The camel transport corpse was made up of about 20 companies of 2,000 animals each. The balance of the serviceable camels were kept in remount depots established at convenient points, whence fresh animals could be issued as needed to make good the wastage from wounds and disease. The personnel of each company at the time of organization consisted of 13 British officers, most of them Arabic-speaking, Anglo-Egyptians, 11 British non-commissioned officers, mostly specially selected cavalry men who spoke Arabic, 45 Egyptian non-commissioned officers, and 1,000 Egyptian camel drivers. In addition, there were about 150 grooms, saddlers, and veterinary dressers, all Egyptians. Toward the close of the war, it became increasingly difficult to get remounts, and before the armistice was signed, the authorities took the extreme step of calling up from Egypt a company of two or three thousand cow camels, which were really needed in the country for breeding purposes. 
while much more docile than the males, these females brought with them their own peculiar problems. Many of them were pregnant and gave birth to their young on the march. On one 15-day trek from Solemn to Cairo, eight baby camels were born. Delightfully absurd and ungainly little creatures they were, and as fearless as they were helpless. Their pyramidal bodies, covered with light-colored silky soft hair, looked like ant hills on stilts, and it is a question whether they won the hearts of the Britishers present by their laughable outlines, or by their utter defenselessness. Probably it was both. At any rate, to see one was to love it, and it is certain that baby camels born in the British army never lacked friends. Naturally, their mothers could not be spared from the ranks, and the newly born were not strong enough, at first, to keep pace with the column. But for all their long legs and stiff appearance, baby camels can be doubled up like jackknives. So they were folded, placed in camel nets, and carried on their mother's backs. They would travel in this way for six or seven hours at a stretch. Then, at appropriate times and places, they were taken out, set on the ground, and allowed to nurse. In this way, they lived until their own limbs became sturdy, and until figuratively at least, they could be taken out of the awkward squad. It will help us to understand the uses to which the animals were put, and the problems of camel transport generally. If we realize what kind of a beast we are dealing with, the popular idea seems to be that a camel is a camel, a humped and hairy creature used in eastern countries to carry loads across the desert. It is generally supposed to be a patient animal and capable of withstanding great hardships. The last supposition probably arising from the fact that it can live in the desert and can exist for a considerable time without water. As a matter of fact, camels, so far from being hardy, are very delicate and have to be looked after like invalids. While they differ so much that it is not wise to make sweeping statements concerning all breeds, it may be said in a general way that they are very sensitive to cold and rain, and it is a fact that thousands of Allenby's camels died of exposure. What seems more strange is that many of them suffer terribly from the extreme heat, and there were many casualties from this cause also. Apparently they have all the diseases of infancy and of old age. If camels were human, I am sure they would be afflicted with every human ailment, from cholera infantum to locomotor ataxia. I have counted up 130 different kinds of things that camels can have the matter with them and it is very rarely that one finds a camel which is not suffering from one or more of these. For this reason, camel campaigns, although often successful from the military point of view, have usually been disastrous from the veterinary standpoint. The losses from sickness alone have always been so great that there has been no possibility of maintaining numerical strength, except by adding new camels. And if these were not available, rapid extinction of the camel transport was doomed to follow. For example, when the Russian army was campaigning in Central Asia, a force under General Kobolev, with a transport of 12,000 camels, returned a few months later with exactly one camel. And in the British Afghan campaign of 1879 to 1880, which resulted in a loss of 70,000 transport animals, a large proportion of these were camels which died faster than they could be replaced. The Royal Army Veterinary Corps, having all these facts in mind, very naturally realized that special organization would be required. Camel hospitals were established for the reception of the seriously sick or wounded, and a large number of veterinarians were specially trained to deal with animals which, although requiring treatment, could with proper care be kept working with their units. This question of camel mange alone called for very serious consideration and a comprehensive scheme for its treatment was carefully worked out. Practically every adult camel in Egypt had this disease, which, if allowed to run its course unchecked, might easily have destroyed the camel transport service in less than six months. Even with all the care possible under war conditions, the loss of British camels was 30% a year throughout the campaign, of between two and three years, a very high mortality but a fine record when compared with the losses sustained in previous similar campaigns. And the veterinarians were not the only ones who had to do a lot of thinking about this vast aggregation. Heavy camel transport on a large scale was practically unknown in Egypt, and no sooner had those in charge of the work begun to put their minds on it 
than they discovered how much there was to learn. The questions of saddles alone presented a great problem. With the exception of a few Egyptian army pack saddles, there were none to be had. The Egyptian type made chiefly of leather was good, but no more were available. Much designing and experimenting had to be done with a view to evolving a kind of saddle, at once sufficiently light, durable, and inexpensive, for practical use in a long campaign, and it had to be adjustable in order that it might fit the animal that wore it, no matter what bodily changes took place on the march. A camel may start out in splendid condition with large hump and well-rounded sides, but in the course of a few weeks of rough campaigning, with hard work, trying weather, little food, and perhaps disease as well, his body will shrink almost beyond belief. Still, the saddle which he started out with must fit him snug. Otherwise, it will move about as he marches, and the friction will cause sores that may soon make it impossible to work him. Then nothing but a long rest in hospital will make him fit for service again. At last, such a saddle, made of wood and canvas, and with girths of native webbing, was devised and adopted. Head halters of webbing were also devised, and blankets and feed cloths designed and manufactured. Thus, one by one, the details of equipment were mastered. And when the camels took up their burdens, they were as well equipped as careful thought and the resources of the country would permit. The care of the animals on the march, under a great variety of trying conditions, presented many other problems. The question of watering was one of these. Camels have been watered for thousands of years. And perhaps the best known fact about these camels is that they can go for long periods without drinking. Yet no one seemed to know the best interval to allow between drinks. Whether they thrive best if watered every day, every other day, or every three or four days. A few experiments, not very exhaustive, were tried in order to learn something about this. One of these experiments was made on 60 debilitated Somali camels. They were divided into three equal groups, one of which was watered once a day, one every other day, and one every third day. In this particular instance, the group watered every third day picked up the quickest. But such a variety of camels were used, and they worked under such widely differing conditions that it was inadvisable to make a fixed rule as to the frequency with which they were to be watered. Indeed, had such a rule been made, it would have been impossible, in many cases, to live up to it. So the matter was left to the good judgment of the officers on the ground, who, knowing all the circumstances, did their best in each case. Whenever it is practicable, army camels are watered at troughs, because if taken to lakes or rivers, they get their feet wet, and this results sooner or later in foot trouble. All through the campaign watering areas were established at suitable places, where the animals could be watered hundreds at a time. When such areas were to be used for a considerable period, more or less permanent arrangements were made. For example, at intervals along the valley of the Wadi Gaza, over 3,000 running feet of masonry and wooden troughs were provided for watering camels and horses. Thirsty camels will drink from 15 to 25 gallons each, and they usually do this in two bouts. When water was scarce, the animals were led away after they had had their first long draught. When it was plentiful, they were allowed to have their fill. As a rule, no camels were taken from the troughs until all had finished. As some animals drink more slowly than others, and very often, these will leave when their companions do, whether they themselves have had enough water or not. The camels began to make themselves indispensable from the moment the British troops entered the Sinai Desert on their way to El Arish. As the army marched, it covered the railway construction parties, always in the van and working with almost incredible speed. The water for these forces had to be brought from Kantara, and this is how it was done. At the north end of the Suez Canal, and on its west bank, runs a branch of the Sweetwater Canal, which carries the water of the Nile, to Port Said. On the bank the British had established in 1916 a great filtering plant with a capacity of 600,000 gallons a day. This water was carried through siphons into masonry reservoirs on the east bank. Eventually, it was pumped through pipes into El Arish, but before the pipes were laid, other methods were adopted to supply the troops. At a special siding at Kantara, trains of water trucks were filled. 
twenty trucks at a time, and thence started for the railhead, which was being advanced as fast as the engineers and construction parties could carry it. At the railheads, the tank cars were emptied into great canvas cisterns, and from these were filled the little metal tanks called fantasies or fanatis, each of which held twelve and a half gallons of water. Two of these, with the pack saddle to which they were lashed, made a regulation load for a camel. And, as we have seen, thousands of camels took up their burden. Later, as the troops advanced into country where local water supplies could be developed, large reservoirs were established, and from these the camels distributed the water to all the units within reach. At Chalel, for example, there was organized a fantast filling area in which 2,000 fantasses could be filled and loaded on camels every hour. When General Allenby took command of the British forces in the Near East, the Turks occupied a line extending from Gaza, on the sea, to Beersheba, 30 miles to the southeast. The troops facing the enemy were from 15 to 21 miles in advance of the railheads, and not only water, but food, clothing, ammunition, and everything else that is needed by an army in the field had to be carried forward over the intervening country. The latter was frequently intersected by wadis, the dry beds of streams, and the steep sides of these often made wheeled traffic an impossibility. It was clearly a problem for pack animals, and under the then existing conditions, that meant camels. When operations began in October, the beasts were in splendid condition. For months their work had been light. Their humps were large and firm, with their sides well rounded. There were 20,000 allotted to the 20th Army Corps, 6,000 to the 21st Army Corps, and 6,000 to the Desert Mounted Corps for convoy duty. From now on, the work was heavy, but for a time the conditions were favorable and the wastage low. In the Beersheba area, vast numbers were on convoy duty, marching out daily from the rail heads to keep in touch with the advance. It was while the troops were in Beersheba that there occurred the following amusing and significant incident. Someone in the intelligence branch of the staff conceived the brilliant idea of trying to impress the local Arabs some of whom were hostile to us, with the majesty and power of the British Empire. Accordingly, after a good deal of trouble, a few of the neighboring sheiks were induced to come into the town, and were escorted round by an officer who spoke Arabic. They were shown first a regiment of cavalry, which left them cold, as the horses appeared clumsy to them in comparison with their own little Arabs. Then lines of marching infantry were pointed out to them and field guns, and more cavalry, and motor lorries, all to no purpose. An occasional grunt and a half-concealed yawn were all the response the perspiring officer received, when a sixty-pounder gun drawn by a caterpillar motor tractor hove in sight. They showed some signs of uneasiness, and eyed this new form of devil carriage with profound distrust. But when they found that it could only move at a walking pace, they became reassured, and lost all interest in it. The hard-working staff officer was in despair, when, towards evening, the first ration convoy of camels arrived. We had at that time about 30,000 camels in the force, and they were in magnificent condition. Big, strong beasts, covered with muscle, and free from the blemishes which so disfigure the desert Arab's animals. Here was something the sheiks could understand. They watched the camels winding into the town line after line, hundred after hundred, and their eyes grew round with wonder. The first eager talk died away to an astonished silence, when all the convoy, about one thousand strong, was in, and barracked in an open space. The natives turned to the officer with a volley of questions. Seeing the impression made, he told them, in an offhand manner, that the British had more than twenty times that number with their army. The sheik's looks politely conveyed the message that they considered him a liar. Determined to strike while the iron was hot, he bundled them all into a couple of motor cars, after some signs of panic on their part, and ran them across to Shalal, where in truth they saw more camels than they had ever dreamed of. They spent all afternoon visiting the camps of Camel Transport Corps, and watching the departure of laden convoys and the return of empty ones. In the evening they mounted their horses again, and rode off in the darkness to rejoin their own people. But before they left, the chief among them, acting as spokesman for all, 
told our staff officer that they were now quite convinced that the Injizlizi were certainly the greatest tribe in the world, and that they would advise their young men to keep on friendly terms with us and help us in every way. They were as good as their word, and we had no more trouble from hostile Arabs. Footnote. The Desert Mounted Corpse. End of footnote. In October, the tracks were good, the weather mild and open, and the animals were as happy as it is possible for pack camels to be. But early in December, severe weather set in, and the real trials of the animals began. The camels with the 20th corpse had to endure especially distressing conditions. The troops were then operating in the hills, and as the roads up the valley were reserved for other forms of transport, the poor oonts were forced to take the narrow trails over stony hillsides where they cut their feet at almost every stride. Very often there were no definite track at all. Then the rains descended, cold rains, and that chilled man and beast to the morrow, and made the mountain trails as slippery as ice. A camel's feet are admirably adapted for walking on sand, spreading out like pneumatic cushions and absorbing the shock at every stride. But there is nothing with which to grip a greasy surface, and on wet, sloping ground, the poor beast slipped and floundered, sometimes falling, sometimes straining tendons or spraining limbs, and sometimes literally splitting themselves as their long, helpless limbs spread out beneath them. Many fell, never to rise again. Others, heavily laden as they were, lost their balance and pitched down deep places to their death, and the others got no rest camped at 3,000 feet on wind-swept hillsides in the cold and driven rain. There was scant comfort in even the best of camel blankets, and as if their plight was not bad enough, the supply of forage ran low and all animals were put on half rations. For weeks at a time they got five pounds of grain a day instead of ten, and the allowance of taboo was also cut in two. Not infrequently they had less than half rations and there were days when they got nothing whatever. But, overloaded and underfed, they worked and grumbled and died, and their burdens were divided among their brethren who were still able to carry on. The convoys working with the desert-mounted corpse in the central area were scarcely better off. They carried their loads from the railhead at Deir Sinid, Esdu, and Sekiria to Ramlai. The country to be traversed was tilled land, with no permanent roads and the heavy rains converted practically the entire area into a quagmire, intersected by broad whiteys. The latter were very difficult to negotiate, especially when the sides were slippery after rain, and many animals were rendered unserviceable, owing to falls, sprains, and dislocations. Crossing the plowed land, the mud encountered in some places was so deep that the camels sank to their girths and had to be abandoned. And, of course, added to all these difficulties, and many more, was the fire of a stubborn enemy. Even a single camel is a big target, and a large convoy is a very big one. In the main, camels behaved very well under fire, and the following incident is typical. In the operations around Jerusalem in December 1917, the enemy fire was very destructive. One night at Kabiba, a Turkish shell caught a group of 50 transport camels and killed or wounded half of them. An officer approaching the spot soon after saw torches moving about and found starving Muslims cutting up the dead animals and carrying off the flesh in baskets. The wounded camels seemed to be taking the matter very philosophically. None of them appeared to be nervous as a result of the shell explosion, and most of them were calmly chewing the cud within sight of the fallen brethren who were being carved up by perfect strangers. As might be expected, the casualties from all causes were very heavy. During the three months, October, November, and December 1917, the British lost 3,033 camels, of which 2,090 died of exposure, 601 were killed, 310 wounded, 29 missing, and 3 captured by the enemy. Most of these casualties occurred in the areas above mentioned. The animals operating with the 21st Corps in the sandy area along the coast worked under much easier conditions, and it is here we may turn aside to get a glimpse of normal life in a camel camp. When in the early morning the animals came in, hot and tired from the night's march, they were picketed in 
lines, usually fifty in a row, and about six feet apart. Their head ropes, which were long enough to permit them to move in comfort, were made fast to a heavier rope laid on the ground and extending the length of the lines. They were not fed until they were somewhat rested, and the saddles were not removed until their bodies had cooled lest the tightly adhering skin should come off also, causing the sorest kind of sores back. Then each driver would cry to his camels, Vicar, sit down. If the order was not obeyed promptly, it would be repeated sharply with some additions to make it emphatic. Vicar, Inzel, Yaibu Kelb, sit down, you son of a dog. And it was the stupid camel indeed that did not take the hint. Army camels were fed twice a day when circumstances permitted. The usual ration for heavy burden animals was ten pounds of grain, millet, beans, crushed peas, maize or barley, and twelve pounds of taboo, chopped straw or hay. Light burden camels got eight pounds of grain and ten pounds of taboo. One half the ration was given in the morning, the other half in the evening. When salt was available, about half an ounce was given with each meal. When in a more or less permanent camp, the food was served in wooden or masonry troughs. At a large camel camp I saw in the desert near Kantara, there were long concrete feeding troughs slightly raised above the sand. Into the concrete had been molded, at intervals of six feet, circular feeding basins, one for each camel. During operations, especially in sandy country, a camel's rations were given on a feed cloth, laid in a hollow, scooped in the sand. From this bowl-like area, the food could be taken easily and without waste, and thanks to the cloth, without danger of taking sand into the stomach. This danger is a terribly real one, and the Turks lost thousands of animals because they paid no attention to it. Though not always possible, it was considered wise to watch camels carefully at feeding time, to see if they were taking their food properly, and later to be sure that they were chewing the cud. Irregularity in these particulars, especially the latter, are danger signals, and matters for veterinary attention. Some camels bolt their food, and these, unless prevented, are very apt to rob their more leisurely neighbors. When circumstances permitted, regular rations were supplemented by grazing. Camels are about as fastidious as goats, and will eat the most unpromising green stuff, including prickly and thorny things that a hungry donkey would shake his ears at. Camel thorn gets its name from the fact that camels are fond of it. But where an advance is being made into unknown country, it is considered advisable first to examine the ground especially the nullahs and damp places, in case there are poisonous plants with which the animals are not familiar. Familiar ones are not likely to be eaten, except by accident, though such accidents occasionally happen. A small quantity of oleander, for example, taken in with a mouthful of grass, will kill a camel very quickly, and still more sudden is the effect of datura, which grows chiefly in the beds of dry water courses. Grazing camels are often bitten by venomous snakes, and although their great size makes them better able than most domestic animals to withstand the poison, they often succumb to it. Their greatest advantage, perhaps, lies in the fact that after being bitten, they are apt to bellow loudly and continuously until coma sets in, so that if they are under observation by someone who knows enough to guess what the bellowing means, they may be given attention in time to save their lives. After the morning meal, the next work on the regular schedule was grooming, which was done first with a scraper made from the iron bands from the bales of taboo, then with a brush made from a rope of twisted palm leaf fiber. Grooming lasts about half an hour and included to search for ticks, which were often found in the ears, between the toes, and on other sheltered parts of the skin. Grooming was one of the few things the camels seemed to enjoy. Bathing was another and when camping near the sea, they were bathed twice a week. They swim quite well, especially with a man to guide them, but they need a considerable depth of water on account of their long legs. In addition to the regular routine of feeding and grooming, there were often an enormous amount of work to be done on animals suffering from one or more of the many ills that camel flesh is heir to. Probably the most serious of these among animals 
actually kept at work was mange. Practically all the camels had it, and the labor involving in scraping the affected parts and in applying mange dressing to the bodies of tens of thousands of camels once a week can hardly be imagined. It can easily be seen that life in a camel transport camp was a busy one under any circumstances, and owing to the peculiar mental makeup of the unt, there were nearly always a few extra numbers not printed on the bill. As Kipling informs us, commissare unts have a remarkable aptitude for getting into trouble. They lose their heads over nothing, and at the most inopportune moments, a camel which will lie down and chew the cud close to the firing line, and with oriental, even fatalistic indifference, view the slaughter of its companions. By shell, fire, will take alarm at some slight sound, and, after breaking its picket rope, dash through a sleeping camp, doing as much damage as a cyclone, and waking a hundred men out of their hard-earned sleep. And when trouble does not come to them in the natural way, they go out and look for it. Most camels, at least male camels, and it is usually male camels that are used in the army, are of uncertain temper, or if the temper of any of them is certain, it is certain to be bad. They are practically never affectionate, but it is only fair to say that the treatment they have received from their eastern masters through hundreds of generations has not been of the kind which generates affection. They usually tolerate the man who feeds them and looks after them, but only a fool takes liberties with a strange camel, and he is apt to wonder why he's so frequent deceased in the breeding season, commonly called the simying or fasting season, which usually extends from December to March. Male camels are especially dangerous. During this period, the animals eat and drink little, sometimes nothing for days at a time. It is then they go magnoon or mad, and a mad camel is a desperately dangerous brute. He manifests his madness by rushing about in an arrogant way, throwing out of his mouth a large inflated pink or piebald bladder, which is an extension of the soft palate. As he goes, he makes a strange bubbling sound. Even when in this state of mind, however, he will not, as a rule, attack the man in charge of him. But woe to anyone else who is so unfortunate as to cross his path. He will rush upon him, seize him by an arm or leg, and then gallop off, swinging his victim in the air as a big dog might swing a rag doll. Not infrequently, he will actually bite off an arm or a leg. An English officer connected with the camel transport told me that on one occasion he saw a camel attack a man, and that after the animal had been beaten off and the victim picked up, a boot with a leg inside lay on the sand. Another officer told me that he saw a camel seize a man by the forearm and break both bones, leaving the limb hanging by a shred. Even if the animal simply bites into the flesh and help is close at hand, there is great danger of blood poisoning. Unlike most ruminants, the camel has a very dirty mouth, and the long dog-like fangs with which it is equipped carry the poison deep into the tissue. Of course, mad camels are muzzled as quickly as possible, but they have to be securely anchored as well, usually with three or four stout ropes. Otherwise, they will chase a man, knock him down and kneel on him, or lie down on him, crushing out his life. Almost every officer who was in charge of camels has stories to tell of adventures with these animals, in must. One told me of a bull camel which broke loose at Tamala Wells, near El Arish, and worked terrible havoc among the camel men. The brute bit off the calf of the leg of one Egyptian and killed another. Serious as many of these adventures were, some had a humorous side. One frightfully hot moonlight night, a camel went mad in a British camp in Palestine and started in pursuit of a driver, a very stout and impressive British officer, who was passing, saw the man's predicament and attempted to help him. The camel, perhaps failing to distinguish his rank in the moonlight, 
turned with open mouth and charged the officer who started to retreat in a dignified manner in spite of his dignity however he was an observant man and there was something about that camel which suggested that this was no time to run a waiting race so shedding his clothing and his dignity as he ran he sprinted and dodged for his life at last he reached a dry river bed the sides of which he was much too exhausted to climb there the infuriated camel would have had him at its mercy had not a sergeant major who had come to the rescue attracted the animal's attention to himself this he did with a light prod with a bayonet followed by a business-like thrust as the camel swung round upon him a bullet followed the bayonet thrust but still the camel came on things might have gone badly with the sergeant had not an officer come up with several native drivers who roped the animal and destroyed it naturally much attention has been given to measures intended to minimize the danger from must camels castration is effective but has many disadvantages if the animal is gelded when young he never attains the strength and carrying capacity which a full-grown male camel should have if the operation is performed after the sixth year when the animal is adult and in the prime of life there is always serious danger of loss sometimes a compromise is made by sawing off the tips of the tusks which are the teeth that inflict the most serious damage they are then rounded off with a tooth rasp and are thus rendered less dangerous but hard work is found to be one of the best treatments for a camel in must if he is given not only his regular work but all the little extra jobs that he can be made to do he will have less time for introspection and will actually lose less weight than if left alone to infuriate himself with his own feelings nor is it necessary that a camel shall be mad in order to make itself interesting any loose camel offers great if unappreciated possibilities near el arish an officer riding to water saw a camel wandering about with his head rope hanging he decided to catch it the animal he bestrode was an unbroken new zealand mare away went the camel at a sprawling gallop but the officer managed to keep neck and neck and tried to lasso his quarry with the horse's head rope now it happened that this particular camel was blind in one eye and at the touch of the rope it swung its head round violently striking the officer a tremendous blow throwing him onto the horse's rump though almost stunned he managed to get back into the saddle and with great pluck continued the chase until he succeeded in driving the fugitive into an enclosure surrounded by a wire fence here he dismounted whereupon the camel charged him head down bowled him over like a ninepin plunged through the wire fence pulling it up posts and all and set off in the direction of el arish village with his pursuer following a rather poor second at el arish an egyptian informed the officer that he knew an expert camel catcher and running off he presently returned with a gorgeously robed bedouin whose bright clothing was bedecked with rings and coins this impressive person indicated by signs that he would require the use of the mare and its owner dismounted after adjusting the stirrups with great nicety he mounted but the mare refused to move the arab gave her a cut with his rawhide whip and then she moved upwards sending her rider a long way in advance when he came down the mare was not present she was off to join the camel somewhere beyond the horizon the officer was something more than disappointed and proceeded to boot the arab so vigorously that the latter ran away leaving his whip as a souvenir the horse was captured in a coconut grove a mile away the camel was never seen again then many of the oonts have little peculiarities most disconcerting to a peace-loving groom who happens to be unfamiliar with them some are terrible kickers and occasionally one of them even when muzzled and securely tied will bring a hind foot round in a semicircular sweep that carries the kiki a considerable distance from the scene of action in the grooming of a vicious camel this danger is often minimized by having an assistant hold the tail up over the back in this position the camel if it can kick at all cannot do so effectively the bad disposition of camels caused many casualties especially during the early part of the war it was difficult to get a sufficient number of egyptians of the right kind 
small farmers who had been used to camels all their lives would volunteer readily enough for army work during the summer and winter but they were always anxious to be back on their farms for the autumn sowing and the spring harvesting many of them simply ran away disappeared when this homesick feeling came upon them and their places had to be filled with laborers and tradesmen who needed much training before they learned how to feed and groom camels properly it was during this period of training that most of the casualties occurred but even muzzled animals had to be fed and watered buzz saws and stamping machines are safety devices compared with a camel that has gone magnoon nor was it only men who suffered very often mad camels would attack other camels biting them perhaps in the throat or the foreleg an animal bitten in this way was usually a subject for the hospital and unless the wounds received prompt and skillful attention blood poisoning would set in necessitating the destruction of the creature the camel's attitude toward life is no happier than his disposition toward mankind and his own kind he is a grumbler his every note is a grumble or a growl i don't care what you ask a camel to do his answer is always the same no dowdnutter and a gunter always given in a tone which implies and there is much truth in the implication that he is the worst abused animal on the face of the earth as usual kipling knew what he was talking about when he said the commissary camel when all is said and done is a devil and an ostrich and an orphan child in one when the order came to saddle up each animal was led out to its load with rope and halter it was then made to lie down barrack the saddle was lifted on the load adjusted and lashed at the order goom often accompanied by a kick the animal rose to its feet and was led to its place in the column camel transport units were classified as heavy burden or light burden as might be supposed the former were composed of large powerful camels and the latter of the smaller less powerful ones female camels were classed as light burden the regulation load for a heavy burden camel was 350 pounds including a 50 pound paddle sack light burden animals were supposed to carry 200 pounds all told during operations these weights were often doubled even then the loads would not have been excessive but for arduous trails bad weather long marches and scanty food the usual pace maintained was about two and a half miles an hour over tracks of hard sand this could sometimes be increased to three miles but except in emergencies great care was taken not to hurry loaded animals beyond the pace which it is known they could hold day in and day out some camels were naturally faster walkers than others where possible camels were graded fast and slow and used in separate trains on the march a space for four meters was allowed for each pair and any slow animals the train might contain were put in front to set the pace it was then comparatively easy to keep the regulation spacing had the faster ones been given the lead the slow ones would either have fallen behind or been urged beyond their powers of endurance in order to make them hold their places in the column during the actual fighting the camel transport traveled at night when possible the animals were thus protected from the heat of the sun and hidden from the eye of the enemy Darkness also greatly reduced the danger of infection with trypanosomiasis, which resulted in sura and sleeping sickness. The disease carrier is a species of tabanus, or horsefly, which, in Palestine at least, is not usually active after dusk. A small percentage of the camels seem to be blind at night, and some of these refuse to move. Others would unexpectedly barrack in some inconvenient place, such as a railroad track from which they would have to be moved bodily a normal march was from 12 to 16 miles but during operations there was no rule then the animals like the men did what had to be done and like the men lived through it if they could as often happened they couldn't they went west with little fuss in february and march 1918 the camel transport was reorganized and the size of the companies reduced from 2000 to 1200 animals each it was felt that the original size was too large for efficient control and that as only 1200 camels were required for first line transport of infantry divisions that number formed a complete unit this reduction also tended to make the organization uniform throughout 
and facilitated the interchange of first-line transport and convoy companies. By this time, Allenby had shown the enemy what a resolute, resourceful leader he was. With almost incredible swiftness, his gallant troops, suffering from thirst and dust, from heat and cold and overwork, often harassed by murderous enemy fire, had swept like a desert wind into Judea, had captured and occupied Jerusalem and Jericho, had advanced into Mount Ephraim and Sharon, and now, toward the end of March, part of them were pressing forward for a raid on Ammon. The weather was still very bad, the tracks in awful condition, and the ground over which the camels had to work could not have been worse. The Anzac convoys marched in single file up goat tracks in the hills over stones that cut and bruised their feet, and down steep and slippery inclines, which meant injury and death to many. The 2nd Australian Light Horse Brigade, advancing up the Wadi Kefrin, under great difficulties, reached Rejimelo Shear to find the tracks beyond simply impassable for anything on wheels. So all wheel transport was withdrawn to Shune Nimrin, where the ammunition was transferred to camels. The poor beasts, seriously overladen, made heart-rending efforts to carry their burdens over trails that would have made difficult going even for donkeys. Very often they could not keep their footing on the steep and greasy goat tracks, and had to be dragged, pushed, and even lifted bodily. There were many that never got through. They heaved and staggered and strained for hour after hour, only to die at last beneath their saddles nor were they the first camels to die thereabouts. The Turkish transports had been before them, and Turkish officers estimate that they lost 40,000 camels in the Jordan Valley alone. Certain it is that the entire route might have been paved with the bleaching skeletons of the camels that perished. And since camels were so important a factor in the transport, the enemy made special efforts to destroy them. On March 28th, a fleet of 13 enemy airplanes swooped down and bombed the camel base at Shunei Nimrin, killing and wounding many of the animals. At Ain Seer village, there were three broad, rough terraces to be crossed. Time was limited, and the going was so bad that the officers in charge of convoys had to use great care and the best of judgment in order to accomplish their marches without bringing complete disaster upon the animals. Number 3 Convoy Working from Ain Sir forward with the 20th Army Corps Encountered very difficult going, which included stretches of marshy ground. Owing to the fluctuations of battle and to the fact that the work was done at night, the animals were under their loads continuously for long stretches. During the withdrawal from Ammon on March 31st and April 1st, this convoy marched for 22 consecutive hours. The worst part of the journey through thick and slippery mud, had to be made in complete darkness and in heavy rain. Most of the animals were overloaded, and moreover they were greatly harassed, and their formation broken by other army units retiring on the same single track. Of the 2,000 camels doing convoy duty with the 20th Army Corps in this raid, 100 were killed in action, and another 100 had to be destroyed on account of injuries received on the march. Throughout the fighting, wherever wounded men fell in country inaccessible to ambulances, they were carried to the rear, sometimes miles away, on the backs of camels. Those who were able to sit up sat in specially designed chairs, one on either side. Those more seriously wounded reclined in cacolets, large cradle-like contrivances in which a man could stretch at full length, protected from the sun by an awning of canvas. Whenever I think of a badly wounded man making a long trip in even the most comfortable of these cacolets, there comes to my mind a passage from Amelia B. Edwards, 1,000 miles up the Nile. The camel has four gates, each designed to inflict grievous bodily harm upon his rider. A short walk which is like the rolling of a small boat in a choppy sea, a long walk which dislocates every bone in your body, a trot that reduces you to imbecility and a gallop that is sudden death. It is a punishment that one would not willingly inflict on any human being, not even a reviewer. If a well person can thus express herself, even in fun, what must be the feelings of the wounded? Yet all distress is comparative, and rescue by this means is surely a blessed thing compared with being left to die slowly in the blistering sun of the desert, or in the icy rains of the mountains of Palestine. Thus, Allenby's pack camels carried on, 
under widely varying conditions until the close of the war. All of them suffered, many to the very limit, and more than 30,000 of them died. They were not lovely in disposition, nor were they especially intelligent. They were not graceful, standing or in motion, and few men had time to note how quaint and picturesque they were. But they stood the gaff and did their work, work that no other animal on earth could have done. They played their part and gave all they had to give. They made possible the winning of a great campaign. End of section 7《Section 8 of Animal Heroes》by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by April 6090. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. The Fast Riding Camels. In addition to Alan By's transport camels, many fast riding camels accompanied the Egyptian expeditionary forces. The Bikineer Camel Corps, the Arab Camel Corps, the Egyptian Camel Corps, and the Imperial Camel Corps were composed of fast riding camels which carried the soldier riders to the scene of action, there to dismount and fight as infantry. What has been said earlier regarding the unsuitability of the Indian camel for work in the desert does not apply in the case of the Bikineer Camel Corps, a splendid native Indian regimen whose mounts, huge, raw-boned animals from a wind-swept, sandy country, could travel faster and carry heavier burdens than any other camels and stand conditions as well as any in the army. Experience proved that the weight of the greatest loads which they could carry on the long and swift marches they were called upon to make was 385 pounds, which included the riders. Often, however, their loads were unexpectedly increased. For, as one writer says, whenever a situation arose, such as the unlooked for arrival of the mail, or a sudden accident to someone's servant, the usual formula would be, Oh, stuff them on the Bikineer camels. The saddles used by these corps, unlike those used by the Egyptians and the Sudanese, were double seated, though normally one man only was carried, since with two in the saddle nothing could be taken excepting water, ammunition, and haversacks. In an emergency, when it was desirable to double the fighting strength of a unit, two men were carried. The greatest distance covered by these corps on one day's march of thirteen and one-half hours was fifty-four miles. This was done over sand and under weight of complete equipment. When speed was essential and the animals, as it were, stripped for action, fifteen miles an hour was about the limit which could be accomplished. The fast-riding camels were in constant action during the campaign in the Sinai Peninsula in 1916, later in the Palestine after General Allenby had taken command of the forces. When the Desert Column was reorganized as the Desert Mounted Corps, the Imperial Camel Corps, consisting of two Australian and one British battalion, under the command of Brigadier General Smith, formed a part of it and assisted in the attack on Beersheba. The advance into Philistia and the Ammon and El Salt raids. In the Ammon raid, terrible rain with unusual cold was encountered in a mountainous country, making impossible conditions for the unfortunate animals, who, like their brethren of the transport, slipped and slid and fell down the rocky passes. Meanwhile, writes Colonel Preston of this unsuccessful attempt, the second ALH brigade, followed by the Camel Corps, had been floundering up the Wadi Kefrin and reached Rum El Oshir about 3.30 p.m. Here the track, such as it was, petered out altogether. All wheeled transport had to be sent back, the ammunition being transferred to camels. It was 9.30 at night when the march could be renewed. Heavy rains had fallen for several days, and the tracks were deep in mud. Rain came on again that night and continued three days with bitter cold. Under this downpour, the tracks marked on the map revealed themselves for what they really were, the beds of mountain, torrents. Each of them was transformed into a rushing torrent, carrying mud and rocks in its course. Bad as they were, they formed the only possible line of advance, pulling their shivering and exhausted animals up at the track. The camel corps stumbled on in, in the rain and darkness all night. At 4.30 the next morning, the head of the column reached Ain el 
having taken just twenty-four hours to cover the sixteen miles up the Jordan. It was not until seven-thirty in the evening the last of the camel corps got in, having walked the whole way, pulling their exhausted animals after them. After the second Trans-Jordan raid in the late summer, the Imperial Camel Corps returned to Beersheba. It had covered a distance of 930 miles, and by its trials and suffering had proved convincingly that camels could not be successfully employed in a mountainous country, with which conclusion the camels themselves would have been in undoubted agreement. Following the capture of Ammon came the dashing and brilliant campaign, which ended in the destruction of the Turkish Fourth Army and the fall of Damascus on the 30th of September. Here the Sheriffian troops and the Arab Camel Corps, under Lieutenant Colonel T. E. Lawrence, the beloved Lawrence, were in constant action. It was owing to the destructive maneuvers of this corps that the Turks were hopelessly delayed in their attempt to reach Damascus before their retreat was cut off. Lawrence possessed an extraordinary knowledge and understanding of the Arab mind. He was believed by them to be a prophet sent by Mohammed to deliver them from Turkish domination, and he could do what no other leader could do with these fierce and undisciplined riders of the desert. Arabs of the Hedji force, says one rider, have been entreated to be allowed to throw themselves before Lawrence's horse in the manner of the juggernaut victims. One of the activities in which this corps under Lawrence's leadership excelled was the interrupting of railroad communication. We read of them tearing across the desert to charge the train, robes and headdresses flying, without regular formation, without any distinction between officers and privates, all yelling, and with a most indiscriminate firing of musketry into the air. The presence of these wild riders on their camels or horses, in any situation or engagement, seems to remove it from modern warfare, and to place it in days old as life on the desert. Once, during a German air raid, they barrack their camels, dismount and sit, each man by his beast until the storm has passed. But the enemy had only withdrawn for more bombs, and during their absence, the camel corpse slipped into a wadi, there to sit immovable as the black lava stones, and so conceal their presence from the searching plains. It is a story of the Arabian Nights over again, and, as in that ancient story, the black stones come to life and worry the enemy. They remain among the lava for several days and nights, coming forth after it is dark to catch and kill a passing train, and once by day to destroy a bridge and blow up a great length of rails. They harry, they retard, they berate the Turkish forces, and are the second detachment to enter Damascus, the great city of the Arabs. Once more in their hands, after four centuries of enemy domination, on the wall of rock which skirts the Dog River, not far from Beirut, are the inscriptions of the four empires, Egypt, Assyria, Greece, and Rome, the earliest and the greatest of the oppressors of Israel. And above these age-worn characters are carved in the limestone rock the simple words which celebrate the latest victory of an army in this land, so often conquered and so long oppressed. The British Desert Mounted Corps aided by the Arab forces of King Hussein, captured Damascus, Holmes, Aleppo, October 1918. Many of those who read this in years to come, many will bring to mind the fame of that great general whose genius conceived and organized this triumphant effort. Many will think of the gallant men, the unknown soldiers of a mighty empire, who fought, suffered, and died in the cruel desert, drought, and heat, the bitter mountain cold, how many will give a thought to the thousands of dumb creatures who likewise fought, suffered, and died? The high-strung, sensitive horses, the dogged, persistent mules and donkeys, the toiling, struggling, complaining, indispensable camels, without whose aid those words could never have been inscribed upon that ancient rock? End of section 8. Section 9 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jessica Taylor. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Mules. 
Practically all persons who worked with the army mule as a draft or a pack animal have a good word to say for him. If they worked long with him, they remark on his freedom from disease, his steadiness under fire, his willingness to work for long hours under the most trying conditions of weather and footing. Even his failings and vices they find reason for and justly forgive. A really vicious mule is one that has been badly treated. He loathes the flicking of the whip and will swiftly brand with a skillful off-hind anyone that is so ill-bred as to flick one in his presence. Quite a sermon might be preached on the subtleties of a certain epitaph, which reads somewhat as follows. Say some prayers for Michael O'Toole. He borrowed a feather to tickle a mule. Any mule psychologist would tell you, without a moment's hesitation, that a mule, even one with his back turned towards you, can not only perceive your slightest action and forestall it, he can even read your thoughts and intentions and forestall them also. Hence the untimely fate of Michael O'Toole. As to whether you get along nicely with a mule or not is largely a matter of mutual confidence. Please observe that I said mutual confidence. It is a fine thing, a noble thing, perhaps, to have complete confidence in a mule who has none in you. If you have it, encourage it in every possible way. But take the advice of a well-wisher, and don't get within a leg's length of the mule, unless by proxy, until he shows unmistakable signs of reciprocity. Then go in your football togs. I have reason for telling you all this, because during the war I had a friend, a British officer in France, who almost fell in love with the mule. His trust in the animal was simple and complete. Then, one day, he was sent home to England to recover from a severe wound in the head. My friend said that the mule had kicked him, mistaking him for another man. But within the next fortnight, the mule made three similar mistakes. And as in each case, the wound was bad enough to necessitate the patient's going home. The mule was given the name of Blighty, which he carried to the end of the war. As I said, however, if you once establish mutual confidence, all will be well. You may even remove your friend's hind shoes, and that is saying a great deal, for mules are conservative and very suspicious. Walk down a line of them, not too close, and observe their distrustful eyes and their expressive, unfriendly ears. Note, too, that several of them keep their hind legs just where they can get at them handily. Now, if you are wise, you will move a little farther back, and if you have a whip about you, lose it at once. Verily, no man can tell how far a healthy mule can kick. But mutual confidence can be established between men and mules, and it was so established thousands and thousands of times during the war, especially in Italy and France. As the English developed the great horse masters of the world, so the Italians developed the best mule drivers. The almost superstitious confidence which the Italian had in his mule has few, if any, parallels in history. Nor was this confidence restricted to the enlisted men. The officers shared it. The mule won the war for Italy, remarked one Italian officer to me. Had Italy been deprived of her mules, said another, the war was over for Italy. The mule is a hybrid, being the offspring of a male ass and a mare. He inherits the large head and ears and the small hoof of his sire, and the bodily shape and size of his dam. The mule is usually sterile. Having been evolved through the inventive ingenuity of man, he retaliates, as it were, by making it as difficult as possible for man to comprehend him. The Negro has a natural aptitude in this direction. The man in direct charge of the animal must learn to understand its personal and racial characteristics. But more important still is it that the men higher up shall have a clear knowledge of the capabilities and the limitations of mules in general. And here let me say that the failure of the army mules on certain fronts was due not to his unwillingness or stupidity, but to the attempts to force him to do work for which he is physically incapable. No one would enter a mule into a race against thoroughbreds, and yet he has frequently been required to serve in the artillery or cavalry transport where the competition gave him little better chance of success. 
It may be that the orders given in these cases were the best that could be given, all the circumstances being considered. But the fact remains that though a mule is said to be capable of walking a mile an hour faster than a horse, he cannot be galloped, nor should he be placed in direct competition with the horse. If pushed along faster than their natural gait, mules soon lose condition and become almost useless. The Mosaic Injunction Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together, might with advantage have been observed in spirit in the case of the mule and horse. Far be it for me, in my ignorance of military matters, to criticize any orders relating to the mule. What I have said is merely intended as a possible explanation and justification of the few failures in view of his overwhelming successes. Perhaps the mule's most spectacular triumph was achieved on the Italian front. The character of the country in which much of the Italian fighting was done accounts in part for his popularity and prestige. A superb pack animal, he was at his best on those steep, zigzag trails, leading to the Italian stores or gun positions. Heavily laden, but not pushed beyond his natural speed, he displayed all the sure-footed caution for which his breed is famous. His conduct during those years of terrific fighting in the Alps forms one of the most interesting narratives of the war. From the magnificent specimens of Poitou and the splendid imports from the United States to the mules from Spain and the thin, ill-tempered animals from Sicily, they one and all endeared themselves to the soldiers, who well knew to what a degree they were dependent upon their beasts. There was not a single division in the Italian army that could get on without the mules. Even the cavalry were obliged to employ them in their lines. And a soldier exercised as much care in choosing a mule as he would have done in the case of a wife. At first it seemed doubtful to the Italians as to whether the mule would accommodate himself to a soldier's life. But they were quickly undeceived, for the mule proved to be intelligent, patient, and easily satisfied, requiring only a good leader and a good mate. Some mules, it is true, are a little difficult to satisfy. Generally speaking, the will of the driver must be stronger than that of the animal. Above all, he must be just. Moreover, he must know his proper place and keep it. To do so is the test of the highest skill. The mule, for his part, needs to be governed and guided, and very quickly learns to know his driver to whom he becomes much attached if that driver happens to be the one that suits him. A mule never kicks his driver. Once appointed, the driver was never changed, unless it were unavoidable. For men and mules grew to know one another. The mules did just as the men did. They hurried. They went slow. They exercised care. The muleteers, for their part, were a people in themselves, always dirty in appearance, looking as if they belonged to a different army. Men of thirty or forty years of age, mountaineers for the most part, they understood mules and became very fond of the beasts in their charge, talking to them, especially at night, and confiding all the home news to their long ears, and the mules listened with great attention. Many a scrap of bread was saved for the mules, and many a time when feed ran scarce, did those devoted muleteers lead their charges out to forage under cover of the night? For the most part, however, the feed consisted of dried grass and oats morning and evening, and the regularity of the supply was jealously guarded. With the exercise of due care and common sense, excellent results may be obtained. Indeed, there is no animal who more surely repays all that is done for him. With well-disciplined, well-cared-for mules, Marches of from 14 to 16 hours' duration were on many occasions accomplished over the most difficult and dangerous paths. The skilled leader in the Italian army could estimate exactly what work the mules could be depended upon to accomplish. The best and strongest mules were employed in carrying cannon. There were 24 mules to a battery, each battery being divided into groups of six. Each group carried a cannon, the parts being distributed among the different animals each one of whom, in turn, was called by the name of the part he carried. The loads were borne on the back and on either side and fastened to the mule by means of a frame with straps. 
minute care must be exercised to adjust the harness with nicety and secure a true balance, for any maladjustment causes great fatigue, and the animal must be guided with the utmost skill to avoid lost motion and swerving. There were two hundred or more mules with every battalion of alpine troops, one man to each mule, to every ten a corporal, and to every twenty or so a sergeant. A mule could carry three nets full of bread, one on each side and one on top, with fifty loaves in each net, one hundred and fifty loaves all told. They could carry between ninety and one hundred kilos of meat. Water they carried in bags of rope or cord, which swelled and became water tight. But whatever the official load, no doubt the verses written on the mule of the Western Front applied equally to his brother on the Alps. The pack he carried on his back might, like the young Frau, soar, but there was always room for just one pan or bundle more. The real affection with which the mule was regarded by his human fellow soldiers is well illustrated by an anecdote told by an Italian officer. One day he noticed two soldiers looking very sad and called them to inquire the reason. They replied that they had just received a letter from a comrade in hospital asking for news of his dear friend Lucia, his mule, and they were sad because Lucia had been accidentally killed whilst transporting ammunition. On another occasion, an officer received orders to retreat with his column from Monte Tomatico by the shortest route as the position was surrounded. In case the mules could not follow, they were to be killed and the cannon destroyed. The officer, who loved his mules, received the order with sorrow. Finding an opening, however, through a gorge, he led his column in, although there was no sign of a path. The column was a long one, three hundred men and one hundred mules, and the march was fraught with difficulty. Had a single animal fallen, it would have precipitated both men and mules into the deep ravine below. Yet though the march lasted over sixteen hours, it was accomplished without accident. That night I had the sensation, wrote the officer afterwards, that the mules understood the grave responsibility which rested on all of us. The sick mule, the wounded mule, or the mule who had overstrained himself, was given the most careful attention in the little veterinary hospitals constructed of boards, many of which were placed near the mountaintops. About ten percent of the entire numbers lost their lives from one cause or another, and of these, about one half perished by falling down crevices or over cliffs, especially at Montenero. At Beta Pastore, at a height of 2,200 meters, in the zone of the Ortler Massifs, a mule loaded with camp cauldrons for soup for the soldiers slipped in crossing a difficult path and fell into a gorge with a drop of 300 meters. Sometimes entire transports were swept away by avalanches. In cases such as these, nothing could be done. But wherever there was a chance, rescue was attempted. The comradeship that existed between men and mules is touchingly illustrated in the expression used by each driver to encourage his beast. Coraggio, povera bestia, he would call. Tutto per la patria. At another time, it was forza, which may be translated by the good American expression, put some pep in it. Again, it was the ancient war cry, avanti Savoia. Finally, it was vinceremo, or we'll win, to which the mule heartily agreed. And the mule was right. The Italians have always held a high opinion of the animal, which was destined to become such a valuable ally in the Great War. In 1908, they owned 388,000 mules. Ten years later, before the war was over, they owned nearly half a million. During the four years, 1915 to 18, having had previous favorable experience of the mule in the South African War of 1899 to 1901, the United Kingdom purchased from this country no less than 197,215 mules, value $39,122,652, which amounted to considerably more than half the total number of mules exported by the United States during that period, viz. 343,271 mules, Value $68,372,715. Be it noted that in this vast total is not included the number of the mules accompanying 
the American Expeditionary Force, nor the still greater number that remained with the army at home. In the year 1912, the United Kingdom had bought one mule from the United States, and this specimen apparently proving a success, the three kingdoms had ventured on the purchase of no less than three mules the following year. But it took the world cataclysm to demonstrate to our cousins of what sturdy stuff the mule was made, and the opinions they have left on record fully corroborated the highest praise ever bestowed by the Italians. Thus, Brigadier General T.R.L. Bate of the British Remount Commission in the United States and Canada, having had experience of both horses and mules in a battery in two theaters of the war, wrote that he would unhesitatingly say that if he had the remounting arrangements for any future war, mules would supplant horses to the greatest possible extent. The British estimate of the mule has never been better expressed than it was by an officer of the Royal Artillery, writing in the Yorkshire Post, under date of Monday, 13th January, 1919. Deeply versed in the ways of the mule, having handled hundreds of them, he tells of the first and last kick he ever received, and then continues in this strain. Forthwith, O pictorial traducer of the ancient and noble tribe of mules, banish from thy confused mind the baseless assumption that the mule is a humorous species of wild animal introduced by tens of thousands into modern warfare, merely to add a touch of variety to an otherwise dreary existence, that spends most of its time refusing to be harnessed up, eating tin cans and saddle blankets, kicking captains and corporals, stampeding in masses at the hint of a sneeze, and behaving generally like a professional knockabout in a music hall. Take a mule, reasonably young, treat him kindly, train him tactfully. Let him get accustomed to one man's voice, and he will become the most tractable, affectionate, and lovable animal on the face of the earth, besides one of the most effective in draft. Practically all mules incorrigibly fractious are old ones, and in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, they have been brutally treated. A mule, while he never forgets a kindness, never forgives an injury. In the days of his youth, he may be timid, Windy is the driver's word, but he is quickly responsive to the gentle touch, the caressing word, and quiet, unfussy, fearless attention on the part of his master will evolve confidence and a steady poise out of frightened unmanageability in a magically swift transition, so that it is no unusual thing to see a driver followed about by his mule like a faithful dog and nosed and nudged in loving friendliness. In the stable at feeding time, I would walk with a greater sense of security behind an unchartered line of army mules than behind a line of artillery horses. If I were in the veterinary service and of indolent habit, I should infinitely prefer the supervision of a mule unit to that of a horse unit. A mule rarely goes sick. Thanks probably to his more capacious stomach, he remains almost entirely free from colic, that common and dangerous affliction of the horse on active service aggravating diseases of the foot as rarely trouble him, and he is not subject to the ups and downs of condition, which make the care of horses in wartime a perpetual anxiety. Indeed, for endurance under conditions of sustained exposure, the horse is not in the same street with this hardy beast. In the Vimy battles of the early part of 1917, I was detailed to assist a battery commander for a short time with about 12 teams of mules in the supply of the ammunition to guns. The work was fast, severe, under intense pressure, for gun ammunition was fired away like rifle bullets. The roads and tracks were in a deplorable state of slush and mud, and you may remember that for several days the battle raged in the worst blizzard experienced during the war. Horses and mules alike were in the open on a bleak hillside, up to their bellies in snow and half-frozen mud, and horses perished like flies. You could count them nearly by the score on the road. Fanciful word. And the battery to which I was attached lost 70 fine horses from exposure alone, apart altogether from shellfire. One bitter morning, 11 were reported stone dead in the lines. Yet throughout that dreadful time, not a mule died. Not one went sick. Not one became ineffective. And in the end, it was the mules that got the battery safely out of action, a truly remarkable achievement.
Within a month, those magnificent mules, which had certainly lost some of their weight, were as sleek and vigorous as ever, not a penny the worse. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, and if I could have any say in the matter, I would substitute mules for horses in every battery in the British Army. At Passchendaele, I am never sure of the spelling of that odious word, in the autumn of 1917, millions of rounds were delivered to the guns on pack animals, over ground that was hardly passable, even for infantrymen, and that gradually became transformed into lakes of impure mud many feet deep. Three-fourths of the work was accomplished by mules. Few horses could have withstood the strain, and not many did stand it. Hundreds, if not thousands of mules met their death by drowning or by shell fire, but their unwavering discipline under bursts of intense fire and in face of the tremendous roar of our own guns along that terrible track from Wilts to Kansas Cross and beyond was wonderful to behold. Their staunchness, their strength, their blind trust in their stoic drivers, as brave and unmurmuring as they, their silent suffering, the poignant agony of their dying struggles in cavernous shell holes filled with slime and water, the pain of having to shoot many a section pet to put him out of his misery. These are memories which will keep alive in one's heart an abiding admiration for so devoted a friend of man. The prose poet also pays his tribute, which is none the less deep and sincere for the lightness of touch. Though gas gave out and motors stopped and wagons lost their wheels, no power but death could halt the swift machinery of his heels. Captain Sidney Galtry, in his interesting book, The Horse in the War, published in 1918, pays a series of wonderful tributes to the mule. Even at the risk of reiteration, I feel that I should quote at least one or two short passages. Often and often, writes Captain Galtry, the mule has done what the horse has failed to do. He has survived and outlasted him, and maybe has shown his perversity by apparent enjoyment of the awful din of battles, the deep mud and piercing cold of France, or the heat and flies of the East. His temper and constitution have remained whole, while the specimen of his mother's branch of the species have cracked and fallen by the wayside. Given his liquid refreshment and his humbler rations, it takes a lot to put a mule out of action. He has even kindled enthusiasm among ardent horse lovers who were once prejudiced against him and despised the donkey in his outline and demeanor. So in time, they have come to say, give us mules for this job of war rather than horses. A strange and yet true conversion. Captain Galtry gives interesting figures as to the proportion of disease during wartime as between the horses and the mules. Mange, for instance, attacks four horses to one mule. In the case of debility, there are four and a half horses to one mule, and for digestive diseases, eight horses to every mule. Cellulitis is as four to one, and ophthalmia as two to one. Lameness is about equal, and it is a curious thing, he adds, that mules seldom recover from bone lameness. Our own government paid a handsome tribute to the work of the mule for the American army in an official publication issued by the Quartermaster General in 1920. More than 45,000 of him were engaged with the army abroad and more than 100,000 with the troops in the United States. And while there was much hee-hawing, kicking, balking, biting, and other mulish tricks, as might be expected, the army mule lived up to his established reputation for enduring, sacrificing, and dying like a soldier. The Boston Herald, commenting on this official testimony, remarks, Higher praise could not be rendered. A cloud of witnesses bear testimony in all the languages of Babel to the worth of the humble mule. He has his little drawbacks. He loves to roll, especially when he has just been groomed and the ground is muddy. Like many an excellent man and woman, he loves to eat. And it is said that with palatable food before him, he will eat till he bursts. In view of the widespread impression as to the Catholic nature of the mule's appetite, which is in so many cases quenched with unsuitable food, I have sometimes wondered whether the bursting was not caused as much by surprise at the sight of good food as by overeating. He won his way into the hearts of our allies. 
I must recite just one incident of how he, or rather in this case, she, captured the affections of the Doughboys. I quote from the Boston Herald of November 22, 1920. Mademoiselle Verdun was foaled April 16, 1918, just four hours after her dam had finished hauling shells for Battery E of the 15th Field Artillery. Before she was a month old, she had hiked 30 miles in two days and was in the thick of every subsequent major offensive pulled off by the 2nd Division. Later, for good measure, she hiked 100 miles to the Rhine, keeping watch with the rest of the Army of Occupation. Then the questions arose as to how she was going to be brought back to the United States because of an ironclad rule which had been issued against bringing animals back. The boys of Battery E decided they had not fought in France for nothing, with the result that Mademoiselle Verdun, mysteriously missing for some days, blossomed forth at quarantine on this side of the Atlantic, too late to be sent back to France. A relentless veterinary officer thrust Mademoiselle Verdun into quarantine, but she was later freed and became monarch of the regiment at Camp Travis. And now, let the long-suffering mule say a word for himself, which he does in the form of a poem, signed LLLL, Base Indian Remount Depot, BEF France, and entitled Musings of a Mule. I am only a common or garden mule who was bred in the USA. I was born in a barn on a western farm, many thousands of miles away from where I am munching on a government lunch at Great Britain's expense today. With dozens of others I knew and have seen in my little gray home in the west, where the grazing was succulent, luscious and green, and life was a bit of a jest. I have sniffed the salt breeze blowing over the seas, and I've landed in France with the rest. Many months at a time, I was up on the Somme, in the rain and the mud and the mire. We were packing the shells to the various hells, in the dips of the vast undulations and dells, where the field guns were belching their fire. It was very poor sport when the forage ran short, first to eight and then six pounds a day but we managed to live on the blankets they brought, though blankets I now think, and always have thought, are but poor substitution for hay. Now the life in a paddock, according to men, is a sort of a beautiful song, where animals wander around and can squander the time as they wander along, with nothing to worry them, nothing to do, except for food intervals daily, but you can take it from me they are wrong. For paddocks are places conducive to thoughts that settle unbid on the brain, and often I find them to follow a kind of a minor key tune or refrain. As I doze for an hour in the afternoon sun, or I stand with my rump in the rain, I dream of the barn on my Illinois farm, and I long to be back there again. End of chapter 9section 10 of animal heroes by ernest baines this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org animal heroes by ernest baines section 10 the blood relations of the mule the little long-eared donkeys also marched and worked and died with the patience for which they are famed. Perhaps the best known, that used largely in the western theatre of war, was the ass of the Poitou, a place which has long been famous for its fine breed of donkeys. The Poitou jackass is from fourteen to fifteen hands high, with an enormous head and ears so large that their owner, instead of holding them upright, finds it necessary to keep them in a horizontal position. From these asses are bred the equally famous mules of Poitou. The ass, plodding and steady, would go until he dropped. He carried a heavy weight, varying from 100 to 200 pounds, and sometimes the load was so bulky 
that the donkey himself could scarcely be distinguished. Donkeys were used for pushing and pulling and as pack animals, and they were cared for by men too old for the trenches. One man was assigned to six donkeys on the plains and to two or three in the mountains. Donkeys served with all the allied armies in France and made friends with the soldiers wherever they went. Sometimes the men took them into the dugouts for mutual warmth. Long strings of them might have been seen trotting through French villages and out into the country on their way to the battlefields, with panniers loaded with food for the blue-clad men at the front. And because they were small, their drivers could lead them into the trenches and distribute the rations as they went along. The donkeys carried ammunition also, and worked chiefly at night. On one occasion, a British officer met a French donkey transport, and noticed that one little fellow had no ears. His driver explained that a bursting shell had cut them off, and rendered the animal stone blind as well. The officer passed his hand caressingly over the pathetic little face, and exclaimed, "'Oh, you plucky little devil! You deserve the croix de guerre!' The Italians used donkeys chiefly for mountain transport, and employed not less than 100,000 seated by peasants, farmers, and landowners, at a price of about 500 lire apiece. The Italians groomed them carefully in the morning, and they were well fed with a ration of hay and barley twice a day. The donkeys were quartered in barracks warmed in winter by little stoves. They proved extraordinarily hardy, rarely going to hospital except when galled by ropes. An Italian officer told me that one of the most comical incidents he ever witnessed occurred in the Alps as a train of ammunition donkeys arrived at one of the peaks. It happened at that very moment that the Austrians opened an intensive bombardment, and the startled and excited donkeys, with ears cocked forward, trotted over to the edge of the precipice, and looking towards the enemy, began to bray in chorus. It sounded like derisive laughter, and the Italians waved their hats and yelled with delight. Donkeys are cautious little beasts but sometimes their very caution was their undoing. When the French, under Sarai, were retreating down the valley of the Vardar before superior forces of Bulgarians, they had to cross a narrow bridge over a roaring torrent at the sight and sound of which many of the donkeys balked. There was not a moment to coax or to argue. They were simply pushed over, packs and all, into the rushing water twenty feet below, to make way for the men who had to get over in time to blow the bridge up in face of the pursuing enemy. In the Near East, eight thousand little donkeys, carrying baskets of stone on their backs, helped General Allenby to build his roads along the front from Jaffa to Jericho. Here also these small but sturdy creatures carried heavy weights, two boxes of biscuit weighing eighty or one hundred pounds each, jam, bully beef, grain. They transported camp equipment for the Egyptian labor corps, cooking outfits, blankets, etc. Thousands of the big brown cypress donkeys were used at Saloniki and Egypt, and the Sudan supplied donkeys in vast numbers for the Near Eastern theater of operations. The Egyptian pack donkey, which varied in color, was a useful creature to be bought for six pounds, whilst the large, handsome white donkey, known as Hasawi, and bred chiefly at Ajiat, fetched ten times that amount. The Sudanese donkeys were very small and hardy, and could go for twenty-four hours without water if necessary. They were worth just under three pounds. Originally, four hundred donkeys had been sent up from Egypt to work in supply convoys in Judean hills, and had carried supplies to the lines over country where roads did not then exist. An interesting account of how, later on, donkeys saved the day is given in the Desert Mounted Corps. Ammunition and food were running short 
and fresh supplies had to be sent to El Salt before morning. No vehicle could get up the Um El Shert track, and as the journey had to be done in the night, camels were equally out of the question. Each of the cavalry regiments had at this time a few donkeys which were used by cooks and batmen, who did not usually accompany their units into action. About two hundred of these were collected at Goreria in the evening, loaded with ammunition and stores, and sent off in charge of a subaltern of the gunners. Marching all night, they succeeded in reaching El Salt, which was then being hotly attacked by their enemy on the morning of the second, delivered their sorely needed ammunition, and returned safely to Goreria. The distance covered on the double journey was forty miles, over an appalling country, and with the prospect of stumbling into the enemy at any moment. I shall conclude with an extract from some charming verses by Cecil Brown, entitled, The Ass of Palestine. The subject of my verses is quite unknown to fame. He gets all kicks, no happens, and still he plays the game. If there's anywhere a hero who deserves a happy end, who's faithful as he's plucky, a slave, and yet a friend, who never shirks his duty, be it rain or be it shine, it's that living pocket Hercules, the ass of Palestine. End of section 10「Section 11 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doty. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Oxen. On the Italian front, a picturesque touch was furnished by the oxen of Roman, Emilian, and other breeds, which were employed in great numbers. Their weight averaged from 1,200 to 1,500 pounds, and their great strength made them available for the transport of large artillery pieces and all sorts of heavy material, and sometimes, unofficially as it were, of light objects also, as when the soldiers placed their knapsacks on the patient necks of the beasts. In Italy, the oxen were kept in concentration camps near rivers, where they could bathe and water in sheltered spots. They were washed with water applied with straw, and fed on grass and hay, and sometimes a little grain when work was heavy. Special officers and men tended them, one soldier for each team. Working mates always evinced a decided affection for one another, disliking much to be separated after having worked together for any length of time. During cannon fire, the oxen appeared to be perfectly phlegmatic, but the sight of others of their kind lying dead produced unmistakable signs of fear and a reluctance to work. When themselves wounded, they behaved quietly and proved to be exemplary patients in the Blue Cross Hospital. Oxen were used on many other fronts, as pack and draught animals in France, for instance, and in the Serbian transport. Hard-working, faithful unto death, and death carried them off perhaps by twenty at a time when a shell exploded in their midst. The oxen cannot be said to have led an easy life at any front, but the hardship, whatever it may have been, of their lives in France, in Italy, in the Near East, paled into insignificance when compared with the terrible sufferings of oxen in the campaign in German East Africa. The nature of the country was such that in ordinary conditions, animals would not have been required to work there. From Mombasa on the coast, the railway ran through Voy, a distance of about 100 miles, and thence onwards, northwest, through British East Africa to Lake Victoria, Nyanza. From Voy, however, to the base of operations around Mount Kilimanjaro, the trail led over the worst kind of roads and through bush that at times seemed impenetrable. All nature combined to cast obstacles in the way and to the suffocating heat of the African jungle. But 200 miles south of the equator were added the terrible discomforts of matted undergrowth, thorny bushes, and quagmire. Yet with the fortitude for which they have been famed through the ages, the oxen continued to haul the British transport over the plains in clouds of dust, through the bush with its thorns, tangle, and mud, hauled until they dropped. For disease lurked everywhere. The ravages of anthrax and rinderpest are well known, 
but preventative measures were taken throughout inoculation, and the veterinarians at the base were careful to select for the meat supply and for track purposes only the beasts that were free from both these pests. Their task was rendered more difficult, as the animals were collected in areas where East Coast fever was enzootic. A multitude of diseases were caused by ticks, though losses from that source were minimized by dipping at the base depots in tanks containing arsenical fluids. From four to six hundred animals can be passed through a tank within the hour, but the female tick deals in much higher mathematics. She can lay from two thousand to six thousand eggs. It will be understood, therefore, how grossly infected the veldt becomes. It is said that about 75% of all stock diseases in Africa are caused by ticks. Then, as if that in itself were not sufficient, there are those disgusting byproducts of the tick, the tick birds, bufaginae, and cow herons, bubalis lucidus, which eat the ticks on the cattle and then prey on the cattle that have sores. Of all the diseases, however, most deadly is that produced by the bite of the tsetse fly. With the continual trekking back and forth of large numbers of animals, this fly became spread over long tracts of transport route, so that its infectivity rose from its normal 3 to 4 percent to practically every fly being infected. The morality among horses, mules, and cattle became appalling. Of oxen alone, 60,000 were employed in this campaign, and most of them died, chiefly from the bite of the tsetse fly. No cure has been discovered for the disease produced by this insect, but it is known that arsenic administered daily will prolong the working life of an animal for about six weeks. So two and a half million tabloids were issued for this purpose, and the oxen, horses, mules, and donkeys were dosed with arsenic and kept at work until they dropped. The grain feed was the vehicle used for administering the arsenic, and when grain ran short, the arsenic could not be given. As a matter of fact, the greater part of the supply of tabloids remained unexpended. It is worthy of note that throughout all the vicissitudes of the campaign, the Abyssinian and Somali pony and mule survived best of all. They could go longer without water, withstand the sun better, and probably had some resistance to tsetse infection. The British lost 100,000 animals in East Africa alone, and towards the end of the campaign, it was necessary to use 120,000 natives in the transport. The veterinary service did all that lay in their power. They applied disease preventive measures where such were known, and they selected the thousands upon thousands of cattle, sheep, and goats for the meat supply for the troop. But at the front, where the average lifespan of a horse was from three to four weeks, where the disease-stricken animal was practically incurable, where in one hospital alone during the month of November 1916, over 1,800 horses and mules were destroyed, and the carcasses lay in mountains. The veterinary officers are said to have felt themselves superfluous. The only qualification necessary, remarked one of them, is to be a good revolver shot. Entomologists did their bit by mapping out routes in an endeavor to dodge the fly areas. But human knowledge and skill seemed meager and trifling, with no power to avert the fearful holocaust. One would like to pay a tribute to the noble part played by animals during these years. In no sphere of operation were their sufferings so great. Nowhere was the mortality so terrific, and perhaps never did one feel more deeply the debt we owed to these dumb creatures. End of section 11. Section 12 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. Animal Heroes by Ernest Bain, Section 12 Dogs There were some animals which the army veterinarians did not handle, because they were smaller and less numerous than those I have mentioned. It was found more practical to have them cared for in civilian veterinary hospitals, or even by individuals sometimes. In this class came the war dogs, the keenest, the most intelligent, the most anxious to help 
of all the animals used by the Allies. They were the only four foots who could be trusted to do a piece of work strictly on their own. Each one knew his job and did it, not because he was made to, but because of the love which is the impelling motive for everything a free dog does for man. They served in many capacities as messengers, sentries, and patrolmen, and occasionally as combatants, as draft animals with the machine guns, in the transport and in the mail service, and as pack animals to carry food and ammunition to points difficult or impossible for other animals to reach. As detectives, they were valuable assistants, and as watchmen, they were easily superior to men. Not the least important of their many services to the Allies, they rendered as mascots to the troops. By their merry pranks and the keen interest they showed in everything that was going on, by their readiness to respond to every kind word and to every friendly act, by their courage, loyalty, and everlasting good nature, they helped to relieve the feverish strain of war and to keep up the morale of the men in the trenches as it seemed nothing else on earth could do. They were not used to the limit of their mental capacity, only to the limit of what is practical in time of war. Most of the stories we have read of their wonderful work for the Red Cross, of their searching for and finding wounded men after a battle, and guiding stretcher bearers to the scene, are fiction. That the Germans used dogs with more or less success in Red Cross work, I am aware. But so far as the Allies are concerned, I am informed on the best of authority that not a single life was saved in France by a Red Cross dog. It was not that it was impossible to train dogs to do any of the feats required for such duties, but that it would have taken too much of the time of too many good men to establish and maintain an efficient Red Cross dog service in time of war. General Joffrey abolished the Red Cross dog in the French army in 1915, but, as we shall see, the fame of the war dogs may well rest on the splendid work they actually did. It needs no support from the stories of what some of the sentimentalists would like to believe they did. End of section 12. Section 13 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Section 13. French War Dogs. Sentry Dogs. Of all the Allies... The French used dogs the most, and in the greatest number of ways. The French war dog service was established after the beginning of hostilities, and its success was due largely to the untiring efforts of Sergeant Paul Mignat, who later became chief of the service. The prejudice he had to overcome is well illustrated by the following story, which was told me by Monsieur Mignat himself. One afternoon, about the time when dogs were being introduced in the army, Sergeant Mignet and an assistant appeared in the front-line trenches with Za and Helda, two Alsatian sheepdogs trained to sentry duty. They had come to offer the services of the quartet for night work at the front, but the captain to whom the matter was referred was merely amused. Mignet politely pressed his offer, and at last the captain said, Well, there's a Bosch outpost somewhere out there which we haven't been able to find. If your dogs can discover it for us, then I'm for sentry dogs. Mignet bowed. If the outpost is within 250 meters, he said, we shall probably find it. If the men on duty there move or are relieved during the night, my dogs will hear them and tell me where they are. As soon as it was dark, Mignon took up a position in the trench with Helda lying on the edge of it. 150 meters to his left, his assistant, a sergeant of the 22nd Chasseurs and an expert dog trainer, 
occupied a similar position with za they had not been watching for more than ten minutes when helda's ears went forward and she turned her head slightly and began to growl her master tried gently to calm her but her attention was firmly fixed on something he could neither see nor hear so he very carefully marked the point at which he stood and the exact direction of the dog's nose from that point a minute later he learned from his assistant that za also had growled and that of course the sergeant had marked the direction of her nose the captain was awakened and mignon indicated the lines along which the dogs had pointed where those lines meet said he you will probably find what you are looking for we'll see said the captain and mounting an observation post he ordered a star shell sent up above the point which mignon referred to there sure enough was the german outpost he wanted and a french battery did its duty helda eventually became the most famous sentry dog in the french army but she was more than a sentry dog she was a veritable canine sherlock holmes and more than one criminal has marveled to think how much that dog knew about him helda had not human intelligence if she had most of the deeds which won her the name she bore would never have been performed but she had dog intelligence in a high degree and this supplemented with powers of scent and hearing such as no man's can approach made her an ace among war dogs as i am not writing her biography i must content myself with one more story concerning her in a neglected corner of a lonely graveyard in girard mer there is a mound without the customary wooden cross to mark it while youths who sometimes come to bow their heads reverently above their dead comrades pass it by with contempt it hides all that remains of the bullet-riddled body of a private who during the war had been tried and condemned by court-martial and shot as a traitor to france in the early part of nineteen fifteen this battalion was the first unit in the army of the vosges and alsace to possess a war dog kennel it had been established on a farm a few hundred yards from the village of solzeran on the alsatian border and the farm buildings had been converted into quarters for the kennel men and dogs at the time of which i speak the summer of nineteen fifteen solzerin had just been captured by the blue devils and the french and german lines were very close together some of the opposing sentries being but a few yards apart the kennels were in charge of an amateur trainer named gilroy who had planned and effected the organization with about a hundred dogs to keep in training gilroy had more work than he could handle alone and he asked for an assistant trainer who could also make himself useful as a general helper the man sent to him was private vachet a smart soldier of the twelfth battalion alpine chasseurs who qualified as an expert jack-of-all-trades having at different times been a cook a watchmaker a laundryman a shoemaker an acrobat and a circus rider he was sour-tempered but very intelligent with a keen memory and he soon proved a clever assistant dog trainer as gilroy had to be away with his dogs a great deal Vachet was left to himself, and being fond of walking, wandered about the sector until he knew not only every mule path over the mountains, and all the isolated farms and the shortcuts between them, but every reserve camp and battery position, and even the names of the officers in all the units. One murky night, Private Herbelin, a kennel man, was awakened by the growling of Helda, who slept at his feet he became aware that other dogs were growling he arose quietly and heard a man say in a very low tone push up, push up. it was vachet's voice and he was trying to silence the dogs some of them stopped but helda continued to growl and presently herbelin saw vachet pass out of the door into the night some hours later about four a m the chasseur returned and again helda led the growling now the interesting thing here is that the men, including Vachet, often went out at night, and the dogs, their constant companions for months, had never paid any attention to their going or coming. Apparently, there was something peculiar about the way this man went out, which Helda didn't like. Perhaps it was some unusual stealthiness. The matter was reported to Sergeant Maignan, who happened to be visiting this part of the front. 
He disliked being suspicious, but he considered it his duty to pay attention to the warning of so intelligent a dog as Helta. So he instructed Hermelin to keep a watch and to call him if anything unusual happened. Two nights passed without event, though kennel men went out and came back. But on the third night, the sound of distant thunder came from Helda's throat, and Hermelin, putting out his hand, felt the dog's body stiffen and the hair rise upon her shoulders. Then he saw Vachet steal silently away. He notified Mignon, and again, at about four in the morning, the chasseur returned. Mignon was worried. He knew of Vachet's extraordinary knowledge of the surrounding country and realized that if he were selling this knowledge to the enemy, the situation was a serious one. Next night, he and Herbalam both kept watch, and when Vachet went out, they followed him, or tried to, but it was no use. They quickly lost him in the darkness. A few nights later, when the suspected man disappeared out the door, Mignon and Herbalin followed him again, but this time they were accompanied by the two dogs, Helda and El Tango, both on leash. The keen-scented animals were put on Vachet's trail and led their trainers for miles over the rough ground and up into the hills until they came to a mountain stream. Here the dogs were baffled, for the man they were tracking had evidently entered the water, which of course had carried away the scent. The little party crossed the stream, and as Helda and El Tango could find no trail there, it was evident that Vachet had taken this opportunity to elude pursuit in case he were followed with dogs. How far he had stuck to the water, or whether he had gone upstream or down, there was no way of telling without experiment. But as Mignon was looking about and considering his next move, he saw a light flashing from a point on a hillside at some distance beyond them. Someone was signaling to the enemy with a flashlight. The party returned to the kennels, and Mignon got in touch with the Secret Service. Next day, the kennels were shelled by the enemy's heavy guns, and men and dogs were obliged to seek shelter in hastily made cagnas on the edge of Lake Derry. Then, by the checking up of dates, it was found that some unusual enemy activity had occurred on every day that immediately followed one of Vachet's night wanderings. On one of these dates, the military camp at Bischstein, which had just received a large number of relief troops, on another, there had been a heavy shelling of the Gazon Martin's batteries. An inspector from the Secret Service was soon at work on the case, and with the aid of the trainers and their dogs, he captured Vachet red-handed. At first, the man denied his guilt and attempted to explain his actions. But a few days later, in his cell, he made a partial confession of his treachery. Next morning, however, when he was brought out for an examination, he made another denial. But there was present a most convincing witness against him. It was Helda, the dog he had fed and cared for, and with which, until lately, he had been on the friendliest terms. Now she stood before him a growling menace, her leash drawn taut as a bowstring, mane erect, and bright eyes flashing deadly hatred. But the leash was strong, and Vachet, defiant, persisted in his denial. An officer whispered to Mignon, and Mignon made a sign to the dog. Instantly, and without a sound, Helda leaped at her man, and as her wolf teeth met in the arm, he raised to stop her. He yelled, Take her off! Take her off! And I'll tell you everything. Let go, Helda. The disappointed but obedient dog let go her hold, and backed slowly away, as if hoping that the last order would be reversed. Then Vachet told his story, how for 250 francs, that was all he had actually received, he had become a traitor. He told how, by means of a pocket flash lamp with a range of several miles, he had repeatedly signaled to the enemy at night, and how during the daytime he deposited in old tree trunks messages which were later collected by a German spy who passed through the French lines for that purpose, in the uniform 
of an alpine chasseur. He also admitted that it was on information furnished by him that the recent bombardment of the battery location of the kennels and the reserve camps had been ordered. He said that he had brought about the shelling of the kennels because he felt that he was suspected and hoped that those who might be watching him would be destroyed. The court-martial which sentenced Vacher to be shot also paid special tribute to the vigilance of war dogs, and the kennel manager and his assistants were officially commended by the division commander and by the head of the Secret Service of the Seventh Army. End of section 13. Section 14 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Section 14. Century Dogs. Lieutenant Colonel E. H. Richardson late commandant of the British War Dog School, tells us that the qualities required in a sentry dog are acute hearing and scent, sagacity, fidelity, and a strong sense of duty. Lieutenant Paul Maignan, assistant chief of the French War Dog Service, lays special emphasis on hearing, which he considers of first importance under circumstances where a dog can neither see nor smell an approaching enemy he says a sensitive ear will often enable him to give necessary warning he considers hounds for all their marvelous powers of scent practically worthless as sentries and among more than six hundred dogs that he sent for duty in alsace and the vosges only one auxiliary sentry a griffon pointer named chocolate was of the hound type. Eventually he discovered that even this specimen had a mixture of shepherd blood in him. Medium-sized dogs were preferred as a rule. Dogs big enough to endure a hard march when necessary, but not so big that they were in the way. Airedales were great favorites with the British, as were large Irish terriers, collies, retrievers, and crosses of all these breeds. Some of the best French sentries were Alsatian shepherds. It will be noted that practically all these dogs have serviceable weatherproof coats, a matter of great importance to animals during night duty in exposed positions at all times of the year. In order to minimize the activities of spies and robbers, always coincident with war operations, the French organized under the Ministry of Armaments and War Manufactures a service for protecting all organizations doing work for national defense. The work consisted largely of maintaining patrols, sentries, or cordons of sentries, armed guards, and auxiliary inspectors of the intelligence service. Notwithstanding its large and costly personnel, this service was far from being entirely effective, and when in 1917, the Ministry of War reorganized the service of war dogs. The Minister of Armaments asked this service to furnish dogs to replace sentries and to accompany patrols and watchmen on their rounds. This request led to the training of several grades of canine assistants, requiring shorter or longer periods of instruction, according to the simplicity or intricacy of the work required of them. The so-called enclosure dog was simply an efficient watchdog to be set free at night inside an enclosed area, such as a factory yard. His duty was to give warning of the approach of strangers and to entertain any intruder until the arrival of a human watchman. A suitable dog could be trained for this work in from ten days to two weeks. A higher grade of service requiring from five to seven weeks of training was rendered by what might be translated as the rounds dog, which accompanied his master, explored the territory immediately around him, defended him if necessary, and prevented the escape of any suspected person. Of still higher grade was the so-called detective dog, which might or might not 
be capable of performing these duties, but which would follow a trail, search suspected premises, and identify a suspect whose trail he had been following. At least three months were required to perfect a student in this work, and no time was devoted to any but the most intelligent dogs. When working on a case, a detective was usually accompanied by his trainer, who led him in a leash attached to a harness which allowed him to pull as hard as he liked without choking himself. The following incident gives an idea of the sort of work these canine experts were called upon to perform. In the early part of 1916, a gang of deserters from the French army were terrorizing a whole district of the Department of the Upper Somme. They had given their attention to smuggling and highway robbery and had already killed a policeman and two custom officers. The Secret Service of the Seventh Army decided to rid the country of this gang and organized at Remiremont an expedition for this purpose. It consisted of an infantry company, a section of engineers with explosives and poison gas, 25 military policemen, three police commissaries, 15 Secret Service inspectors, and the head of the Intelligence Service. With them were two dogs, Pharaoh, a Beauceron shepherd, who before the war had won many prizes in police dog trials, and Max, a Doberman pincher, who in 1914 had captured 15 poachers in Cursin Forest in the Wave. The bandits were known to frequent a dense forest 120 kilometers away, and an abandoned mill in the heart of it was believed to be a favorite hiding place. One night, in a fleet of automobiles and motor lorries, the expedition started for this forest and arrived at the outskirts a little before dawn. From here the party proceeded on foot to a group of lonely buildings, which included the mill. The infantry surrounded the place, and the engineers were ordered to blow it up in case of resistance. Then a door was smashed in, and Pharaoh, the police dog, was told to search the buildings. This he did swiftly and thoroughly, exploring the different rooms, upstairs and down, turning over mattresses and tearing open closet doors. But the place was deserted. The bandits had flown. The dog was recalled, and a moment later the engineers destroyed the place to prevent its further use by outlaws. But meanwhile, Max, the keen-nosed Doberman, had been circling through the woods, and now, in dog language, informed his trainer that he had picked up a trail. His eyes signaled, follow me, and his half-inch tail twinkled absurd assurances that he was not mistaken. At a word from his trainer, away he went, followed by a police commissary and the military police. He led them for more than a mile to what looked like a deserted farmhouse, but the dog insisted that it was occupied. Open in the name of the law, shouted the police commissary, and a woman came to the door. The house, she said, was occupied only by herself and her husband, and the latter was sick in bed. Investigation proved that he was in bed, but Max growled and protested that this was the man he had been following. The police were in no humor for nonsense, and the invalid was soon sitting at a table, telling all he knew about the gang of which he was a member. The information which he furnished enabled the police to apprehend all but one of these outlaws, and after a speedy trial in the criminal courts of the Upper Somme, they were found guilty and sent to prison. The War Dog Service organized two kennels near Paris and a third in Normandy for the training of dogs, and a fourth was being contemplated at the time the armistice was signed. Messrs. Dretzen and Michelin respectively Honorary President and Honorary Secretary of the Amateurs' Union of Defense and Police Dogs, and Mr. Bradbury, an English member of the Canine Society of Normandy, were among the civilians who principally cooperated with the professional trainers of the service, and by their zeal and devotion helped to perfect its work. As it is well known that the best-trained dogs are useless unless they are properly handled. Care was taken that the animals were not turned over to men who knew nothing of dog management. As soon as the four-footed defenders had completed their education, 
the watchmen and others who have direct control of them, were sent to the war dog school at Satori for an eight-day course in dog handling during which they became thoroughly acquainted with the particular animals with which they were to work. The immediate result of the use of such dogs was a great saving in manpower. It was universally admitted that one good watchdog was worth two good sentries, but the advantage in favor of the dog was often much greater than that. For example, at the aviation camp at Cazol, it was found that 16 men and 16 dogs could do the work which formerly had required 52 sentries. In a warehouse of the General Automobile Reserve Corps, where, in spite of a cordon of sentries, frequent robberies were committed, six dogs replaced 26 men and captured three tire and gasoline thieves in the very first week. The supply depot at Aubrey's, near Orléans, was regularly visited by food robbers and barrel drainers, who ceased their activities only when three dogs were put on duty to relieve fifteen keepers who had not succeeded in preventing depredations. A powerful, resolute dog, keen of eye and nose and ear, intelligent, fearless, and unbribable, backed by a well-armed, equally resolute man whom he loves, and who, for his part, understands the dog's every sound and movement, is a combination that few evildoers care to face even in the daytime, let alone at night. It represents a danger that is only partly understood. A thief may understand a human watchman and decide to take a chance with one whose mental and physical attributes are similar to his own, and perhaps no better. But the dog usually is a quantity at least half unknown to him, and whatever knowledge he may have does not give any comfort. It does not inspire one with great confidence to know that he will have to face not only his equivalent in manpower, but, in addition, an animal that by reason of superior scent and hearing will always have the drop on him, that can run him down if he is in sight, that can track him if he isn't, and that will listen to no argument save death itself. The odds are too great for the average thief, and he'll seek his opportunities in a less hazardous game. The records of this service are very brief, but unmistakable in the evidence they give of the value of the dogs. Delivery number 1652B. On the night of August 24, 25, 1918, this dog detected, while still far away, enemies attempting to overwhelm La Buisson, a small outlying post. She gave the alarm twice. The post commander ordered fire opened on the enemy party, which was dispersed. One of our reconnoitering patrols found in front of our barbed wire many devices such as shears, grenades, explosives, etc., and traces of blood. Miss number B3, Remerville sector, during night of February 7, 8, 1917, gave several warnings. Thanks to the watchfulness of this dog, an enemy coup de main was foiled at Montsel. Prisoners were captured, among them an officer, at least one French regiment, the 42nd Colonial Infantry organized a regimental kennel in order that sentry dogs might be available whenever needed. The kennel was in charge of Sergeant Trouve, formerly a gamekeeper on the estates of Henri de Rothschild. The following is one of scores of similar entries to be found on the books of that kennel. Turco II, number 219B. Joined unit July 7, 1916. Several times warned of approaching enemy patrols, which were dispersed. Served in East, February 2, 1917. During the night of February 18, 19, at Monastir Section, Turco warned of an approaching Bulgarian patrol, on which advance post opened immediate fire. Enemy patrol could not throw hand grenades within 30 and 35 meters of our post while retiring. Another entry speaks of Kiki, also a sentry dog, 
on the same front. Kiki, wounded in the foot by a Bulgarian bullet after being bandaged, went on sentry duty again, and three and a half hours later gave warning of another enemy patrol. On April 29th, 1916, the officer commanding the 153rd Infantry Brigade, holding rabideau le revin sector in the Vosges, wrote to director of the 7th Army Kennels, The auxiliary sentry dogs on duty in this sector are particularly alert and watchful. Thus, on April 26th, our sentries were warned by Polo of an attempted attack on one of our blockhouses. The following more detailed report of the occurrence came from the sentry with whom Polo was on duty. On April 26th at 4 o'clock in the morning, sentry dog Polo warned me of the approach of a strong patrol which was cutting barbed wire in front of the blockhouse, about 200 meters away. He warned me well, first by moving his head and then by growling. Then I took my dog into the trench, and our gunfire and hand grenades started. The enemy patrol was driven back, and they left on the spot six pairs of shears and other belongings, and a cap full of blood. Polo did his duty well, and the whole post is satisfied with him. I have received congratulations on account of him, and so I am very glad and proud, too. Mr. Director, I remain yours respectively. Benson Hubert, 3rd Company, 2nd Battalion, 115th Territorial Infantry Regiment. Cabot, a powerful French sentry dog with a dash of bulldog blood in his veins, had an unexpected pleasure one night when he detected a German messenger dog working his way along the front. For the first time on record, he deserted his post and, followed by his master, cut across no man's land and intercepted the enemy. There was a fight, of course, but it was a very short one, for Cabot was playing his own game, and he quickly strangled his adversary. A metal tube on the dead dog's collar, full of German dispatches, was soon in the hands of the French command, and Cabot, after licking some blood from his coat, gaily followed his master back to the trench. The vigilance of such dogs also did much to discourage the enemy practice of kidnapping sentries, with a view to extorting information. On certain sectors and at certain times, this was indulged in with much discomfort to the French. For example, one regiment in the Vosges in the month of July 1915 had seven sentries captured in three nights, but after the 14th Chasseur, with six sentry dogs, came in to hold this position, the enemy discontinued the practice. Toward the end of the war, the French also organized a pack and driving dog service, in which were utilized many big, powerful animals that were not qualified for other army work. This service comprised a certain number of sections, each of which consisted of about 150 dogs, selected for the size, build, and strength necessary to perform the work, with the requisite number of light cars, harnesses, and pack saddles. The dogs were trained through progressive marches until they had great endurance. The personnel was made up of about 30 men, including officers, drivers, orderlies for the men and dogs, harness makers to repair collars and harnesses, and a veterinary orderly to care for sick and wounded dogs. Only two of these sections were in active service when the armistice put an end to hostilities, but they had proved so valuable that other sections were being organized, and had the war continued, there is a good reason to believe that, in the French army at least, they would have been in general use. The harness dogs did much useful work in distributing equipment in large camps, in delivering mail, and in hauling supplies at the front. Wire fencing, barbed wire, stakes, sandbags, cement, ammunition, and food. One of the two sections was attached to the 11th Unmounted Cuirassiers, and for the month of July 1918, during which this regiment did heavy fighting at the front, formed a unique and very successful supply service. 
under shell and machine gun fire and through gas attacks the dogs with their twenty-eight drivers carried food and ammunition to the fighting men quick-moving intelligent and steady amid the noise and the strangeness of battle the colonel commanding the queer seers gave generous praise to dogs and drivers and admitted that without them he would probably have lost fifty supply men a number of the drivers were wounded and several of them won the croix de guerre by their gallantry lieutenant hautecloak who supervised the operations of this section had this to say about the work of the dogs the regiment was attacking with two battalions on line the third was supplied by means of mules the second battalion was served by pack dogs three squads each composed of four men in charge of a corporal and twenty-four dogs during the forward movement until the conquest of playmont wood all the ammunition was carried to the battalion by dogs the average load consisted of fifteen grenades or fifteen machine-gun belts per dog each dog made about six trips a day which means on certain days a supply of over four hundred loads of ammunition by dogs unfortunately the dogs had been somewhat tired out some were put out of service either through overwork or from marching through epirite smeared ground which resulted in sore feet making the dogs lame and quite unable to run only one died the dogs had been practically always without protection from the weather nevertheless outside of an easily understandable loss of weight their chief trouble has been with sore feet from Ipperite, and from work on pebbles and stones and among barbed wire nearly all of them can be returned after a few days nursing at the army kennel to which they have been evacuated few war dogs received special honors but pyram a ragged little mongrel who served with the french army in alsace was an exception Byram would never have been admitted to a bench show, but he had eyes that shone like bayonet tips, and what he didn't know about sentry duty wasn't known by any dog. The sector he happened to be working in was a particularly dangerous one and gave full scope to his genius. He took the liveliest interest in his work, and again and again, gave timely warnings of the approach of enemy patrols and thus prevented night attacks and probably the loss of many french lives in the spring of nineteen sixteen president poincare went to wesseling and reviewed the troops which were resting there as the fifteenth battalion swung past with the band leading and the war dogs close behind the president showed great interest in the canine warriors and later when the column was halted he went to see them as he walked among them with a kindly word or pat for each he asked about their records at last his eye fell upon a black tousle-coated but very wiry and alert little dog and as the sergeant led him forward eyes front and a serious look on his hairy face Monsieur Poincaré smiled and said, Well, mon ami, what have you done in the war? The sergeant saluted and proudly told of Pyram's deeds, whereupon the president asked an officer for a scout badge, which he fastened to the war dog's collar. Then he patted the tousled head, and Pyram, smiling and wagging his tail, trotted back to his position in the line. End of section 14. Section 15, British War Dogs, of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines, British War Dogs. When the war began, there was just one military dog in the British Army, an Airedale which had been trained for sentry duty by Mr. E. H. Richardson, who later, as Lieutenant Colonel Richardson, became Commandant of the British War Dog School. 
This Airedale went to France with the 2nd Battalion, Norfolk Regiment, and eventually was killed in action on the Aisne. Mr. Richardson, the foremost authority on dog training in Great Britain, had always been a believer in military dogs. He knew that several of the powers, including Holland, Sweden, Italy, Russia, and Bulgaria, had war dog schools, at least in an experimental stage, and that Germany had a thoroughly organized service of military and police dogs. Long before the war, and again at the opening of hostilities, he urged the use of dogs by the British Army, but failed at first, as Mengen did in France, to convince the War Department. So when hostilities broke out, England and France had practically no war dogs, while Germany, at an order signed by Ludendorff, was able at once to mobilize about 6,000 of these canine warriors. Eventually, both England and France were to be convinced. Conditions on many fronts created a real demand for dog power, and the trainers were able to show not only that demand was based on common sense, but that it could be adequately supplied. Officers at the front began to write to Richardson, requesting trained dogs for sentry, patrol, and messenger duty. He supplied these from his private kennels, and some of them did such fine work at Vimy Ridge and elsewhere that they attracted the attention of the authorities, and Richardson was ordered to the war office to discuss the question of supplying dogs, especially messenger dogs, to the army. The upshot of it was that a war dog school was established in Schuberness, and that Mr. Richardson was made a lieutenant colonel and put in charge of it. He was fortunate in having for his assistant Mrs. Richardson, whose love for dogs and whose gift for training them had much to do with the ultimate success of the British War Dog Service. The demand for dogs grew rapidly. At first, the supply could be filled from the Home for Lost Dogs at Battersea. Then, the dogs' homes in Birmingham, Liverpool, Bristol, and Manchester were called on for whatever suitable dogs they might collect, and later the Home Office ordered the police all over England, Scotland, and Wales to gather up the stray dogs of the usable breeds and send them to the school. Finally, all of these sources together failed to supply the needs of the War Dog School, and the War Office appealed to the public for gifts. And the response was what might have been expected from a people who do nothing by halves. Their country needed dogs, and she must have them, regardless alike of the money value and the love their masters bore them. In they came, and with them letters, some on crested paper, some soiled and well-nigh illegible but all showing that spirit of sacrifice which the English showed throughout the war. One lady wrote, I have given my husband and my sons, and now that he too is required, I give my dog. Said a little girl, We have let Daddy go to fight the Kaiser, and now we are sending Jack to do his bid. And one of the old contemptibles, who had lost a leg in the Mons, and who was otherwise disabled, wrote in a firm hand, I have not much that I can give my country, but I gladly send my dog to help. And of these dogs, Colonel Richardson says, many of them were fine show specimens, while others, of humble ancestry, came with wise faces and willing hearts. They were one and all welcome, and were made to feel so. The British dogs at the front were used chiefly as messengers, auxiliary sentries, and patrols. Many breeds and combinations of breeds passed through the war dog school, giving the commandant an interesting opportunity to observe their relative adaptability to the work required. Not all dogs of the necessary size were suitable for work requiring such a combination of very fine qualities. A messenger dog, for example, must have the courage to travel alone for miles under heavy bombardment, never allowing the inferno caused by bursting shells to take his mind from the route he is trying to follow. He must be resourceful enough to overcome whatever barriers may be encountered on his journey, swimming the rivers, leaping the fences, working his way through barbed wire entanglements. He must be intelligent enough to pass through villages and towns crowded with people and cattle and moving vehicles without becoming confused. He must have speed and endurance to enable him to make his trips quickly and without fail. And last and very importantly, he must be able to resist the temptations which so often beset his path in the shape of food and the kind words and caresses of the well-meaning but thoughtless people who seek to turn him from his purpose. I have seen, writes Colonel Richardson in his book British War Dogs, many amusing instances during the moral education of the dispatch carrier. On one occasion, a collie found a workman's dinner neatly done up in a cotton handkerchief under a hedge. He was nearing home and going along with a steady swing. 
The delightful scent of the repast was too much for his half-trained sense of honour, and he stopped to examine it. Feeling uneasy in his mind, however, he did not care to delay to eat it there, and seizing the bundle by the knot, bored away. He arrived at the training post with a curious expression which desired to convey the information that although he realized he had not acted in an absolutely straightforward manner, at all events, he had lost no time on the road. Collies averaged extremely well, and contrary to expectations, show collies were found to be as good as those of the working type. Greyhounds were seldom of any use, and never for more than a few short distances, but when crossed with other breeds, the resulting lurchers were often very good indeed. Airedales made a splendid record. These three, collies, lurchers, and Airedales, outnumbered all other breeds in the messenger service of the British Army. There were a good many sheepdogs, retrievers, Irish terriers, and spaniels, a few deerhounds, setters, Welsh terriers, and bull terriers, and a very few greyhounds, Eskimos, Dalmatians, Bedlingtons, pointers, bulldogs, and whippets. As might be guessed, the great majority of war dogs were not purebred. The fact that certain breeds were used in considerable numbers does not necessarily mean that these breeds were better than some of the others that were used in smaller numbers. Deerhounds were probably just as good as Airedales, and Welsh Terriers as good as Irish, but there were not as many of them available. Hounds as a class were not of much use for war duty, which required the animals to work independently of human allies. Their absorption in their natural work, the temptation to follow the scent of some wild creature that had crossed their path, was usually so great that even if it were possible for training to overcome it, the time required was better spent on breeds which had, shall we say, a broader outlook on life. Colonel Richardson's comments on some of the dogs, which he considered practically useless for military purposes, are both interesting and amusing. He says, Hounds are untrainable. I have succeeded in training one or two to carry messages short distances, but when the distance is above a mile, the hounds seem to lose interest. Poodles are too fond of play, and I found that any poodle cross seems to diminish a dog's capacity. Another curious fact seems to be noted that I have rarely found a dog with a gaily carried tail, which curled over its back or sideways to be of any value. This method of carrying the tail seems to indicate a level of character quite at variance with the serious duties required. Fox terriers were also found to be too frivolous for such serious work. Every dog received at the war school was given a chance to make good. His instructors were understanding and sympathetic, but long experience had taught them to sort out pretty quickly the dogs which simply had not the capacity to learn. These were returned to their owners if they had any. Dogs that were out-and-out -out slackers or conscientious objectors were given a short shrift and sent to the lethal chamber at Battersea. England expects every dog to do its duty. The war dog school at Schuberness was later removed to Lindenhurst in the New Forest, and there I visited Colonel Richardson and I had the privilege of seeing some hundreds of his canine pupils in camp. The school was established on high ground about a mile from the quaint little village, and as I approached I saw that it was guarded by a cordon of Great Danes, each of which was on a stout chain which ran freely along a horizontal bar of iron, perhaps a hundred feet in length. Each dog could approach his nearest neighbor on the right and left, near enough to prevent the most agile intruder from passing between, but still not quite near enough to enable the animals to fight when time hung heavily on their hands. Inside the cordon was the school proper, which covered several acres, part woodland, part open country, with groups of trees here and there. Most of the messenger and sentry dogs were in a large colony in the woodland. Each was chained to a separate wooden kennel, which bore the name of the occupant. Passed along on our tour of inspection, a smiling dog barked joyously and waved his tail at us from the top of every kennel. There were Tabs and Archer, Glen and Royal, all sheepdogs, Rupert, a black spaniel, Banjo, a Welsh terrier, Brick and Robin Hood, both lurchers, Benefit and Jupiter, Labrador retrievers, and many more. Very few of them were purebred. Not one of them would have stayed ten seconds in the judging ring of a dog show, but for real worth, most of them had held their own in any company. They had honest faces, and their eyes were kind and steady. They were intelligent, too, or they would not have been there. Every one of them had passed successfully through a period of probation, 
during which all fool dogs were weeded out and returned to their thankful but indignant owners. In the open fields, we found the watchdogs, retrievers, setters, Great Danes, deerhounds, and at least one gigantic Irish wolfhound. Their greeting was entirely different. I was a stranger and a very suspicious character, to say the least. They kept their eyes on me every moment and barked with a savage snarling bark, which made me glad to remember that they were securely chained. However, I wished to see for myself if this threat were partly bluff, or if they really meant it, so I got Colonel Richardson's reluctant permission to attempt to make friends with one of these four-footed watchmen. I strode boldly forward, smiling and speaking in tones which were meant to be kind but firm. The dog, a black retriever, did nothing but watch me until I was just within the radius of his chain. Then I stepped back suddenly as the brute hurled himself, a living thunderbolt, and a set of white and very willing teeth bit a chunk out of the air where my throat had been but a moment before. I simply cannot tell you how glad I was that the chain was not made of anything that stretched. Well, apart from all the others and under a group of large oak trees was a little colony of about a half a dozen extremely savage dogs, each one trained to guard an especially important point, and to see to it personally that an intruder was not permitted to commit any overt act. The commandant thoughtfully suggested that we'd better not attempt to go near them, because even if one chain should break, he doubted his ability to save me single-handed. There are times when one takes even wishes to take a suggestion as a command, and after my recent experience with a dog rated only as a medium savage, I had not even the faintest desire to disobey. Later, I was permitted to test the messenger dogs by sending messages for a mile or more in little leather and canvas wallets attached to their collars, and when I finally left the kennels, my letter thanking Colonel and Mrs. Richardson for their hospitality was carried to them by the small but speedy messenger dog, Banjo. One can get some idea of the value of good watchdogs as guardians of army property from the following letter sent to the commandant of the war dog school by a certain English major in charge of supplies at a well-known permanent camp. There are at present two St. Bernard dogs employed at the forge depot here. Could these be exchanged for two smaller dogs? They are at the supply depot a collie and a bobtailed sheepdog. They have been found most useful and cannot be spared, and if two dogs like them could be sent, a night watch of ten men could be dispensed with. Scarcely less convincing is another letter from a major on duty at one of the great ammunition dumps. I have the pleasure of informing you that the three guard dogs which have been used at H, M, and T have in each instance carried out their duties in a very satisfactory manner. By their use, it was possible to mount only a single guard at night instead of the double guard, as is usual in the case of guards for ammunition dumps. It was generally conceded that one good guard dog was equal to two good watchmen, that even this concession does not do full justice to the forefoots, at least in very many cases, is shown by scores of reports like the following written by an officer of the Northfield Artillery Station at West Beckham, Norfolk. The dog was posted outside the entrance of the main ammunition dump of the 223rd Mixed Brigade. The dog had a wonderful intelligence. He knew the footsteps of the patrol, and when hearing strange footsteps, he created a tremendous disturbance, thereby warning the occupants of the hut a few yards away from the dog's post. I had one man told off to care for the dog. The animal got used to him, and no other man dared go near him. In my opinion... Watchdogs are a great asset in the service, and I would like to see them fully utilized in a peacetime army. End of section British War Dogs, read by Aurora Biggs, San Antonio, October 1st, 2022. Section 16, Messenger Dogs of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines, Messenger Dogs. There were two principal objects in using messenger dogs. The first was to save the lives of runners by relieving them of the very hazardous work of carrying dispatches under fire. The second object was to ensure the quicker delivery of the dispatches, since under war conditions, dogs were found to run a given distance up to four or five miles in from one half to one third the time that a man required to cover it. At night, especially if it were very dark and stormy, the difference in favor of the dog was apt to be much greater than this. Pigeons were hardly 
be used at all after dark. So when the telephonic and telegraphic communication was interrupted, as was frequently the case in the area of actual combat, a well-trained messenger dog could often render invaluable service. Colonel Richardson told me of a brigade signal officer who gave orders that insofar as possible, all important dispatches were to be sent by dog. His confidence proved to be justified because on many occasions, the dog bore messages were the first to arrive with urgent orders or valuable information. Considering the risks which they had to run, the casualties among the dogs were extraordinarily low. They were not only less liable to be shot, but they were less susceptible to gas than human beings. The gas had, however, a certain amount of effect and a dog might be incapacitated or die after exposure to it. We hear of dogs themselves detecting gas waves and giving the alarm by showing uneasiness, and as it was not practicable for them to wear masks, every effort was made to protect them when the warning came. A messenger dog recruit at the British War Dog School had much to learn. He had to be trained to return to his keeper and to him only from any point to which he might have been led. This he was taught to do from increasing distances up to three or four miles by day and night and after gradually increased intervals of absence. These intervals, however, did not exceed 12 hours as it was found that after that the success of the return was uncertain. The country over which the dog had to travel was as varied as possible and its natural difficulties were increased by the construction of artificial obstacles, barbed wire entanglements, fences, and ditches. He had even to learn how to encounter and pass through smoke screens made from bundles of straw and harmless smoke bombs were exploded in his path. To accustom them to become indifferent to gunfire, the dogs had daily practice under rifle firing with one or two and then more rifles. They were then led to the batteries and stood under the 18-pounders and then the heavies, a trying test during which the candidates were diverted and entertained by being treated to coveted titbits. The dogs were on duty for 12 hours and were fed once in 24, viz. the close of their working day. The ration was one and one quarter pounds of food composed of three quarters of a pound of broken dog biscuit, or bread, and one half pound of horse flesh. To prepare the food, the meat was cut into small pieces and boiled. Then the meat and water in which it had been cooked were poured over the biscuits, which were allowed to soak for half an hour. An extra ration of maize meal was served once a week. When as often happened, especially near the front, it was impossible to provide the authorized rations, the keepers secured scraps from the battalion cook or from any other available source. The question of the keeper was the most important consideration in the whole messenger service. It was more important than the dogs themselves. The cleverest dog would amount to little if unintelligently handled, and men were carefully tested before being selected for the work. The training of messenger dogs, said Colonel Richardson, is so different from any and every other kind of dog work that practically everything a man has learned about dogs must be forgotten before he can qualify to be trained himself or to train others. Therefore, it was not always the men that had the most experience with dogs who were the best suited to the work. The whole training of a messenger dog was based on appeal, and complete confidence had to exist between the trainer and the dog. There could be no rough words and no rough handling. The dog had to be trained to take the keenest delight and interest in its work and to act on its own initiative, knowing what to do and how to do it under strange and unfamiliar circumstances and perhaps miles away from its keeper. Liaison dogs were not generally adopted in the British Army for a considerable time was necessary to train the dogs to go and to return, two keepers being required for each set of dogs, and at that period of the war, when the training of the dogs had at length been officially recognized, the question of manpower was already becoming serious. The procedure for the use of messenger dogs at the front was interesting, but fundamentally simple. The keeper brought up his three dogs to battalion headquarters. Here he remained while the dogs were taken forward by a soldier. During all the time they were absent from the keeper, they were given water but no food, and it was strictly against orders to pet or make much of them. When the time came for a message to be sent, the paper was placed in a tin cylinder fixed to the collar, and the dog was freed. Then away he went through the darkness or light, threw out shot and shell, straight to his master. Never was more than one dog slipped at the same time. A messenger dog in action was one of the sights that most impressed an Australian officer, who tells how he saw it coming from the direction of the front line trenches, a little Welsh terrier. The ground it was going over was in terrible condition and was absolutely waterlogged. The little creature was running along, 
hopping, jumping, plunging, and with the most obvious concentration of purpose. He could not imagine what it was doing until it came near and he saw the message carrier on its neck. As the dog sped past him, he noticed the earnest expression on its face. Often enough, the keepers who ran the dogs knew nothing of the contents of the message they bore. Officers were eagerly waiting for those messages, and unless a smile or scowl or a look of astonishment suggested the nature of the dispatch, usually the keeper was quite in the dark. Sometimes an officer, who was particularly human, would find time to delight a man by telling him that one of his dogs had rendered important service and by congratulating him on the management of his canine charges. We can imagine the pride of Keeper Buckingham, who was handling dogs for the 108th Brigade, when the Brigadier General sent for him and personally congratulated him. A battalion of the Inniskilling Fusiliers had been cut off by the enemy and were in danger of being wiped out. Their only hope lay in getting reinforcements, and these had arrived in time in response to a message sent by one of Buckingham's dogs, which happened to be on duty with the threatened battalion. A dog that would have received the VC if his keeper, Corporal Cool, could have given it was a black retriever cross named Dick, also serving in the villers Bretonneau sector. While carrying a message, he was badly wounded in the back and shoulder. He completed his run and then was sent to the section kennel, where a veterinary surgeon treated his wounds. They healed quickly and soon he was back in line and hard at work. A few days later, he went lame and was seen to be suffering. As he did not improve under treatment, he was given his long release. The post-mortem examination revealed a bullet lodged between the shoulder and the wall of his chest, and in the small of his back a shell splinter lying close to the spine. He had carried on as near the end as he was able to go. In the famous attack at Kimmel Hill, the messenger dogs did splendid work under almost impossible conditions. We find the names of Boxer and Airedale and Flash, a lurcher, both working with the 34th Division carrying dispatches over ground belly deep in mud. We read of Boxer going over the top with the Kents at daylight, of his being released with an important message at 5 a.m., of his coming back four miles in 25 minutes. The time doesn't seem fast until we consider the condition of the ground, or until we learn that two hours was the best that a man could do. And we read of Peter, known officially as number 78, and of Trusty, number 79, winning high praise from the officers for running fast and fearlessly day and night until a shell killed them both, together with the runner who was taking them to the front lines to await further orders. Official reports of matters at the front are often brief, but sometimes they are full of suggestions for those with sufficient imagination to read between the lines. Here is one with regards to dogs. These are most useful. In the right brigade, the first intimation received that the final objective was reached was brought back by a dog in 40 minutes. Dog 54 was shot by a German officer, who in turn was shot dead by an officer of the 6th Wiltshire Regiment. The dog was reported killed in error by the brigade, as it was subsequently turned up. In the left brigade, a message by a dog was received in 50 minutes, saying that the bluff had been captured, distance covered 6,000 yards. Another message came back, which was important to the division on our left. Some of the dogs had never been in the line before, and considering this, their work was good throughout. Many English messenger dogs did splendid work in France, but perhaps none performed more important service than Tweed, a bobtailed sheepdog. When he arrived at War Dog School, Tweed was mistaken for a dunce. He did not seem to be able to snap into the work and came very near being counted as a failure. Fortunately, he had to pass through the hands of Mrs. Richardson, who had discovered that it was not lack of ability, but extreme shyness that was holding him back. Gently and patiently, she gained his confidence and encouraged him until his fine character shone through his seeming dullness, and then under the skillful handling of his keeper, Private Reed, he developed into one of the most reliable messengers in the British Army. Tweed went on duty with the Scottish-Canadian Regiment at Ammons in 1918. The Germans broke clean through and cut off the British front line, and had they gone but a little further, probably would have captured the town. Three dogs were sent to the headquarters of the French colonials, three kilometers back, with a message. Send up reinforcements and small round ammunition. Tweed ran through the German barrage and arrived in ten minutes. The French were set up, straightened out of the lines, and saved Amans from the Germans. While this was undoubtedly Tweed's most important, it was by no means his only service. On one occasion, when a battalion of Australians had moved forward, and were in a tight position, they had great trouble with their messenger service. Their wires were destroyed, no runner could cross the open in daytime, and pigeons were not reliable at night. 
They sent for Tweed. They knew that he would go through at any time if it were caninely possible. He made three successful night runs for them, all important, and one of them very important. On this occasion, he was out with a patrol, which discovered that the enemy was planning a raid. A few minutes later, Tweed was speeding through the darkness with the message. The Germans are preparing for a raid, and that was one of the raids that didn't come off. Later, Tweed was detailed to serve with the Canadians at Passchendaele, and one night his battalion was ordered to move up and support the 3rd Division. The trenches were very wet, and Tweed did much for the comfort of the men when he carried back the simple message, moving forward tonight, send socks for men, and some SOS lights. What was said to be the most reliable British messenger dog in France was Little Jim, officially known as Number 36. Jim's parentage was most unusual, for he was a cross between a retriever and a Pomeranian. In color, he was as black as the Kaiser's heart, but we may surely be allowed to paraphrase our Kipling and add. But for all his dirty eyed, he was white, clear white inside, when he carried his dispatches under fire. Jim was no more afraid of the noise of bursting shells and the whine of machine gun bullets than he was of the skylarks, which were sometimes heard singing in the midst of the barrage. His speed, especially for a small dog and over rough ground, was said to be almost unbelievable. I asked a soldier who once had seen him coming from the front lines to headquarters to describe the scene for me. Why, said the man, there's nothing to describe. I didn't really see a dog at all. I saw a black streak across the shell-torn ground, and the men shouted, there goes little Jim. And in the very beginning, good luck had marked this flash of black lightning for its very own. The soldier said he never stopped anywhere long enough to be hit. However that may be, he never was hit, and he never was gassed. Another messenger dog, Blue Boy, was killed in his very first attempt. Whitefoot and Patty delivered their messages, but were so badly gassed that they had to spend three weeks in the hospital, and many of the human runners who attempted to get through were killed or badly wounded. But no matter how savage the shell fire or how heavy the gas barrage, little Jim got through somehow and always unhurt. He was in charge of Private Osborne, and we learn of the pride this man took in his dog from the last line of a report on Jim's work sent to Colonel Richardson. His worth is beyond value and his service is beyond praise, and I feel honored to take care of such a very serviceable animal. Poor Patty seemed to be a favorite of misfortune. He had hardly come out of the hospital when he was gassed again in the front lines, 17 kilometers from home. How he got back, no one will ever know, but his keeper, McLeod, found him lying in his kennel, totally blind. But he was a very long way from being dead, and eventually he recovered both his eyesight and his health. The last I heard of this dog, he had gone with the infantry almost to the top of Passchendaele Ridge, when an officer and a runner took him with them when they went to search a farmhouse. A German rushed out and shot the dog, which was left for dead. But he wasn't dead, not quite. For hours he lay there in the rain, but at last he regained consciousness. And though very weak from the loss of blood, he crawled back to brigade headquarters and reported. His keeper was sent for and he came. Whether he succeeded in once more restoring his dog to health, I never heard. But somehow, I like to bet on Patty and McLeod. End of section, Messenger Dogs, read by Aurora Biggs, section 16, San Antonio, October 1st, 2022. Section 17, French Messenger Dogs of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. French Messenger Dogs. The French divided their messenger dogs into two classes, estafettes, those trained to run with a message from one point to another, and liaison dogs, trained to do the same thing and then return, perhaps with an answer to the message to the place from which they started. The instruction of the estafette could be effected in about six weeks, but three months were required to turn out a good liaison dog. The training in both cases consisted chiefly of getting a dog to run from one man to another over greater and greater intervening distances as its education progressed. The French trainers worked each pupil about two hours a day, and a titbit was given when he left the starting point and another when he reached his destination. A good messenger dog would work between points three and a half or four miles apart, and an exceptionally good one would cover five miles or more. Canine messengers 
were often used to establish communication between the front lines and the nearest headquarters. A dog being so much smaller than a man was more likely to escape observation, and even when observed, his smaller size and greater speed made him a much more difficult mark. During one of the fiercest German attacks upon one of the strongholds surrounding Verdun, 17 human runners were killed in rapid succession, while one available liaison dog made several trips back and forth unscathed. To be sure, he was killed at last, but not until he had crowded a fine life's work into a few glorious hours. It was at Verdun also that Satan, one of the famous messenger dogs of the war, made his great run, which saved a town and its garrison. It was a very small town, but it occupied an extremely important position, and the garrison, consisting of several hundred French soldiers, had orders to hold on until they were relieved, and when the enemy succeeded in cutting them off from their friends in the rear, they fought on bravely. For days they had hindered the Germans' advance, answering the enemy batteries with a steady stream of shells. But now their ammunition was giving out, and there was no way of getting more, for the enemy was in possession of every road. Worst of all, the Germans had managed to plant a battery on the left in a position from which it could pour a deadly fire into the French town. Owing to the shortage of shells, only a weak reply could be made by the garrison. If the latter could only let the French army know the position of that battery, it might yet be silenced in time. But there was no way of letting it know. The telephone and telegraph wires had been cut, the last homing pigeons had been killed by a bursting shell, and every other means of communication was destroyed. With the French garrison was a famous dog trainer named Duval from the war school at Satare. He had been sent to the front with two dogs, Rip and Satan, both in the messenger service of the French army. Rip, a soft-eyed Irish terrier, was killed in action soon after his arrival, and Satan had been left with the French troops two miles in the rear of the now isolated town where his master was stationed. Satan was an ideal messenger dog, swift-limbed, intelligent, and absolutely fearless under fire. He was black as night, a mongrel by birth, but a thoroughbred by nature. His father was a champion English greyhound, and from him he inherited his speed. His mother was a working Scotch collie who had won more than one silver cup at the sheepdog trials in Scotland. Satan loved just one man in all the world, and that man was Duval. Together they had walked several times over the ground which now stretched between them, and Duval knew that if their friends in the rear had any message to send, Satan would bring it, if it could be brought. So every little while he would raise his head cautiously and look out over the shell-torn ground in hopes of seeing his dog. At last he started forward with a great cry, Voila! Satan! Satan! At first his companions could see nothing but a black speck moving towards them from the distance. But presently, the black speck took on the form of a dog, a black dog wearing a gas mask and skimming the earth as he came. As he raced over the rough ground and leapt the shell holes, some of the men declared that he was flying, that they even saw his wings. But the ground was fairly smoking under the enemy fire, and no one but Duval believed that even this great speed and courage would save him from his death. Perhaps they were right, for down he went as a German bullet found its mark. Duval saw him as he fell, and saw him stagger to his feet again, confused and faltering. Taking his own life in his hands, the man leapt to the top of the trench wall in full view of the enemy, and heedless of the bullets, which sang around him, he shouted at the top of his voice, Satan! Satan! Come on to me! For France! For... A bullet cut him down. But Satan had seen and heard, and with a frantic yelp of pain or joy no one could tell, one more he was in his stride. On three legs now, and with the fourth swinging loose at the hip, he moved swiftly towards the fort. As he swept into the town, a dozen hands caught him, and from a metal tube on his collar they took a message with dread. For God's sake, hold on. We'll send troops to relieve you tomorrow. It was signed by a well-known officer whose word could be relied on, and a cheer went up from the weary men. But how could they hold on? How was it possible with that German battery withering them with fire? But the metal tube containing the message was not all that Satan had brought them. What some of the men had mistaken for wings on his shoulders were two little baskets, and in each basket was a homing pigeon, scared almost to death. An officer took a message pad of tissue and wrote upon it, Silence the battery on our left. Then he added some figures showing the exact position of the battery. The message was folded and placed in a small aluminum capsule, and that was attached to the leg of a pigeon. A copy of the message was entrusted to the other bird, and both were tossed into the air. 
Away they went as if they knew the importance of their work, and the men in town watched them as they sped towards the French lines far away. Then a sound of German rifles cracked, and one of the little messengers fell earthward, with a mist of blue-gray feathers in the wake. But the other pigeon passed through the hail of bullets. But the other pigeon passed through the hail of bullets unhurt and flew straight to his loft, where an alert young officer caught him. The anxious men of the garrison did not see their message read, nor could they hear the sharp, terse orders given to the waiting gunners. But they heard the deep roar of the big French guns, which smothered with bursting shells the German battery on the left. And they knew that the town was saved. When the French army took the field in 1914, probably there were not a dozen liaison dogs in it, and even the few there were went out unknown to the Ministry of War and GHQ. The 17th Battalion of Alpine Chasseurs had six trained privately by Lieutenant Yor, and while they lasted, they proved very valuable, the more so since the fighting was mostly in open country, trench warfare not having been generally adopted. By January 15th, all six had fallen on the field of battle, and at that time it was impossible to replace them. Six months later, the trainers of the military kennel of the 7th Army, shortly after the arrival at the front, gave a most convincing exhibition of liaison work with two dogs trained before the war. General de Amau de Pondragin, commanding the 47th Division Infantry and some of his staff officers who saw the exhibition, were so impressed that a few days later, Sergeant Menjin, director of the kennel, received from General de Pondragin an order which read, Kindly supply the following. 1. Captain Watron of the 75th Outfit of the Artillery Regiment, Bischstein, with one liaison dog for the service between command headquarters of the outfit at Bischstein and the battery commander headquarters at Schmidmat. Commander Huet, Chief 62nd Battalion Chasseur at Solzen, with three sentry dogs and one liaison dog. Next day, Sergeant Menjin reported to Captain Watrin with a lithe, wide-awake bitch, a cross between Alsatian and Belgian shepherds. The dog's task was not an easy one, and she had to swim a river, race across a field that was under enemy fire, and climb a hill over 1,500 feet, 500 meters, in order to reach the post command, and then, after delivering her message, returned to the starting point. She made the trip in remarkably fast time, and a little later, when the telephone and telegraph services were destroyed and buried 20 centimeters deep by enemy fire, she carried through a message which resulted in the bombardment of a group of building outside Munster in which the Germans had established their staff headquarters. From this time forward, more and more messenger dogs were used by the French army, and they made good. During the terrific attacks of 1918 in Champagne, when General Gouraud skillfully withdrew the main body of the 4th Army, leaving small bodies of steady troops at strategic points to hold the Germans in check, Estafets and liaison dogs continually kept him informed of the enemy's movement and in touch with other events as fast as they developed. Several of the men handling these dogs were cited in dispatches and received decorations for heroic work. Messenger dogs did equally well on the Marne. Lieutenant Mallard, director of the 4th Army Kennels, sent to Monsieur Clemenceau, Minister of War, the following report of the work done by messenger dogs and their managers serving with the 5th Army during the engagement of July 18, 1918. Three of our dog managers of the 8th Infantry Division have been cited. On July 18th, the division was in fighting on the northern bank of the Marne, and in spite of heroic resistance, was compelled to fall back. Clap. <clears throat> the dog managers did not retreat until they had received and placed in the hands of the command the messages carried by their dogs, which had performed remarkable liaison service day and night under heavy fire without any preliminary reconnoitering of the terrain. The Minister of War caused a copy of the letter to be posted in every army kennel and the names of the dogs to be placed on a roll of honor. Two of the men cited had a thrilling experience. Their duties completed to the last detail, they took their dogs and fell back to rejoin the regiment, which had retreated to the other side of the Marne. The bridges had been destroyed and the river was under enemy fire. There was nothing to do but cross it. One of the men was a fine swimmer, and coupling his two dogs, he sprang into the water and called them to follow him, which they did. But the other man could barely swim and knew that he'd never make it alone. Nevertheless, he coupled his dogs and, entering the water with them, ordered them across. Away they went, and he after them, holding on to the leash, and slowly they carried him across until friendly hands seized him when he reached the bank. The painter, Mandunio, made this incident the subject of a picture which shows the poorless crossing the Marne with their dogs. 
Few messenger dogs showed finer spirit than one which served with the 11th unmounted cuirassiers during the Somme offensive in 1917. He had been captured from the Germans and nicknamed von Kluck. After a period of training during which he learned to take commands in French, he returned to the front to fight for France. Under savage machine gun and shell fire, he established liaison between one of the battalions in line with the colonel's headquarters. During one of his trips, a bomb burst close to him and he was thrown many feet in the air. For about 10 seconds, he lay where he fell, possibly stunned by the explosion, and then he got to his feet, gave himself a thorough shake, and finished his journey. Von Kluck met a soldier's death. One day, an officer was waiting for a message, and seeing the liaison dog taking things far too easy, impatiently called upon him to hurry. It did not occur to him that the messenger might be wounded until Von Kluck, instead of responding, slowed down to a stiff walk. A minute later, he crawled in with a message and died at the officer's feet. The value of messenger dogs, like the value of auxiliary sentry dogs, is attested on the highest authority. General Beauchot, who commanded the 163rd Division, was a thorough believer in them. He wrote, Dogs have rendered excellent service under fire and saved the lives of many human runners. The experiments in establishing a difficult liaison between infantry and supporting artillery have been entirely successful in a battle where the bombardment was extremely heavy. He added, This system is to be further developed and extended. Dog liaisons will be maintained between group commanders and remote observation posts and batteries. The chief of staff of the 132nd Infantry Division gives similar testimony concerning the messenger dogs used in the Battle of Champagne on July 15th and 16th, 1918, concluding with the advice that it is very urgent that dogs killed during fights be replaced at once. General Mordoc, when commanding the 24th Infantry Division, had occasion to use many liaison dogs and on June 30th, 1917, reported that several dogs had been killed while carrying messages to Verdun, Maisons de Champagne, and Abreville. They did remarkable work at Maisons de Champagne. Several times a day, under intense fire of heavy and poisonous shells, they traversed 1,500 meters in nine minutes' time. They enabled the colonel commanding an assault unit to keep contact with the division infantry. It was the same on all fronts where dogs were used. General Gobet, commanding the 25th Division, wrote at the end of 1917, the 98th Infantry Regiment still has two liaison dogs, which perform liaison at Avancourt through the heaviest barrages, and which during the fierce attack on Nassau brought messages from the attack battalion under heavy fire. Telephone connections and TSF outfit have been smashed up, and runners killed or wounded. I am a staunch supporter of this mode of liaison. A number of men connected with the dog service were cited for conspicuous bravery. This list is headed by Lieutenant Eugene Menjin, 19th Squadron Army Train, 50th Company, whose citation reads, Very courageous officer. His example greatly contributed to maintaining liaison dog services where no other means of liaison was available. His assistants, Privates Eugene Ray, Joseph Aldon, Pierre Gallon and Alexandre Corbet were also cited for their splendid work with liaison dogs. Nor were the dogs themselves forgotten. Many of those that had rendered exceptional service had their deeds recorded on their certificates of identification. Thus, we find Picard number 1289B on March 28, 1918, was particularly conspicuous during a coup de main, maintaining four runs over a distance of 3,000 meters in spite of rifle fire and heavy barrage. Follette, number 428B, fatally wounded in the Battle of the Somme while carrying messages under heavy fire, died at headquarters after completing her day's work. Medor, number 310B, very badly wounded August 27th during Somme battle while carrying messages under heavy fire, finished his trip and died two days later. Pasto, number 1163B, an infantry company attacked by a considerable German force in March 1918, was almost surrounded by a triple barrage, fire, prevented retreat. The commanding officer dispatched three runners, one after another, but all of them were killed. He then sent to the battalion commander this dog with a message telling of the critical position of his company. Pasteau recovered the 3,000 meters in about 11 minutes. Reinforcements were sent up in time to deliver 48 men, all that were left of the entire company. When we consider that in many of these fights, the barrage fire was supposed to be so heavy that no living thing could pass through it alive, we cannot wonder that so many of the messenger dogs were killed, that so many of the reports of them read like this one. 
from Lieutenant Gontail, officer in charge of liaisons to the 16th Infantry Regiment, to Lieutenant Maillard, Director of Army Kennel, 4th Army. By instructions from headquarters, I am forwarding to you four certificates of Estefes and Liaison dogs, Pompon, Rousseau, and Cré and Amand, which we have lost during the last severe fights from July 29th to August 12th. The dogs gave their utmost cooperation in this big affair. The dogs gave their utmost cooperation in this big affair, but out of ten, these four were either killed outright or so badly wounded they could not recover. End of section, French Messenger Dogs, read by Aurora Biggs, San Antonio, October 5th, 2022. Section 18 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Italian War Dogs. The Italian army used about 3,500 dogs, chiefly in the Alps, from Val Giuntacari, to the Adamello. Most of them were mongrels of the St. Bernard type, from the Franco-Italo-Swiss border. They were of large size, weighing from 125 to 150 pounds, usually white with reddish markings. The best of them had heavy coats which could withstand the cold at great heights. It was in the transport almost exclusively that these dogs were used, some in harness, others as pack animals. Those trained to harness were sometimes used in stoutly built carts, each laden with a great hogshead of water for the soldiers working on the military roads over the mountains. In the winter, they were hitched to sledges with loads of food or ammunition, weighing perhaps 250 pounds. Often a party of ski runners, camouflaged in snow-white uniforms, led the way, breaking out a path in which the dogs followed with their sledges the drivers walking each behind his own team. Every sledge had a step at the back on which the driver could mount when going over easy ground. There were also handles on which the driver could push to assist his team when the going was bad. But at times there were places where not even a sledge could go, where, on account of the steepness of the trail and the condition of the snow, not a mule nor even a donkey could deliver the needed supplies. Then the dogs were equipped with cloths, packs, saddles, laden with food, surgical dressings, mail, ammunition, or even light guns, and sentence squads of 30 or 32, usually in charge of a corporal, 
who is responsible for the health and general welfare of his animals. As each dog carried a load of about 60 pounds, it is seen that a squad of pack dogs would deliver about a ton of transport at every trip. They were so light compared with pack horses or mules or even donkeys that they could often travel on snow crust when the heavy animals would have broken through, and there were fume trails so steep that they could not scramble up. After their packs had been adjusted at a supply station, their driver gave the order, Avanti, and away they went, usually very gaily, because they were fresh and had been well fed. When the trail forked the simple order, a destra, or a sinestra, was enough to swing the squad to the right or to the left, as the case required. The driver would often call them by name, especially when the animals began to tire, or if they got into difficulties. Their names were often the names of mountains or of people, and at times a pass would ring with cries of Ortler, Vesuvio, Gina, and Tolina, accompanied by words of encouragement such as Forza, go on, Coraggio, courage, or in a case of a lame or wounded animal, Poverino, poor fellow. A good many dogs were lost, some through falling down crevasses, some from enemy shells and bullets. Others were wounded, and for these, hospitals were established at safe points. One such in Fermio Cani, being at an altitude of 3,000 feet. The soldiers were very fond of their canine allies, and when the dogs arrived at the peaks or ridges with loads, they were often cheered and patted and made a great deal of. Indeed, they were treated much like the men. Each dog was given exactly a soldier's rations, coffee and bread for breakfast, broth, meat, bread and water for lunch, and meat, bread, sugar, and chocolate for dinner at night. They were housed in special wooden huts, erected at points safe from bombardment. End of section 18. Section 19 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Belgian War Dogs. For centuries, dogs have been used as draft animals in many parts of Europe, notably in Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, and northern France. Attached to small, two-wheeled carts, they draw vegetables to market and deliver milk and light merchandise of all kinds to the houses in the cities. They were also used on the small farms for churning milk. A churn is attached to a small treadmill, and a dog trots up the revolving incline until the butter is made. As a rule, these animals are fairly well treated, and special laws have been enacted for their benefit. The little carts are nicely balanced on their axles, so that the weight of the load rests on the wheels and not on the shoulders of the dog. The Belgian police are instructed to stop any driver who is using a dog without proper harness, which should include a broad flat band for the chest, for it is by his chest that he pulls. Properly equipped and on a hard level road, a good draft dog can draw 500 pounds, and a pair can pull half a ton. It seems quite natural, then, that when the war broke out and when everything useful was being pressed into service, the Belgians did not overlook their staunch draft dogs. Among the first to use them after the Germans broke into the little country were the refugees, and on the roads it was no uncommon sight to see one of the dog carts laden with household furniture, and perhaps with children perched on top, being drawn out of the invaded territory by a broad-chested dog with a stub tail. Its owner, assisting by means of a chain or rope attached to the axle. At that time, there were only a few draft dogs in the army. Several of the machine gun companies had four each, but at the call to arms the government requisitioned all that were needed. A Belgian officer on duty at Antwerp, when the first lot of civilian dogs from that section were turned over to the army, told me what a pathetic sight it was. 
Dozens of men brought in their beloved pets and helpers, and in many cases the parting was very hard. They told the soldiers the names of the dogs, dwelt fondly on their peculiarities, especially what they liked best to eat, and exacted promises that they would be kindly treated and brought back to them when the war was over. Their work in the army consisted in drawing light running, two-wheeled machine gun carriages with a Maxim gun mounted in each, or ammunition carts to supply these guns, or water carts to carry drinking water to the gunners. Because the dogs were already broken to harness, their military training was usually quite easy. They quickly learned en avant, forward march, and when the command halt was given, the soldiers caught and held the cart to show the dogs that it meant to stop. At the command, coucher, the men laid hands on the dogs' backs and pressed until they lay down. And at the order, de boot, the animals were pulled to their feet. The work of training was speeded up by harnessing a recruit with an old machine dog who knew and obeyed every military order promptly. When the guns went into action, the work of the dogs was often dangerous but usually simple. An officer ran forward and selected the gun position, and at a signal, the dogs leaped in their harness and carried the gun to him at full gallop. The gun crew lifted the gun, tripod and all, out of the cart, and set it on the firing line, while one man swung the dogs around and ran them back with the empty cart to the nearest available shelter. Twelve companies of dog-drawn machine guns were used in the Belgian army during the war, and approximately 500 dogs were drafted to draw these guns in the ammunition wagons and water carts, which accompanied them. They were nearly always at the front and did splendid service. They took part in the battles of Liège and Namur, were in action close to Antwerp and Louvain and assisted in the capture of 500 prisoners at Ayrshot. A good many gun dogs were killed in action, and many more were wounded. Well behind the lines, there was established what might be termed a dog remount depot, where fresh dogs could be obtained as needed. In connection with this, there was a dog hospital, where sick and wounded animals received medical and surgical attention. When campaigning, the dogs were fed once a day and watered three times a day, sometimes oftener when the weather was warm and opportunities frequent. In winter, they often slept across the legs of the gunners for mutual warmth. Every morning, they were groomed with curry combs and brushes, and now and then they were given a bath, usually without soap. When, on the march, they came to a river or creek, if there was time, the dogs were permitted to refresh themselves by taking a swim. A section of the machine gun company, including ten dogs, with their guns and carriages, ammunition and water carts, came over to this country in charge of Lieutenant Joseph Shepherds of the 7th Regiment, Belgian Army. After a rough voyage, during which the dogs were very seasick, they landed here in good condition and made a tour of the principal cities to take part in some victory loan parades. There must be many who still remember Max and Bernard, Baron and Bambula and their fellows, those steady-eyed, four-footed warriors who strode through the streets with a modest dignity which befitted veterans who had fought for the right. They were feasted and honored throughout their stay and were almost as popular as the handsome young officer who brought them over. The latter entered into the spirit of the parades of which he and his dogs were a feature wherever they went. On one occasion in St. Louis, when Bambula barked sharply at a young woman who was trying to pat him, she jumped back and said to Lieutenant Shepherds, Why did he do that? He said, Buy a bond, mademoiselle, answered the Belgian officer smiling, and the girl, being a good sport, laughed and bought one. End of section 19 Section 20 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines Guarding War Prisoners In November 1916, a report was submitted to the General Inspector of War Prisons, suggesting that inasmuch as the germans were using trained dogs to guard their war prison camps a similar dog service might be valuable in the french prison camps the answer was that having sent an official protest to the german government against such use of war dogs the war ministry could not sanction that practice in its own army nevertheless there was nothing to prevent an unofficial trial at least and a dozen dogs were sent to dijon to help guard the german prisoners in the fortresses in that vicinity the results were entirely satisfactory but no further trials were made until nineteen eighteen when the general inspector of war prisons asked to be supplied with canine assistance to supplement the greatly reduced guard personnel then many prison camps were provided with dogs to discourage escapes to track prisoners if they succeeded in getting away and to hold up german aviators who might purposely or accidentally alight behind the french lines trustworthy reports show how well these dogs performed their duties at a prison camp for non-commissioned officers at st martial in september nineteen eighteen the prisoners were being taken for a walk when an austrian under the pretense of picking wild flowers lagged behind and attempted to escape a guard dog caporal known officially as b fifteen twenty six went after him without instructions bit him in the thigh and literally drove him back into the column on another occasion at the same camp four non-coms attempted to escape by cutting the barbed wire fence three of them were captured by sentries but the fourth got away caporal was put on his trail caught him just as he was entering some dense woodland and held him by the calf of the leg until sentries arrived two very good dogs were put on duty at the frontier station at Bilgard, where quite frequently prisoners escaped by hiding in swiss supply trains they were put in charge of two customs officers who before the war had used dogs for capturing smugglers along the northern border of france one of these men wrote to the trainer only a day or two after the arrival of the dogs Tsikhov made himself known the first night he was on duty september fourth fifth by discovering two bosch who had concealed themselves in a flour wagon only in my opinion he did not bite them enough they were sorry-looking objects these and many other records tend to show that dogs did their duty behind the lines as well as at the front End of section twenty section twenty one of animal heroes by ernest baines this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org animal heroes by ernest baines the war blind in france there is nothing in the annals of the war dogs more touching than the service which some of them have given as guides to ex-soldiers who lost their sight while performing their duty 
not very many dogs rendered this service largely because of the feeling that a blind man led by a dog must necessarily appear to be an object of charity there is some ground for this feeling at least in the city where it might be difficult to distinguish at a glance a sightless soldier from a blind beggar but in the country and in small towns and villages where a man is known to all his neighbors surely this objection does not hold and in such places may be found not a few whose fields of activity have been greatly widened by accepting the services of well-trained dogs some of these animals were drawn from the ranks of those too small to serve in other capacities others were dogs which had served at the front and come back in some cases badly wounded to recover and to take special training for a more peaceful occupation that he may lead his master safely a blind man's dog is taught that he must never cross a road if he sees or hears a vehicle approaching and never descend a steep path without stopping for a moment by way of warning if there is a stone heap or other obstacle in the path he must tug on his lead while still some distance away and conduct his master around it furthermore he must never pass under fence rails and such like barriers because his master cannot follow this seems a good deal for a dog to learn yet the training occupied only two months at the outside very intelligent dogs were letter perfect in six weeks when a blind man applied to the war dog service for a canine companion the latter was delivered to him by a trainer who usually stayed for a day or two until the dog and his new master had become acquainted and until the former had learned all the routes on which he would be expected to travel he was taught to stop at the houses of special friends at the shops where his master dealt and at the office where the ex-soldier would have to collect his pension in selecting dogs for this work some attention was paid to special requirements for example a blind officer in charge of an important farming enterprise in morocco was supplied with a fine sheep dog which had been wounded while serving on patrol duty at the front this companion having had a broad education would not only guide his sightless master but if necessary defend him from attack one letter addressed by a blind man to the head of the war dog service will suffice to show how such dogs were appreciated londeville january second nineteen nineteen dear sir i have the pleasure to inform you that on december twenty fourth i received the little dog i asked for he was brought by m georges marie herve first class trainer at plessis trevis who has taught me how to handle him and given me all sorts of useful information concerning the matter i am very pleased with the little dog he is well trained and intelligent and will be very useful his name is macabre from paris number seventeen twenty seven a i have been out several times with him and he has behaved splendidly every time yesterday for instance i went more than a kilometre away from home and he brought me back without accident this gives me a feeling of independence please accept sir my best thanks and the expression of my deep gratitude and appreciation yours respectfully Epon raphael 
chair and basket weaver, Landreville Vendée. After the signing of the armistice, the following letter was addressed by the Marshal of France, Commander-in-Chief of the French Armies, to Monsieur Clemenceau, Prime Minister, Minister of War. G.H.Q. French Armies Staff First Bureau Organization Number 7414 The Marshal of France Commander-in-Chief of the French Armies in the East To the Minister of War War dogs are about to leave the army in which they have rendered distinguished services particularly in liaisons and supply services. The credit for the good results achieved belongs for the greater part to Commandant Malric and his assistant, Lieutenant Mignin, to whom I would appreciate your forwarding some acknowledgement of our satisfaction. By order, Major General Boos, the General Chief of the Military Staff, is happy to join his personal congratulations to those of the Marshal of France, Commander-in-Chief of the French Armies of the East, for the efforts accomplished and the results achieved by Lieutenant Menning, for the Prime Minister, Minister of War, and by order, General, Chief of Staff, signed, Mordac. Lieutenant Maining adds, Good dogs, brave dogs, you well deserve such praise. You did more than your duty. Thank you. End of section 21. Section 22 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by April 6090. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Pigeons. Try to imagine yourself clinging to the half-submerged wreck of a seaplane out in the North Sea, 20 miles from shore, wet to the skin, chilled to the bone, and desperately weary. Hours before, you have released a homing pigeon with a message calling for help, and you hate to admit how little faith you have in its reaching its loft at all. Against that wind and rain, let alone in time, to be of any use to you. Yet you know it is your only chance. Night is coming on, and if that bird has not reached its home, your name will be published in the next casualty list. Then, as your hope is, dying, and you are trying to behave as brave men should, a lean greyhound of a destroyer comes racing up out of the fog. As you are taken aboard to warmth and dry clothes and food, to life and all that life holds dear, you are told that the destroyer had been sent in response to a message brought by the little homing pigeon, which fell dead from exhaustion as it entered the trap. You'll have something new to think about. You may not have much sentiment. You may not be interested in bird conservation. But it's pretty certain that unless the North Sea has washed all the decency out of you, you'll walk a long way to vote against live pigeon shooting the very next chance you get. As may be supposed, the pigeon used as a war messenger was not the ordinary variety commonly seen on the barns in country places, but a special breed which originated in Belgium and which has developed chiefly in Liege, Verviers, Brussels, and Antwerp. It is the only pigeon capable of homing from very long distances. Although during the war, and at other times, it had been referred to as the carrier pigeon, the carrier is an entirely different breed, which long ago came from Baghdad, and which in the early days of pigeon racing in England was used for short-distance flights up to 100 miles. The homing pigeon was used by the French with great effect during the Siege of Paris, 1870-1871, and soon thereafter the English fanciers got in touch with Belgium, and the homer at once replaced the birds then used for racing purposes, the carrier, the horseman, and a cross between these two known as the dragoon, because of use to which it is put in peace times, 
it is now generally spoken of among english pigeon flyers as the racing pigeon the french and belgians call it pigeon voyageur and the italians colombo viaggiatore the marvelous homing instinct of these birds known also as the instinct of orientation has been the subject of many study and contradictory explanation it is now however coming to be generally regarded not as a special mysterious unchanging instinct but as a combination of certain very acute faculties attention observation memory will and the sense of direction each of which is capable of great development and modification through education and the constant stimulation of desires the intensive training and study to which these wonderful birds were submitted during the war showed how much there is yet to be learned concerning them they are extremely sensitive and their powers are by no means equal it is probable that this great sensitiveness enables the bird to perceive magnetic and atmospheric impressions and to determine the direction of the loft either at the time of departure or when during flight he may have lost his way owing to unexpected variations in the weather as is the case with the training of all animals it is the men that have these delicate organisms in their care and the necessary intelligence firmness patience and love who are responsible for their development their usefulness and their success racing pigeons by reason of this strong desire to return to their homes their splendid powers of flight they have been known to fly fifteen continuous hours and their remarkable memory for places may be trained to fly great distances to definite points viz the points at which their lofts have are stationed many pigeons have flown five hundred miles some have records of seven hundred to eight hundred miles and a very few have actually come back a thousand miles or more but such birds are the best athletes of their breed and their performances are usually made under the most favorable conditions which can be arranged for them they are trained almost to the day they are handled throughout by men who have expert knowledge of every detail of the game and the weather selected is often such as to give the birds every advantage of wind and visibility even thus favored the very best of them could not be relied upon to cover these very long distances with speed and regularity there would always be a doubt as to their return a greater doubt as to their prompt return in war especially at critical moments doubt as to the prompt delivery of important messages must be reduced to the minimum for obvious reasons it was not possible to give the birds the very careful skillful handling they received for racing in time of peace it was not possible to select the weather in which they should fly because battles are fought in fog and rain as well as on pleasant days but fortunately it was possible as a rule so to regulate the distances to be flown as to make these splendid birds almost infallible in any weather and under the most trying conditions the question of good communication is one of the most important in modern warfare especially during actual fighting the vast number of men engaged the wide territory over which they are distributed the interdependence of artillery infantry cavalry tanks air forces and other branches of the service and especially the distances which often separate the fighters from the men who are directing the fighting make it imperative that commanding officers be kept informed of what is going on at the many points involved the shells of a particular battery are not finding their mark the observation officer far ahead of the guns must notify the gunners in order that the aim may be corrected a certain part of the line is weak and needs reinforcements that information must be sent to some officer having power to send up the relief a battalion has advanced too far and has been cut off by the enemy it can be saved only if troops are sent forward promptly to save it so the fate of the battalion depends upon the ability of its commander to communicate quickly with someone having the reserve troops and the authority to send them in in short the winning of a great battle may depend upon a single message reaching its destination on time so very important then was a reliable system of communication that no stone was left unturned to make it complete and effective many were the agencies employed among them were the telephone ground and wireless telegraph signal lanterns luminous signals messenger dogs mounted couriers runners scout detachments and aviators 
each one of these was useful each had its special advantages but there were times and places when a single homing pigeon flying a mile a minute and knowing exactly where it was going was worth all of them put together that at least one of the allies regarded pigeons as by far the most reliable messengers which could be employed during attack is evidenced by a certain french army report which at the time it was written was considered confidential the writer after enumerating the disadvantages of several other means of communication concludes as follows pigeons only can work regularly and in spite of bombardment dust smoke or fog can bring accurate details concerning the situation of the troops in action within a relatively short space of time liaison by pigeons has rendered inestimable services ever since the beginning of the battle of verdun it has won the approbation of the high command and line officers and its regular adoption is advisable it is difficult indeed for those outside the fancy to realize what an almost inexhaustible supply of these messengers the several war departments had to draw on until it is learned for instance that in england alone at least two million racing pigeons old and young are put in training every year notwithstanding however this widespread interest throughout the country the outbreak of the war found the british without official pigeon service wireless telegraphy having come it had seemed to the authorities that the days of bird messengers must be passed events however proved them to be wrong and in november nineteen fourteen admiralty decided to reorganize the service and a call went out for birds and for trainers which was met at once by an enthusiastic response from the fanciers throughout the kingdom of these fanciers one of the most interesting personalities is lieutenant colonel a h osman o b e director of the british pigeon service during the war whose belief in the pigeons and the possibilities of their usefulness was as great as colonel richardson's devotion to the dogs and what they might be trained to accomplish it was my privilege to meet colonel osman when in england and from him i learned something of the early days of pigeon racing and something too of the sacrifices he had made for the sake of keeping and training his birds pigeon racing when he was a lad was regarded as a low-grade sport and by persisting in following it the boy came to be regarded as the black sheep of the family his father even going so far in his opposition as to cut him off without mention in his will but for some reason he kept to his pigeons studying every book in english and french on the subject that he could find believing that there might come a day when they might prove useful to his country but i was always satisfied colonel osmond said that it would be possible to get results for naval and military work with pigeons if the pigeons were handled by naval and military people who had no love for training birds and animals i was so convinced of this that when in the autumn of nineteen fourteen the naval authorities started their lofts i said that on the methods adopted they must be a failure and to convince them i asked them to place a destroyer at my disposal to carry out some experiments from the sea they declined my suggestion so i hired some first-class tugs and carried out demonstrations by which i proved that the only possible method was to have expert breeders and trainers and to have the lofts at as short distances as possible apart since it would be necessary for the birds to fly the shortest possible distances so the first british official pigeon service of the war was a volunteer service and was established to bring in information from trawlers drifters and other auxiliary craft not fitted with wireless the birds were housed in private lofts within the vicinity of naval depots and air stations and many important messages were brought in by this means the telegrams were taken by the owners to the nearest telegraph office and were there dispatched urgent priority to the admiralty and the nearest naval station but in such situations as arose when every moment was of importance it was soon decided that this method was much too laborious and that lofts should be established at all air stations operating over the sea in connection with these early experimental days 
an amusing story is told of a skipper of a small craft to whom we were entrusted some of the first pigeons sent out for service the skipper had not been told on what occasions he was to use the birds and it worried him having been supplied by the great admiralty they must be used for something but what for two days and nights he wondered and worried and then he called for a pad and pencil and wrote after much anxious thought and several false starts a message awkwardly he attached it to one of the birds tossed the little courier into the air and greatly relieved watched it wing its way towards the land in due time the naval center received the following information all's well just having dinner beef puddings beef puddings that skipper was called ever after at the base which he served it was soon recognized that pigeons might be of great service on seaplanes as when these were forced to land on the water the wireless automatically passed out of action the pilot and observer were left without means of communicating their situation to their base but before the birds could be employed to any extent special methods of training had to be adopted to fit them for their work and to train a pigeon to home from the sea is a very difficult and as one writer said a heartbreaking process after being taught the surroundings of the loft they had to be taught to home from gradually increased distances over the water and many a bird which gave promise was lost during these preliminary tests but difficult as was this work it was generally so well done that only three per cent of the birds trained to messages failed to home when it is realized that many of these birds were liberated in the worst of weather during fog rain wind and thunderstorms conditions under which it would have been thought impossible for them to find their way such a record is extraordinary another and lesser obstacle to be met was that of overcoming the prejudice of the pilots who would not at first take the matter seriously but after a machine had been shot down and the pigeon message had resulted in help being sent it was a different story still another problem was that of finding accommodation for the birds in the cockpit of the plane for two birds at least were always sent out when the distance to be traveled was over thirty miles this problem was solved by the installation of a box designed to rest upon the float of the machine and so constructed that the pigeons and everything necessary for sending a message could be contained in it while these and other questions were being met and solved by the admiralty the british army was coming to recognize the importance of the pigeons as auxiliary messengers birds and their trainers were being shipped across the channel lofts were being designed for their transportation but here i quote from major w h osmond son of colonel osmond it must be admitted that our french allies were much more enterprising than we were in the use of pigeons we had some of the finest birds in the world indeed the head of the french pigeon service told me he considered the british racing pigeon the finest in the world our personnel who had the birds in charge was composed of men who had been pigeon fanciers in civil life and who were quite equal to the men of the french service yet our authorities could not be persuaded for some time to think the service of importance of course wherever telephone and telegraph systems were in perfect working order communication over any distance was assured and no other means were required but there were many important points at which it was not practical to install instruments and many others where it was not possible to maintain them in working order such conditions almost always prevailed in the zone of attack and it was here that pigeons rendered some of their finest service in this zone telephonic and telegraphic communication were almost always interrupted if not actually destroyed human runners were comparatively slow at best and were usually delayed by barrage fire and the bad state of the ground visual signals were partly or wholly obscured by smoke and dust and even aerial observation was often suspended owing to the unfavorable weather or distance from the objective it was under such conditions that pigeons and dogs were sometimes the only reliable means of communication and of these pigeons had many advantages smaller and faster and flying high above the earth a pigeon was not hampered by mud or shell ploughed ground and he offered an extremely difficult mark for the enemy 
Moreover, he could cover any distance required, while few dogs were reliable for more than four miles. One of the most important duties of the pigeons was to carry messages back from the front through the dangerous zone of attack, either directly to the officers to whom they were addressed or to points of safety where other means of communication, such as telephones, were sure to be working regularly. Such points were nearly always comparatively near the front, that is to say, from 8 to 60 miles away, and such distances for birds capable of covering four or five hundred miles were little more than practice spins. Barring serious accidents, they could reach their lofts as surely and regularly as a good athlete might walk down to the corner to catch a car or to collect his mail. Consequently, the pigeon messenger service was reduced to a practical certainty. In the Battle of the Somme, the French used over 5,000 pigeons, and only 2% of the birds released with messages failed to return. This in spite of the worst a resourceful enemy could do to prevent them. And even this loss does not necessarily imply that the information carried by these pigeons was not received. In the case of an important message, it was usual to send a copy by another pigeon. Sometimes two or more copies were sent by as many birds. When pigeons were scarce, the copy might be sent by the bird carrying the next message. Messages were attached to the birds in various ways. The commonest, and perhaps the best, was by means of a pair of small aluminum tubes, which fitted snugly, one into the other, like sections of a telescope, forming a capsule or cylinder closed at both ends. The tube having the slightly larger diameter was fastened by metal bands, mouth upwards, to the leg of the pigeon. The smaller one containing the message was then pushed into the larger mouth downward. The Italians sometimes used a very small chamois leather envelope, which after receiving the message was buttoned around the leg of the bird. In emergencies, the message was simply wrapped around the pigeon's leg and secured by two ordinary rubber bands. Where unusually long messages, sketches or maps, were sent, they were put in a light cloth knapsack made to fit the rounded breast of the bird, and held in position by elastic bands, which circled the body, crossing on the back. Sometimes as much as 15 feet of moving picture film, negative, was carried by a pigeon in this way. The homes to which the birds returned were either more or less permanent structures at important centers well in the rear, or mobile pigeon lofts, which followed the movements of the fighting forces to supply them with the birds they needed and to receive the messages brought back from points at the front. When a mobile loft was moved to a new position, the birds were given a few days' preliminary training before being entrusted with important messages. That pigeons could be trained to home to these mobile lofts is one of the surprising and interesting evidences of their adaptability, which their war training brought out. For distances up to 50 or 60 miles, they were practically infallible, as is shown by the fact that about 95% of all the messages entrusted to the British pigeons during the war were safely delivered. Nothing like the astonishing distances which they have been proved capable of doing was ever required of them on war duty. If a pigeon was released in good condition, failure to return to the loft was usually due to death from poison gas or the enemy fire. But so long as the wings were not badly injured, it was a desperate wound indeed that prevented a homing pigeon from delivering his message. The loss of a leg or an eye was quite a common occurrence, and such an injury in itself was not enough to prevent the bird from finishing the task it had been set to do. In our own American army, there were several pigeons who distinguished themselves by delivering messages in spite of terrible wounds. Probably the best of them all is Cherami, the black checker cock, which delivered 12 important messages on the Verdun front, and at last lost a leg in the Argonne. His story has been often told, but it can bear repeating often. The little courier was hit by a bullet just as he was leaving Grand Pre. The boys in the trenches saw him stagger and shouted, He's done for! and watched to see where he would fall. But he didn't. For a few seconds he fluttered helplessly about. Then, gathering himself together, he went on through the hail of shrapnel and machine-gun fire and was out of sight. 
there is no one who can tell of what Cher Ami passed through on that wonderful, that terrible flight over the hills to his home. But suddenly, above his loft at Ramont, he appears again. He drops from the sky like a rocket, striking the loft. Breast first, he staggers, sways from side to side, and then, hopping on one bloody leg, he makes for the entrance, landing board, where he is received by his trainer. The tube bearing the message was hanging by the ligaments of the leg that had been shot through. There was a hole through the breastbone, made by the same bullet. But for all that, Cherami had covered his 25 miles in as many minutes. The American Pigeon Service as a whole gave an excellent account of itself, often under the most trying circumstances during the months our army was in the field at first our troops were occupying sectors under french high command and were furnished with birds from french lofts as also indeed in many cases later on when the american lofts that had been established were moved suddenly into new sectors it was in august 1917 that the first detachment for our own pigeon service came over two officers and twelve soldiers selected from among the most prominent of American racing, pigeon fanciers, bringing with them 2,350 of our best racing pigeons. This detachment was followed by others and others until at the date of the armistice, the first Army Pigeon Service was credited with nine officers, 324 soldiers, 6,000 pigeons, and 50 mobile lofts. Among American aviators, little use was made of the pigeons, and this for various reasons. Perhaps the most pertinent being that while officers were busy with their machines in the air, they could not write a message, attach it to the messenger, and liberate it, without danger to themselves. Another reason given was that with their wireless they could reach any desired point, without in any way lessening the control of their machine. Many of the officers, however, took a great interest in the birds, and some interesting experiments were carried out at one of the American aviator schools, where birds were released at very high altitudes, some homing from as high as 6,000 feet. Every bird sent out, in fact, returned excepting one, released at 8,000 feet, and this failure was believed to be due to some accident. But the tanks used the pigeons continuously. These ironclads, were unable, excepting at rare intervals, while advancing, to make use of any means of communication other than the birds, and so these became indispensable to them. A famous tanker was the handsome Lord Adelaide. Twice he made his way safely through a hail of bullets. On his third and last journey he was struck. But Lord Adelaide came of proud stock, weak, covered with blood. He went on, and delivered his message. A big blue bird, known as President Wilson, also did remarkable work for the tanks. Later in the Argonne, with one leg shot away, he flew the distance of twelve and one-half miles in twenty-one minutes, through heavy rain and fog. Today he may be seen in the Hall of Honor of the American Pigeon Service. During the autumn of 1918, when the American troops were in action, there was much rain and fog, the worst possible weather for pigeon messengers. Often, too, the birds had to be kept in the trenches without proper shelter and without proper intervals for rest. At St. Mihiel, 576 birds were used. On the Meuse Argonne, 403 messages, many of them containing information of the greatest importance, were delivered when we realize that the greater part of these messages were entrusted to their bearers only after all other means of communication had failed we may gain some idea of their value. Those were momentous months for the world, and there must have been many times when the lives of men and great decisions hung upon the wings of a racing homer. Many pigeons made gallant records for valor and speed, and gave of their uttermost. Take the Pouilly. A messenger was needed to carry important information concerning the location of an enemy ammunition train. Which bird should be chosen for the work? La Pouilly. He had already been through St. Mihiel's with the tanks and proved his mettle. He'll do all that is asked of him, his trainer said proudly. And, the story goes on, La Palou did that and more, with the flesh and feathers on his neck hanging in ribbons and reeling like a drunken man. La Palou fulfilled his mission. Kajaboy, known to his trainer as 
the little streak. Though frightfully wounded and in a state of complete exhaustion, also performed the work given him to do. Another American bird, the mocker, arrived with one eye destroyed, possibly by shrapnel. And then there was Lady Jane, who, badly gassed, still was able to make her loft. These birds, terribly injured as they were, all recovered, but there were numbers of instances in which pigeons showed the limit of endurance by using up the very last ounce of their strength to complete their distance, dying as they delivered their message. Perhaps there is no finer example of the valor of these birds and their determination to reach their homes than is shown by the one who is known on the British records as number 2,709. This pigeon was with the British troops during the action, which was fought in the region of Menin Road on the 3rd of October, 1917. She was dispatched with a message from the front line to divisional headquarters, nine miles away, early in the afternoon. How far on her way she had gone when she was hit by a bullet which broke one of her legs and drove the message carrier into her body, we do not know. Hours passed, night came on, and the rain. And when number 2,709 did not return to her loft, she was given up for lost. But she was not lost. She was not dead. It was not time to die yet. Somewhere she had lain out in the wet all night, and in the gray of the morning, with plumage wet and bloody, she staggered into the loft and died before the officer on duty could read the message she had brought. Number 2,709 is known as the V.C. Pigeon now, and her little mounted figure is to be seen in London in the United Service Museum, not far from the cenotaph of the unknown soldier. The pigeons, by reason of their beauty, their abandon, and often brilliant and dramatic performances, made a strong appeal to the French imagination. The French used in all about 30,000, and the birds that performed distinguished service or showed unusual gallantry in the line of duty, were rewarded the quad de guerre or the quoi militaire. Diplomas with the citations were issued and kept at the headquarters of the French pigeon service. And because pigeons cannot wear medals on their breasts, special bands with the colors of the decorations were made for their legs. When commandment Raynal was surrounded at Vaux, there were times when pigeons were his only means of communication with Verdun. His last bird, but one flew in through a terrible enemy fire and received the Croix de Guerre. His last pigeon, badly mangled, dropped dead as he delivered his message. He was rewarded the Légion John Air and a diploma, framed in the colors of the decoration, and bearing a brief and dignified citation, was hung at headquarters in Chantilly. Pigeons were also used to affect the communication between aviators, or balloonists, and the ground. Such men often made observations which they wished to report without descending, and pigeons could be released at almost any height, and from machines going at even 100 miles an hour, if the aviators were familiar with the proper methods of handling the birds. As a matter of fact, it was usually possible to slow down the machine for two or three seconds, which permitted the little messenger to escape in safety. A pigeon released in this way did not continue to fly at a great altitude, but would make a rapid stepping descent until it reached its usual flying height, 300 to 500 feet, when it would circle and then take a direct line for its loft. It is a well-known fact that comparatively few airmen were expert wireless operators, and during a prolonged reconnaissance, it was sometimes found wise to verify important messages by sending copies of them by pigeon post. During seven months of the year 1916, one military loft in France received 24 pigeon messages from airplanes which had been captured or which had met with disaster of some kind. These messages contained the last observations or told the fate of between 40 and 50 airmen. Spies often used pigeons because they afforded an almost certain means of communication with the minimum of risk. Birds could be carried in the pocket and could be hidden or destroyed if there were danger of detection. Pigeons carried by spies were sometimes provided with cloth hoods, which covered the head, with the exception of the bill, which protruded through an opening provided for it. Thus blinded, a bird would not attempt to fly, but would remain standing or lying wherever it was placed. A spy could thus drop a pigeon anywhere at the first appearance of danger 
He might even be searched, and as soon as his searcher had disappeared, he could pick up his pigeon from the place where he had dropped it, and go on his way rejoicing. Italian spies on enemy ground were furnished with pigeons at night by airplane. The airman would know about where a spy would be stationed and would fly above it in the dark, watching for light signals which the spy would display close to the ground. On seeing them, he would shut off his motor, glide silently above the spot, and by means of a parachute drop a basket of pigeons which would float gently down to the man who was expecting them. In the same way, but without the use of signals, pigeons were dropped into Italian territory occupied by the Austrians, and into Belgian and French territory occupied by the Germans, in the hope that they would be found by loyal inhabitants who would send information concerning the enemy. Much valuable news was sent, and the Austrians and Germans attached such consequence to the danger arising from this practice that they posted notices throughout the occupied territory, ordering the inhabitants to report immediately to the nearest military authorities the finding of pigeon baskets, which were not to be opened under pain of severe punishment. A rough translation of this notice posted by the Austrians, printed in both Italian and German, reads as follows, Bergo, Imperial and Royal. District Command Notice Enemy Spy System The enemy is in the habit of dropping from airplanes little baskets of homing pigeons, by means of which they desire to obtain information concerning this side of the line. The pigeons are placed in little baskets bound with wire netting and marked, Please open. Any inhabitant who finds one of these baskets must, without tampering with it, report to the nearest military authorities. All persons are forbidden to open baskets or any letters attached to them, or to remove them from the place where they are found. Inhabitants disobeying these orders are liable to the severest punishment. If they try to escape, they run the risk of being shot instantly. Any town in which one of these pigeons is secreted is liable to a fine of from 10,000 to 100,000 layers. Bill and Bergio, 7th of September, 1918. The Italians used a very large force of homing pigeons, and elsewhere this messenger service assumed greater and greater proportions as the war progressed. Before the great retreat of 1917, there were 30,000 birds, and after that the number was increased to 50,000, and later 2,000 additional pigeons were requisitioned from civilians. Perhaps the greatest single service they rendered the Italian army was on the Piave in June 1918, when 1,500 Italians were surrounded and in grave danger of capture by the Austrians. Two pigeons were liberated at night with a message for help, and as a result, reinforcements were sent up. The Italians were rescued, and 3,500 Austrians were taken prisoners. This is one of the few occasions on which pigeons were entrusted with important messages at night. Experiments in the night flying of pigeons were made by the French, British, Belgians, Italians, and possibly by other allies. Fairly good results were obtained, and had the war continued, it is possible that birds might have been trained to be of practical service in the dark. As it was, both French and British trainers succeeded in getting a fair percentage of birds to home from a distance of about six miles. They were first liberated in the dusk, then a little later each night, until at length there was practically no light. By keeping the loft dimly lighted in the daytime, the pigeon's eyes were rendered extremely sensitive, and as the birds flew back through the darkness, a red light near the entrance of their home was sufficient to guide them. As might be expected, the Belgians had a splendid pigeon service, with headquarters in Antwerp. At the time the war broke out, Antwerp possessed probably the finest military pigeon loft in the world with the force of 2,500 pigeons. They were the especial pride of Commandant G. Denuy, chief of the Belgian Pigeon Service. On the 8th of October, 1914, the German hordes were before Antwerp and had decided to take the city that day. It was known that one of the first things they would do would be to seize that wonderful messenger service, which of course would be as useful to them as to the Belgians. Denuy himself told me, how, that morning, with aching heart but with firm purpose, he took a torch and fired the great Colombier, burning alive 2,500 of the finest pigeons in all the world, that they might not be forced into the service of the enemy. He was only just in time. 
for the Germans burst into the town at noon. The Royal Air Force was the first arm of the British service to make use of pigeons as messengers. It remains to give some account of the way in which the birds repaid the confidence which had been placed in them. A book might be written on the glorious work rendered by homing pigeons on duty with the seaplanes alone, and that book would be full of thrilling chapters. There is nothing more dramatic in the annals of domestic animals than the stories of the rescue of men who must have perished had not their calmly written but desperately urgent appeals for help been delivered safely and on time. Here are a few records taken at random from a RAF station. On 14-10-18, short seaplane, N-9073, whilst on patrol was forced to land 15 miles east of Arboroth. Two pigeons were dispatched, giving the position of the wreck and requesting immediate help as the machine had capsized and was rapidly breaking up in the rough sea. Aircraft were dispatched to the position given and, having located the wreck, directed a destroyer to it, and the crew were consequently rescued. The pigeon message was the first intimation we received which gave us the position of the seaplane. On July 22nd, a machine was forced to land at sea, owing to thick fog. A bird released at 10 a.m., 10 miles east of Flamborough, reached Cornsey Loft about 10.30 a.m., with a 10-knot wind against it. Although the pilot had completely lost his bearings owing to the fog, the pigeon made straight off for land without hesitation. A machine was forced to land five miles east of Flamborough, and two pigeons reached the loft in an hour. They flew through a heavy thunderstorm and high wind, which was against them. Just the barest facts, but what stories they suggest of duty, and endurance, and daring, of disaster, failing strength, despair, and sudden hope. In reading them we feel the romance, the thrill, the dread, of the men who mount in the air and descend to the sea in their frail winged ships. Here are tales of ocean and sky, of men and birds, unlike any the world has ever heard before. Sometimes in looking through the records, we notice the number of the same bird appearing again and again in notable rescues. For example, there is number 3,698, known at his station as Pilot's Luck. One day we find Pilot's Luck bringing a message from a seaplane down on the water with engine trouble and attacked by three enemy machines. Pilot's Luck had had to fly 200 miles to carry that message and had done the distance in five hours. On another day, he is one of two birds, the other known as 296, released from a sinking seaplane and bringing word that results in the rescue of the crew, and again we find him, and 296, the messengers of a seaplane, which had been forced to alight on the waves 50 miles from its base. This time it is his comrade which is dispatched with the first message, giving the position of the badly damaged boat. Then Pilot's luck is sent, and his news is still more grave. The machine is sinking. One hour, two hours go by. When the rescuers arrive at the place, they find the crew clinging to the upturned bloat. Indeed, the birds were no idlers. One of which we read made three flights in 24 consecutive hours, 25 miles from one direction, 42 from another, 20 from yet another point of the compass. One air station sent out 72 birds on a single day, and 234 in a week. These, however, are the records of times of unusual stress. The normal speed at which the birds flew was about 45 miles an hour, but there were times when this was far exceeded. There was a blue hen which made one of the great flights of the war. She was on a short machine, which was forced by engine trouble to alight whilst on patrol duty off the Scottish coast. It was no day or hour to come down to the water, a bleak November afternoon, a rough sea, night coming on, and 22 miles from an air station. The only hope was the pigeon, the blue hen was taken from her basket, her message adjusted, she was tossed into the air and was gone. It must have seemed a pretty hopeless situation to the two men on the wrecked boat in that darkness, but help came and the men heard that their bird had flown the 22 miles in as many minutes. Amazing speed, but beaten by another, British pigeon, which carried a message 38 miles in 20 minutes, or at the rate of 114 miles an hour. 
of course such flights as this are very unusual and can be accomplished only when the birds are flying with the wind have the wind under their tails as the pigeon men say sometimes it would take several birds to effect a rescue helpless in the water the pilot and the observer of a seaplane sent the following message we can hear firing but cannot see land or ships can you send around coast 21 miles or so we really have no knowledge of our position at all very urgent both feeling very very faint perhaps we are off the southern kentish coast compass no use the bird that carried this word failed to home owing to the fog but settled on a trawler in an exhausted condition the message was taken off and sent out again by two other birds which unchecked by the haze homed safely and assistance was sent owing to no position being given great difficulty was experienced in finding the seaplane but eventually the men were saved after being in the water twenty-four hours there are hundreds of men now living who owe their lives to pigeons in some such way as this here is an incident which occurred not long before the armistice was signed an airplane badly crippled crashed into the north sea far from land the two men upon it would quickly have drowned had not a seaplane come down to their assistance unfortunately the seaplane was injured and could not rise again from the water there were now six men on board the wireless as often happens in such cases was out of commission and hope centered in the homing pigeons of which there were four next morning in spite of a heavy offshore wind a pigeon was released with a message giving the latitude and longitude of the seaplane and asking for help no help came and the next morning a second bird was sent with the same message again nothing happened and the following morning a third pigeon was liberated all this time the men had nothing to eat and their only water was what was condensed in the radiators which was dealt out at the rate of about one wine glassful a day for each man as conditions were desperate it was decided not to wait for the fourth morning but to liberate the fourth bird on the third afternoon which was done it is believed that the first three birds never reached the coast but that weak from confinement and lack of food they were blown back into the north sea but the fourth bird did reach the coast and although it did not get to its loft it did reach a naval station where it dropped dead from exhaustion it was picked up the message read and a destroyer sent straight out to rescue the six men who thus owed their lives to the great courage and splendid flying ability of a homing pigeon we can imagine how these men felt when as they were nursed back to strength they learned that the bird which had saved them had died in making the supreme effort to reach his goal they took the little body had it carefully mounted and today there is to be seen in the headquarters of that aero squadron a neat glass case containing a beautiful pigeon and beneath it the inscription a very gallant gentleman the stories are not all of success and rescue sometimes they tell of tragedy and disaster too swift for any help one day a racing pigeon seemed to drop from the sky onto a light ship off the kentish coast it was a terribly wounded bird one eye badly damaged and the flight feathers of the right wing broken he bore a message from a seaplane just one word attacked no other word ever came from that seaplane one of two which somewhere had met the enemy or this message comes too late still right side up but expecting to go over every minute if don't have assistance soon guess it's all up cheerio have been drifting southeast in very heavy seas there were many occasions when the seaplane encountered enemies other than the waves and the wind when the silence of the ocean and the air was broken by the sound of guns and birds brought word of battle of tanks shot away of someone killed instantly of a plane sinking rapidly machine turning over to port begins the last of a series of messages des describing such an encounter have jettisoned everything it continues am on wingtip see calm machine has seemingly steadied nothing in sight i think machine will float a long time land bus just made one circuit but i don't think he saw me my love to mother tell her i am not worrying if machine sinks i will swim to buoy close to me two ships have just passed rogers was killed instantly wound in the head the records of the air station gave us the rest of that story and from them we learned that the officer who sent that message was captured by the enemy 
and that another seaplane, which had been in the same engagement, was taken in tow by an English patrol and safely reached the base. The birds had done their work, although the word they had brought had not been of victory. These are only a few of the many examples which might be given of the way in which the pigeons served the seaplane force. Let me give just one more, a story which I heard at the headquarters of the Air Force Pigeon Service in London, and which is finally typical of the cooperation which existed between the men of the Air Force and their flying messengers. It was late afternoon. One of England's largest seaplanes had just completed a long anti-submarine patrol above the North Sea, and her tired pilot gladly swung her round and headed for his base. Then something went wrong. The huge craft plunged downward, righted itself, plunged again, and dived sideways into the water. There was an ominous cracking and ripping, some quick dangerous work by the crew, and four men stood upon a wrecked and wave-swept seaplane. How long she would float, heavily laden as she was with motor and armament, none could tell. But what every man did know was that help must come quickly from somewhere, or it need not come at all. Then somebody shouted, The pigeons! A dripping basket was found and opened, but alas, two of the three pigeons were dead, and the survivor so wet and chilled that its recovery was doubtful. But it seemed the only chance, and an officer wrapped it in a woolen muffler, which by some miracle was dry, and placed the bundle inside his shirt. In half an hour the pigeon had somewhat revived, and as the daylight was already failing, it was decided to wait no longer. A brief message was written, rolled up and pushed into a small aluminum cylinder, and the cylinder attached to the right leg of the bird. It was an anxious moment when the pilot climbed to a high point on the wreck and tossed the little messenger into the air. It fell, and every heart sank with it. Then catching itself just above the waves, it lifted itself a little. For several seconds it barely held its own and then seeming to gain strength by its own effort, it rose slowly, squared away, and disappeared into battleship gray. Somewhere on the northeast coast of England night was approaching under a drizzly mist, and a raw wind whipped land and sea around the lonely group of buildings known as Royal Air Force Pigeon Station No. It was tea time, and a welcome hour to the little group of bronzed non-coms and men in British uniform who— were chatting and laughing around the small fire in the mess room. One of them was telling a story of a Portuguese commander who had mistaken a gift of two baskets of British homing pigeons for an addition to the food supply, and who, in his letter of thanks to the British commander, had naively remarked that he and his staff had enjoyed them very much indeed. But the laugh which greeted this story was cut in two by a sound which caused every man in the room to pause and listen. It was the sharp, insistent call of the electric bell that rings automatically when a homing pigeon enters the trap. A non-commissioned officer set down his cup of tea untasted, arose, and opened the door leading to the pigeon loft. From a corner where it had huddled, he lifted a light blue pigeon, very wet and bedraggled, skillfully removed a small aluminum cylinder from its right leg, slipped the bird into a pigeon basket, and carried it into the mess room. Air, he called. Set this blarsted pigeon on the earth till it dries art. And before the order could be obeyed, he had drawn from the little cylinder a roll of tissue paper, smoothed it out flat, and was reading aloud. Machine wrecked and breaking up 15 miles southeast of Rocky Point. Send boat. Two men had already reached for their oilskins and were passing out of the door into the fog. Another minute, and those sipping their tea heard the staccato putt, putt, putt of a motorboat dying away in the general direction of Rocky Point. Darkness had fallen on the North Sea, and four men, wet and chilled, still clung to a wrecked seaplane. They had little hope that their message had been delivered, or if it had been, that help would come in time to save them. The wind had risen, and now and then the waves tore some portion of the wreck, which sank lower and lower in the water. At last there came a sound, the sweetest music they had ever heard, the siren of a motorboat. Again and again it sounded, each time near. Then the heartened men arose and sent up a wild shout in answer, and a hissing bow shot towards them from the darkness. On top of a little basket by the fire, in the mess room, a modest blue pigeon sat quietly preening its damp feathers. And the next morning the British papers reported, Seaplane 
N64, lost in the North Sea, 15 miles southeast of Rocky Point. All the crew were saved. End of section 22. Section 23 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. Animals and Chemical Warfare. When chemical warfare was sprung as a devastating surprise by the Germans, it immediately became a subject of intensive study by the French veterinarians, and the result of their work was of profound value to the Allies. The first facts established were that all the products of chemical warfare were injurious to horses and other saddle, pack, and draft animals, though in varying degrees, and that, in general, animals were less affected than were men. Tear gas, in the case of horses, was regarded as negligible. The case of suffocants was different. Chlorine, phosgene, bromoacetone, all caused lesions of the respiratory apparatus with bronchitis, pulmonary edema, and congestion, and secondary complications. Acute pulmonary edema often resulted in death. Animals only slightly affected sometimes developed serious edema within 24 hours. Work and exertion increased the probability of such latent affections. And since work and exertion were unavoidable, the suffering animals often toiled until they dropped. Such gases as these necessitated the best protection that could be devised. Mustard gas produced a set of injuries entirely different, such as lesions of the skin and mucous membrane. Animals driven through territory bombarded by gas developed burns on the hoofs, on sweaty portions of their bodies, and wherever the harness rubbed. The burns were generally superficial, but they were liable to become seriously complicated by secondary infections, which, taking the form of bronchopneumonia, were a common cause of death. Mustard gas evaporated slowly, and its evil effects persisted long after a bombardment. Even after two days, animals were affected by eating contaminated herbage. Protection against mustard gas was gained in some degree by careful disinfection after a bombardment of the ground and of all contaminated harness and other material. Exposed horses were taken in hand as soon as possible and sponged with soap and hot water. Fortunately, horses are far less sensitive than men to the effects of toxic gases. This is because of the length of their upper respiratory tracts, where contaminated air comes in contact with a large total area of moist surface. Animal losses from exposure to waves of gaseous chlorine, with or without other toxic products, were inconsiderable. A bombardment of average intensity generally reaped but a small harvest among animals, partly because they were not very susceptible to it, and partly because they were somewhat sheltered by their distance behind the front. However, it happened many times that intensive bombardment with special shells put large numbers of animals out of action. The death of animals, although guarded against for the animal's sake, was less serious than the handicap to the fighting line through disablement of animals serving it. Often such disablement brought German victory measurably closer. Take the gas attack at Bois-Moretz. Three horse-drawn wagons loaded with gas masks for frontline troops were being hurried forward in response to urgent signals. They had to pass through a zone of toxic bombardment, and every horse died before the destination was reached. In a similar attack at Crayon in April 1917, a battery of trench mortars lost 12 of its 13 horses. Casualties like this, with their far-reaching results of disaster, established the necessity of protective appliances for the animals that would permit them to go on with their work. Collective measures for group protection were not difficult. Ground could be disinfected, 
Bivouacs and stables could be located at points sheltered from gas. Stables could be well ventilated, lest the ammonia given off by the animal discharges should combine with chlorine to produce chloramine, a dangerously toxic product. Stable exits could be closed by cloths waterproofed with boiled linseed oil. Spraying could always be resorted to. Open fires to reduce penetration of a toxic atmosphere, however, were found to be untrustworthy. The urgent employment of animals was the bringing up of supplies, which was prevented once the animal's organs of respiration were affected by toxic gases. The protection of the respiratory system was of primary importance, and numberless devices were experimented with, some with the measure of success, though most of them had serious drawbacks. Horses at rest could be protected easily. Horses at work presented a hard problem. Almost any mask was liable to make breathing difficult. Hard-worked horses, becoming winded, could not breathe in them at all. They became excited, and if the mask was not removed, asphyxiation was likely to follow. As the horse breathes only through its nostrils, it was hoped that protection of these would be enough, the mouth being left free for the normal use of bits. But appliances on this principle did not give satisfaction. A makeshift appliance in vogue at one period consisted of nostril plugs made of gauze, salvaged from human masks. The plugs were forced up the nostrils and held in place by three safety pins passed through the edges of the nostrils. The inhumanity of this device prevented its becoming popular, and the difficulty of proper adjustment in haste under fire aided in ending its use. Even makeshift masks were to be preferred. The best types of mask, finally evolved, were designed to be worn over the bridle, which aided in preventing pressure of the mask against the nostrils. Horses could breathe more easily in these than any other. Most horses submitted quickly to the mask and made the best of it, the equine intelligence apparently grasping the fact that man, whom they served, was doing his best to serve them. In the training camps on this side of the water, where toxic gas was no more than a disagreeable theory, some American commanders decided it would be well to accustom animals to the sight of men in masks. The order went forth that men at work around the stables and lines should wear this additional equipment. The first time it was tried out, mules were the subject of the experiment. The entire line was standing docilely at rest, but when a soldier in a mask started to lead out one of them, alarm rippled down the line. With a common impulse, the whole line broke away, and men without masks spent the next two days in rounding them up. The further application of the theory was discontinued, but there was no reason why the men themselves should not realize what marching in masks meant. Another commander, this time in Texas, decided to send out night patrols in gas masks. The patrol, moving quietly, had not gone far when it came in contact with a parcel of Negroes engaged in the ancient pastime of shooting crafts. The mask squad were almost in the midst of the crap shooters before they were seen. There were wild cries and a rolling of white eyeballs. White caps yelled one Negro. Then the whole bunch dissolved from view, spreading the news through Texas on foot, and that was the last night patrol sent out in gas masks. The claims of various small creatures to distinguish service in connection with the detection of gas have been pressed by well-wishers. I have before me, for instance, a lengthy extract from a prominent weekly. It is entitled, Pussy's Pit in the War, and contains the information that Pussy, having proved herself a competent gas detector, had been sent to the front to help win the war. Not one pussy, mind you, but half a million pussies. Now, the tale, to be credited, should have contained particulars of the half million gas masks. Cat size. The same writers claim that cats prove valuable as destroyers of rats also lacks foundation. The cold fact is that cats rarely tackle a full-grown rat, particularly where rodents are abundant, which of course was the case in and around the trenches. No one, however, 
can dispute Pussy's claim as a winning and beautiful mascot. Goldfish is said to have aided the British on one occasion. An English officer had orders to wash some hundreds of gas masks in a river, and as the mask had been subjected to the deadly fumes of a gas barrage, the French peasants complained that the fish in the stream were being poisoned. The officer took a cage of goldfish and hung it in the river just below the place where the masks were being washed. As the goldfish continued to thrive, the objection of the peasants was overcome. Rats are said to have indicated that smoke lifts poison gas. During a gas attack, some straw was accidentally set fire to. The rats congregated around it for air, and from this incident, the French are said to have derived the idea of placing on the parapets boxes containing the chemical materials for producing smoke to lift the gas during an attack. But if it is true that the rats did indeed do one useful thing, they proved themselves in war as in peace, destroyers of food in an unmitigated nuisance. The scientific men sent out to determine how to rid the American trenches of their baleful presence reached the sensible conclusion that with French rats to the right of them and Belgian rats to the left of them, the task was hopeless. They therefore concentrated their efforts on the protecting of supplies from the rodents with gratifying results. If any animal deserves credit for killing rats, it is the dog. Many rats in trash piles were dislodged by soldiers to be killed by the dogs as they ran out. When war broke out and poison gas came into general use, the chemical warfare service were at their wit's end to find some creature that could be put into practical use as a gas detector. The cow they tried, to no purpose. Cats, rats, and mice proved equally impracticable. So did guinea pigs and dogs. Flies and fleas refused to help. In this extremity, the chemical warfare service came with their problem to that great institution of America, the Smithsonian. It then developed that for eight years, from 1896 to 1904, Dr. Paul Barsh of the Smithsonian Institution had in the interest of science devoted much of his time to the study of mollusks. Slugs had shared his house, a basement room being entirely given up to them. It is true they lived under restrictions, but where there's a will, there's a way. And one day the slugs gained their liberty. Most curious of all, they traveled a distance of more than 70 feet to a boiled potato. The ordinary person would have attached no significance to the incident. Of course, the ordinary person would not have harbored slugs in his respectable domicile. But the owner of the slugs and the boiled potato was no ordinary person. He treasured the incident in his mind as an indication of the extraordinary olfactory powers of slugs, and after 10 or 15 years, he was able to turn it to good use. When the chemical warfare service men appeared with their tale of baffled endeavor, Dr. Barch quietly observed, let's try the slug. Whether this patient man of science, all men of science are patient, Received his just share of glory, I do not know. Virtue is its own reward, has a special application in the case of men of science. This is not the place to write of the man. Unlike Virgil, I do not sing of arms and men. I sing of the humble Limax Maximus, for that is the name of the common garden slug, destroyer of pansies and a thousand other beautiful flowers. They say that every dog has his day. This was the slug's day. He came through all his trials with colors flying. It was demonstrated that he could show the presence of mustard gas in a solution of one part in 12 million parts of air. He could do even more, for upon closer observation it was found that by means of the slug's reaction, it was possible to determine the actual proportion of gas present in the air. Since one part of mustard gas and four million parts of air marked the danger point to men, there was a tremendous leeway which gave ample opportunity to sound a signal for putting on masks. All the creatures experimented with 
had reacted to the presence of gas in the air, but the gassing had usually resulted in pneumonia. Not so in the case of the slug, which closed up its breathing aperture, thus saving the delicate lung membrane. For when mustard gas comes into contact with moisture, it generates hydrochloric acid, which burns out the lining of the breathing organs. The despised garden slug, however, could endure one gassing after another. He was not killed, nor was his efficiency lessened, so far as response to mustard gas was concerned. The garden slug is not indigenous to America, but anyone familiar with European gardens knows how the creature multiplies and what a serious problem it is to keep down the numbers. It would have been an easy matter to obtain all the slugs requisite for the trenches in France, and their reactions were so simple that with a few minutes' explanation, a child could have understood all that was necessary, and once taught, they would have become most willing allies. Neither their rations or their quarters would have troubled them or made them grumble. Given an old box with a piece of wet sponge, they would have been perfectly happy. In June 1918, the Allied armies were informed by cable of the gratifying new uses of the gentle slug, uses which, alas, do not appear to have been appreciated, for in making inquiry at the War Department in Washington, the present writer was informed that no record of their use by any of the Allied armies in France could be found. Let us hope that no future occasion for such use shall ever be found. End of section 23. Section 24 of Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Animal Heroes by Ernest Baines. American Veterinary Service. The Veterinary Service in the United States Army followed a course of slow development through the long years from 1792, when Congress authorized the first mounted troops, up to the Great War. Slow indeed, for when that war broke for us in April 1917, the entire personnel of the service numbered but 62, and the service was based on a principle admittedly faulty, which it was necessary to discard before anything like an adequate veterinary corps could be organized. Those persons of highly ethical intelligence who found satisfaction in the national indifference to war's threat must have gazed with special fondness upon our veterinary service, in which unpreparedness was exemplified to perfection. Available records do not show any veterinary surgeon as being on duty with the military forces of the United States during the Revolutionary War, nor from that time up to 1835. A farming population was more self-reliant in caring for animals than the urban, automobiling population of today. We came through the Civil War with but the faintest suspicion of veterinary service. In 1863, there were but six veterinarians in the Army, the wastage of horse life by disease in that struggle was enormous, and President Lincoln, humane and patriotic, did his best to remedy it. Realizing the Army's handicap through sick and injured horses, he offered commissions as lieutenants to several of the best veterinarians of the day, but they refused to consider any rank below that of captain. The changing character of the population slowly forced a more professional care of army animals, but this care was always administered by units and with responsibility to separate commanders. The veterinary service had no organization. In itself, it never had a vestige of authority. A few schools of instruction were established, and the personnel of the service gradually took on a character more worthy of commissioned rank. But the need of an independent veterinary organization seemed never to penetrate the minds of army leaders. In fact, veterinarians were held to be mere civil employees and no integral part of the army organization. 
They were held responsible to commanding officers of departments and divisions. They had no commanding officer of their own. The development of systematic service was impossible. Prior to the Spanish-American War, very little attention was devoted to adequate inspection of meats and dairy products issued to the military forces. There was appalling lack of information in the military organization concerning this branch of supplies. This was an important contributory factor in the meat scandal at that time. One result was the evolution of a system of meat inspection, which included the employment of a few qualified veterinarians at important packing centers to supervise the preparation of meats, and this developed into a system under which, during the Great War, billions of pounds of meat products were inspected, and the Army's welfare in that direction was efficiently guarded. But at Army posts, supplied with fresh beef by local dealers, it long rested in the judgment of the commanding officer whether the veterinarian should inspect the cattle before slaughtering and the beef when delivered at the post. It was a hit-or-miss arrangement that could not produce satisfactory results. The history of the present veterinary corps dates from the approval of the National Defense Act, June 3, 1916. Under this, veterinarians with commissioned rank were authorized to be assigned to duty as inspectors of horses and mules and of meats, and were to constitute the veterinary corps, which was specified as a part of the medical department. This legislation marked the culmination of the efforts extending over a period of 32 years of leading members of the veterinary profession in this country to obtain adequate recognition through the establishment of a commission status for veterinarians in the Army. Indeed, a few civilian veterinarians had realized the importance of such a step and their indifference and inability to agree on united action was long reflected in the apathy of Congress. Up to this time, the veterinarians had been carried as members of the Quartermaster Corps, which had supplied the drugs and instruments needed. Now they became a corps in their own right, functioning under the medical department. The Surgeon General immediately began the work of putting the new corps on a sound basis. A total of 62 veterinarians were found qualified and were commissioned. This was the nucleus of the force that, a few months later, was to care for animals numbering tens of thousands. An enormous increase of personnel was immediately necessary. In the emergency, deans of recognized schools were called on to give the required professional examinations, after which successful candidates were examined physically. The examination requirements were thus made subject to interpretation by men ignorant of Army necessities, and who possibly were liable to the influence of their personal feelings. It was inevitable that an occasional substandard man was commissioned, but it was the best plan available, and it resulted in a large number of new officers in the emergency. Defects should be charged against the national sin of unpreparedness, which rendered the plan necessary. It was something of a task to create overnight the functioning organism of a vital service in which experience was totally lacking. Help was needed, and the British were called on to supply it. It is not too much to say that their response was prompt and their services of aid continuous and efficient. They put us on our feet. There is no doubt about it. Colonel J.J. Aitken, a British veterinary officer of long experience and outstanding ability, was at once ordered to Washington to act as advisor. With his aid, a tentative system based on the British was drawn up, and a manual that included many British features was prepared. This manual was sanctioned and became law. The British War Office, upon request, loaned the Surgeon General's office a complete set of veterinary field chests and wallets to serve as models if deemed suitable. Up to that time, we had possessed no system of containers suitable for supplying veterinary requirements under active service conditions. The British containers were finally adopted as models for our army. 
One fundamental reason being that our veterinary corps was modeled closely after the British Army Veterinary Corps, so that the supply system fitted in with our plan. Further, the British had spent many years evolving a suitable system, keeping constantly in view economy in weight and bulk and simplicity in distribution. During three or more years of strenuous warfare, ample opportunity had been afforded to test the efficiency of this equipment in a most practical way, and it had given admirable satisfaction. The Veterinary Corps of the National Army was finally established by the issue of orders on October 4, 1917. Regulations for the Army Veterinary Service were approved. Tables of organization for veterinary units were authorized. Blank forms were devised and a guide for veterinary officers was published. The Corps, after long years in embryo, was at last functioning as a separate, self-contained organization, but its path was thorny. Harassments beset its every step, yet because a veterinary service was necessary, we had one. We had help from both British and French, here and in France. With such help, the American will to do accomplished wonders. By the time the armistice was signed, our veterinary service was a good one and stood where it should have stood when we entered the war. The supply of veterinary officers was an urgent problem for the new corps. The requisite knowledge and training were not general. Every source was combed, and civil life, the National Guard, and graduate veterinarians in the ranks were brought in to fill the lists. In all, 2,313 veterinary officers were on active duty during the war. The enlisted personnel also presented difficult problems. The stress was laid on familiarity with animals, and this had suffered general decrease as mechanical traction throughout the land had increased. By careful selection of men, exceptional quality filled the overseas units, and at home there was less choice. The veterinary corps, with other branches, was called on to make use of men unfit for overseas duty and these were placed in auxiliary remount depots. The Corps had also its share of alien enemies and conscientious objectors. In such conditions, efficiency was difficult to attain, and many complaints arose over the quality of the service rendered by men of this type. They could be depended on for little besides shirking. They were frequently in the guardhouse or the hospital, absent without leave, are in other ways proving themselves worthless in a war to preserve that peace under which they commonly throve. The veterinary hospital service at auxiliary remount depots was unsatisfactory and the proposed system became the subject of vigorous opposition by the Surgeon General's office even before it was established. It placed the only hospital provision for the entire camp within the depot and under control of the depot commanding officer. It resulted that all sick animals, many of them ill with infectious diseases, were brought into approximate contact with the sound animals, supposed to be ready for issue. If the depot was in quarantine, as was the case with some of them all the time, the sick could not be received, and much suffering and loss resulted. It seemed evident that it was absolutely wrong in principle to collect sick animals into a remount depot where sound animals would necessarily be exposed. The general staff admitted this while the organization of the veterinary corps was still under discussion, but the remount division overcame it by pointing to the enormous expense that would be incurred if the contracts already left for the construction of hospitals at the depots were not carried out. This was putting dollars against life, jeopardizing victory by imperiling the Army's animal transport. A fair parallel will be found in utilizing the kitchens of a big hotel as an enteric ward for the town. That would be more culpable only as human instead of animal life would be sacrificed. Some 300,000 animals were, at that time, born on the strength of the Army, and although no official reports existed showing their condition, it was known that more than half were sick, more than 75% were 
were unfit for work and that the death rate was high. When this was so during clement weather, it was appalling to consider what would occur when winter set in. To veterinary officers, it seemed illogical to expect the Corps to function properly in hospitals located and planned without their advice and even in opposition to their professional judgment. Protests of the Surgeon General against the further construction of veterinary hospitals of this type finally bore fruit, and three hospitals planned with his approval were built. Altogether, they could care for less than 2,000 patients. The plans were originally based on a British type, but were extensively revised. Plans for dipping vats were also perfected, and one vet was included with each new hospital. The work of the veterinary corps still lay almost wholly on this side of the water. Here, the feverish haste of preparation was rampant. There were nearly two score auxiliary remount depots, the veterinary hospitals of which required an enormous amount of service. The veterinarian of a depot, besides supervising the veterinary hospital service, was responsible for advising on veterinary sanitary conditions, for the physical condition of animals, for their malinization, and for the daily inspection for the detection of the sick. These duties were exacting and important, and required for their handling a veterinarian of professional ability, energy, tact, and judgment. Veterinary service at the permanent remount depots was extensive and exacting, because these served as collecting points for a considerable part of newly purchased animals, and the incidence of various types of disease prevalent among green animals was high. Breeding operations were conducted at all of them, and considerable difficulty was experienced with a widespread epidemic of contagious abortion. In handling public animals during the war, the haste of the emergency and our own inexperience made it impossible to enforce well-known principles of animal hygiene. Consequently, morbidity and mortality rates were high. Buying and shipping were very active. Railroads were congested. Shipments suffered delay of days and weeks. And the federal law, which requires all animals to be unloaded for food, water, and rest, once in each 28 hours was not enforced. Animals frequently remained in cars 40 to 60 hours, and when unloaded, were often placed in pens of limited accommodations. Stock cars and stock yards were infected with influenza, strangles, etc. Apparently, there was not time to clean cars between the departure of one shipment and the arrival of the next. Some animals were sick when loaded. Others became sick in transmit. Many arrived dead or incurably sick. A war of such magnitude entered upon by a totally unprepared nation necessarily is accompanied by expense and life loss, which would otherwise be inexcusable. As America's attitude of permanent unpreparedness is our own choice, we may excuse these things to ourselves, if we will. Still, the facts in review can add nothing to our national complacency. The unfortunate animals left the cars for conditions as bad, sometimes worse, than those in transit. Most remount depots were overcrowded and decidedly insanitary. Many were located on low land with clay subsoil, and the corrals became seas of mud. As the season progressed, conditions became worse. The veterinary personnel was short, about one man to 15 animals. This was sufficient for direct attendance, but fell far short of covering the long list of miscellaneous duties. Here again, the type of men in both the quartermaster corps and the veterinary corps was detrimental. There were many physical and mental defectives, with foreigners and conscientious objectives predominating. Both personnel and material were below par. Shipping fever in virulent form developed during the winter of 1917-18. to 18. It was due to the rapid assembling and transporting of thousands of green animals, and it lasted through the spring and into the late summer of 1918, up to the moment when the fresh American armies took the field in their own right 
to demonstrate American war-winning methods to the weary Allies and to the no less weary Germans. The lack of veterinary personnel was keenly felt at home and in France, but the need could not be supplied. Skin troubles on this side of the water were rare, and glanders, formerly much dreaded, was well controlled. But nearly every animal purchased had shipping fever, frequently with complications. In the more exposed depots, influenza and pneumonia were common causes of death. The worst defects were the mud and accumulated manure and the lack of dry standings. Dry standings are of vital importance in keeping animals well. The English and the French had traveled the better road of experience to this conclusion, and our veterinary corps should have been able to profit by their journey. The cost of dry standings was an obstacle, but the conditions at certain depots in the United States, due to deep mud, were most serious, were a disgrace to modern ideas of sanitation, and would have been correctable with a reasonable expenditure. It was both inhuman and extravagant to permit such conditions to exist. The overcrowding of auxiliary remount depots continued in 1918. Depots planned for 5,000 animals were frequently called upon to shelter twice that number. Large herds of horses ran loose in the corrals, extensive areas of which were knee-deep in mud and manure. Continued efforts to keep the corrals clean met with poor success. There was no avoiding these insanitary conditions, based as they were on an inherently defective principle. Only when the animals died or were disposed of could such conditions be alleviated. Of course, the result was excessive disability and loss. The corral system for use in the United States was a failure and should not be tolerated. Individual dry standing for every animal should be rated as a minimum requirement. The veterinary service at ports of embarkation was organized at Newport News, Virginia, where a depot of 10,000 animals. Capacity was established. A second depot at Charleston, South Carolina, was ready for operations when the armistice was signed. This veterinary service was analogous to that of the auxiliary remount depots, plus the examination and preparation of the animals for embarkation. The only port veterinary service developed was that at Newport News. Sanitary conditions there were extremely bad much of the time because of the congestion of animals and the mud-infested corrals. The veterinary service on animal transports required the permanent assignment of officers and men to each transport. They cared for sick animals and supervised the sanitation of animal quarters on the outward voyage and on the return attended to the cleaning and disinfecting of the ship. A grand total of 66,071 horses and mules were sent to France with our forces, and the losses en route were but 660, or 1 percent, including 239 lost on the Hercules during a rough trip in February 1918. This was considered a very creditable showing for an organization hastily scraped together of whatever material was available, and functioning under emergency stress. Work at the Corps in France When General Pershing's headquarters were removed to France in May 1917, neither personnel nor plans for veterinary service went along. Veterinarians were subsequently sent abroad in small numbers as requested, but they were not urgently needed until shipments of animals in considerable numbers began in October 1917 when it was decided to hasten the departure to France of American troops. Ship tonnage was difficult to obtain, and it was impossible to transport with the troops their complement of forces. In consequence, April 1918 saw on the soil of France six divisions of the American Expeditionary Force with but 55,378 horses. It was necessary to depend upon the Allies for animals, and they did their best. To some extent, the British even robbed their artillery teams, giving us two from each six-horse team. Our buyers went into Spain. The French took a natural lead in supplying the deficiency. 
Thousands of animals were thus gathered from these available sources, and it necessarily followed that their quality was less high than their price. At the best, the supply was insufficient, and this entailed the overworking of the animals secured. As they were of poor quality and full of contagious disease, they rapidly became inefficient, and their morbidity and mortality rates rose. This tendency to disease was increased by the condition of the camps in which they were assembled and held. It appeared inevitable in the successive movements that we should inherit many camps abandoned by the Allies. The infected condition of the ground, added to the shortage of efficient veterinary personnel, wrought havoc. Where horses are congregated in large numbers, and where they have been so collected for a long time, the ground becomes foul and the horses tend to become more susceptible to disease. At such camps, they suffered more from such ailments as coughs, fevers, catarrh, pneumonia, and pleurisy than they did under far more strenuous conditions at the front. This is taken to prove that direct exposure, once the animals have become hardened and acclimatized, is not a predisposing cause of sickness. It was unfortunate that necessity required the repeated use of such camps. Doubly unfortunate that the success of the American arms should have been imperiled by this cause. But the exigencies of war compelled the assembling together of horses in very large numbers. Matters were not improved for the American expeditionary force by the marked absence of a knowledge of animal management among the troops. In September 1917, a memorandum from General Pershing's headquarters outlined a proposed veterinary service of the rear, and this formed the basis of the War Department tables of organization subsequently authorized. But this failed to constitute a comprehensive program, since veterinary service is not confined to the rear, but goes wherever there are animals. Close contact between the troops and the services of evacuation and hospitalization was lost. Before long, it became apparent that the intent was to divorce the veterinary corps from the medical department and attach it to the remount service. Thus, there resulted one veterinary service as part of the remount service and another in each division, each out of touch with the other and each outside the control of the medical department, which on the home shores continued to enroll and train the veterinary personnel and send them to France, where they had to begin all over again under other authority. The Surgeon General's office was not disposed to assent to this arrangement without demur. In November 1917, two veterinary officers, Major Louis A. Klein and Major A. L. Mason, were dispatched to France. Their mission was to establish with the Army an efficient veterinary corps on lines similar to those followed at home. They covered the animal situation in the Allied armies and submitted a report embodying their ideas of the proper method of dealing with the question. It was contrary in tenor to the views held at general headquarters in France and led to no result other than a wide divergence of opinion. Home authorities held that the adoption of the report would have saved the government many millions of dollars and increased the animal efficiency of the army and consequently of the army itself out of all proportion to the changes entailed. Some color was given to this view in July 1918 when the Surgeon General's office received a cable request for a senior veterinary officer to be sent to France for administrative work. This indicated that conditions demanded a material modification of the method of operating the veterinary service and implied its return to the jurisdiction of the medical department. The cable was complied with and the officer served as head of the veterinary service throughout the operations that led to the armistice. And coincidentally, the veterinary service was placed under the control of the medical department. Immediately after the signing of the armistice, the veterinary service of the American Expeditionary Force reached its stride. The excellent work of the veterinary officer who was chief veterinarian was bearing fruit. 
The maximum veterinary personnel was reached February 22, 1919, with 839 officers and 9,701 enlisted men. The number of animals was at its maximum about January 1, 1919, when it reached 192,000. It was necessary to dispose of the animals in France, and large numbers were retained in hospitals until they were in suitable condition for sale. The vital work of the veterinary corps, that for which all the rest was merely preparatory, was done during the fateful autumn of 1918, when the German forces were driven back and the end of the struggle was reached. The veterinary corps, undermanned and overworked, labored endlessly to maintain and promote the mobility of the army, without which its striking power was as zero. And they were ably upheld by their comrades of other branches. The evacuation of sick and injured animals from the front was involved with the remount service, to such an extent that many a man may well have wondered to which branch of the service he belonged. At any rate, there was a wonderful absence of slacking on the job and a correspondingly wonderful exhibition of buddy-like help. I love in this connection to read the report of the labors of Field Remount Squadron Number 302, Captain A.C. Swanson commanding, on duty with the 3rd Army Corps at Chateau Thierry. Sunday, August 25, 1918, the squadron moved 20 kilometers to Charmel and until September 13th was handling evacuations, receiving and issuing animals to the divisions on duty with the 3rd Army Corps. Many of the evacuations were kept by the squadron, and with proper care, many were reclaimed and reissued to their divisions. This proved a great benefit as the replacement of animals was very difficult in the advance zone. September 13th, ordered to the Meuse Argonne sector. Squadron started overland for a location about 175 kilometers distant. All animals used on the march were reclaimed stock covered 45 kilometers first day. Marches continue until 18th, when squadron reached Solans de la Grande and was stationed in French barracks under range of enemy guns. September 22nd, one detachment to Autrecourt, another to Raracourt on 25th on special duty, evacuating sick and wounded animals. During this time, the squadron picked several hundred wounded animals from the Corps Veterinary Hospital, and these were being conditioned and were issued as they became fit. No remounts were coming from the SOS depots, and reliance had to be placed on reconditioning. Rumors the squadron was to be relieved from this duty, but the need of its continued presence with the Corps was so clear that no change was made. September 30th, Rear Court Detachment returned. At this time, the Germans had been driven so far back that the location around Soulange le Grande was comparatively safe, and several hundred convalescent animals were stationed at a farm near the village and were turned loose in a pasture of excellent grazing. October 2nd, Ultra Court Detachment returned. October 13th, first shipment of animals from SOS depots received and unloaded. A detachment sent to Verdun and unloaded other animals. On succeeding days, several shipments of horses and mules came from various depots. Up to October 25th, the squadron received 4,274 animals, which it unloaded at four different railheads. The entire number were issued by the 27th. To do this, there were strings of horses on the roads almost 24 hours a day. October 25th, Captain Swenson promoted. Captain William B. Watkins succeeded to the command. The advance of the Army had been so rapid that headquarters of the 3rd Corps were moving further away, but the squadron station could not be changed as no railhead was available for receiving animals. November 4th, advance station established a Sierge, where Corps headquarters were at the time and deliveries were made with a one-night rest at the advance station. All animals issued by the squadron were well shod, 
It is believed that not one animal started over the roads without being shod. During these 12 days, it rained every day and the mud was terrible. All animals had to be on a picket line in the open, as no shelter was to be had. At that time, criticism of the squadron's work by an inspector from the SOS was resented. The day was one of those busy days. Men were at Verdun and Ballacourt, unloading animals, and the entire personnel left at the station consisted of one officer, one guard, one cook, and one sergeant with five men to feed and water over 500 animals which were on picket line and fully one-eighth mile from the watering place. The picket line had been up only 12 hours, and the inspector criticized the work, objecting to the animals standing in the mud, and complained that they were not properly groomed. This was only natural to expect under the conditions. These animals had been received during the night. Large numbers were being received at two railheads, and over 350 were on the road. It was thought that the officer and six men left for duty were lucky to get over 500 animals fed and watered. The matters criticized were of trivial importance when horses were needed so badly at the front at that particular time, and it is known that the men of this squadron were doing their work in such a way that it proved that they were backing up the men with the guns only a few kilometers closer up. Seeing the combatant units passing during the days and nights, some going in and others returning, made the remount man realize that they had a duty to perform and that they must do it now, or it would be of no assistance to the fighting men. The work which was done by the squadron certainly seemed to be the real work of a remount squadron, and not merely to furnish safer riding horses, which so many seemed to think were the duties of the remount service in the war. When the armistice was signed, the squadron received 1,000 horses from the 57th Artillery Brigade and reissued them to the 32nd Division. November 15th, Captain Watkins transferred. First Lieutenant C.H. Fisher took command. Sunday, November 17th, squadron started the march to the Rhine as Corps troops of the 3rd Corps. In five days march, 150 kilometers and halted two days to handle evacuations until the mobile veterinary hospital came up. December 3rd, they crossed into Germany. December 19th, they took station at Ehrenbreitstein, remaining there. Their attention then turned to a lighter side of Army life, and at the Third Corps Horse Show on March 7th and 8th, 1919, the squadron took blue ribbons in every class in which it entered in the harness classes, and also won the championship harness class of the show. When the 42nd and 32nd Divisions turned in their horses, the squadron received 1,100 animals. Of these, 400 were sold at auction. The report of Captain Fisher concludes, It is believed no squadron has done more to put the remount service on the records of the AEF than has this squadron which was the first that blazed the trail of handling the remount work for an army corps and its divisions. This is due to several reasons, but the capability of the personnel was realized by the corps remount officer and the officers of the squadron, and they have fully fulfilled every test they were put to. End of section 24